Section 1 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. The South American Republics, Part 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. Introductory. The Discoveries and the Conquest. Part 1. Spain's Discovery of America. Town or communal government has been characteristic of Spain since before the Roman conquest. The Visigoths, who destroyed the advanced civilization they found in the peninsula, never really amalgamated with the subject population, and happily they did not succeed in destroying the municipalities. The liberal, civilized, and tolerant Saracens who drove out the Goths left their Christian subjects free to enjoy their own laws and customs. The municipalities gave efficient local self-government, while a system of small proprietorships made the peninsula prosper, as in the best days of the Roman dominion. The population of Spain reached twenty million under the Moors, but finally dynastic civil wars enabled the remnant of Visigoths, who had taken refuge in the northern mountains, to begin the gradual expulsion of the Mahometans. In the midst of these currents of war and conquest setting to and fro, the old municipalities survived unchangeable and always supplying local self-government. A tendency towards decentralization was ingrained in the Spanish people from the earliest times. It was increased by the method in which the Christian conquest of Mahometan Spain was achieved. The Visigothic nobility, starting from separate points in Asturias and Navarre, advanced into Saracen territory and established counties and earldoms which were virtually independent of their mother kingdoms. The Asturians expanded into Leon and thence over Galicia, northern Portugal, Old and New Castile. The power of the Leonese monarch over Galicia was nominal. Castile and Portugal separated from Leon almost as soon as they were wrested from the Mahometans. The Basques were always independent, and Navarre, though it became the mother of Aragon, had little connection with the latter region. On the Mediterranean shore, Charlemagne drove the Moors from Catalonia and made it a province of his empire, but no sooner was he dead than it became independent. Towards the end of the 13th century, the Christian conquest was virtually completed, and the peninsula had been divided into four kingdoms. Each of these was, however, in reality only a federation of semi-independent feudal divisions and municipalities united by personal allegiance to a single sovereign. In the course of the continual quarrelling of the monarchs, their kingdoms frequently divided, coalesced, and separated again. The death of a king, or a marriage of his daughter, was often the signal for war and a readjustment of boundaries, but these overturnings did not much affect the component and really vital political units. More significant than the political kingdoms were the linguistic divisions. Spain then spoke, and still speaks, three languages, each of which has many dialects. From Asturias and Navarre, the language, now known as Castilian, has spread over the central part of the peninsula, south to Cadiz and Murcia. From Galicia, the Gallego had spread directly south along the Atlantic, where one of its dialects grew into the Portuguese. On the east coast, the Catalonian, imported from Languedoc by the French conqueror, is a mere derivative of the Provençal. Its dialects are spoken all along the Mediterranean coast of Spain, as far south as Alicante, as well as in the Balearic Islands. By 1300 A.D., two great political divisions, Castile and Aragon, covered three-fourths of the peninsula, and their boundaries were well established. Each, however, was a mere loose aggregation of provinces, and every province had its own laws and customs, its jealously guarded privileges, its legislative assembly, and its free municipalities. Galicia had never become incorporated with Leon, the Basques ruled themselves, Catalonia was really independent of Aragon, Castile had, from the beginning, been virtually independent, although under the same monarch as Lyon, and indeed had taken the latter's place as the metropolitan province of the kingdom. The one great unifying force was religious sentiment, stimulated into fanaticism by centuries of wars against the infidels. Nevertheless, during the two centuries before the discovery of America, the Spaniards absorbed much culture from their Moorish subjects. 
In 1479 the whole peninsula, except Portugal and Granada, was politically united by the accession of Ferdinand to the throne of Aragon, and of Isabella to that of Castile and Leon. With local liberties intact, and peace prevailing through its whole extent, the peninsula enjoyed a prosperity unknown since the golden era of the Moors. The population rose to 12 millions. Andalusia, Galicia, Catalonia and Valencia were among the most flourishing and thickly settled parts of Europe, while the military qualities of the aristocracy of Castile and Leon and Aragon gave the new power the best armies of the time. Colonies founded by a monarchy so organized could never be firmly knit to each other nor to their mother country. The nobility of the sword would try to establish feudal principalities. The new cities would endeavour to exercise the local functions of the old peninsular municipalities, and the spirit of local independence still animating Catalonians, Basques, Galicians and Andalusians would be repeated on a new continent. The only bond of union would be personal allegiance to the monarch. In the 14th century, Christian navigators reached the Canary Islands, 60 miles from the African coast and 600 southeast of Gibraltar. The assurance that land did really exist below the horizon of that western ocean, so mysterious and terrible to the early navigators, gave them confidence to push farther into the deep. In navigation, the Spaniards lagged behind their Portuguese neighbors. But among the Spanish kingdoms, Castile took the lead because her Andalusian ports of Cadiz, San Lucar, Palos, and Huelva faced on the open Atlantic. These towns swarmed with sailors who had followed in the track of the Portuguese and visited their new possessions. The Castilians and Andalusians were naturally jealous of the successful Portuguese. Madeira, the Azores, the Cape Verdes, and the gold mines of the Guinea coast had fallen to the latter, while the Spaniards had only the Canaries. They gave an eager ear to the rumours that were rife in the Portuguese islands of more marvellous discoveries still to be made of islands beyond the Azores. An adventurous Italian, Christopher Columbus, wandering among the Portuguese possessions, heard the stories. Happily for Spain, he believed them, and resolved to lead an expedition to the farther side of the Atlantic. He entered her service, and proved to be an enthusiast of rare penacity. It is immaterial whether the idea of a route to the East Indies by the West occurred to him at the same time he became convinced that there were islands in the far Atlantic waiting to be discovered. That which is certain is that he devoted his life to persuading someone in authority to entrust him with ships and men to make a voyage to the far West. The pilots at Palos backed him, and he finally secured the desired permission and means from Isabella of Castile. Her interest in exploration and colonization had been shown fifteen years before in her energetic measures in conquering the Canaries and forcing the Portuguese to renounce their claims to those islands, and she well deserved the title of founder of the colonial empire of Spain. The story of Columbus's first voyage needs no retelling. He journeyed so far to the west that he returned convinced he had reached the longitude of eastern Asia, and the noise of his great discovery resounded through Europe and began the transformation of the world. Since the last great century, the 13th, Christendom had retrograded. The Tartars dominated Russia, and the Turks were pressing hard on Germany. Unless the Christian world could find an outlet, unless it could create other resources for itself and outside of itself, unless feudalism should find an employment for its military energies outside of the vicious circle of fruitless and purposeless dynastic wars, it seemed not improbable that Mahometan aggression would continue until all Europe lay under the deadening influence of the Turk. Only in the peninsula was apparent that spirit of expansion which is the best indication of internal vitality in a nation. The military nobility, whose determined fanaticism, magnificent courage, and spirit of individual initiative had driven the Moors out of Spain in the 13th century, welcomed this fresh opportunity to slay the infidel and carve out new fiefs for themselves. Conquest of the Andes Columbus showed strategic genius of the highest order in choosing Haiti as the site of the first settlement. 
that island afforded an admirable base for the conquest of the new world it was large enough to furnish provisions and was conveniently situated with reference to the coasts and islands of the caribbean gold washings were soon discovered in the interior and the unwarlike inhabitants were at once impressed into slavery to dig in the mines the news of gold stimulated interest as nothing else could have done the castilian government took immediate steps to exclude all other nations the pope divided the globe between spain and portugal and a treaty to this effect was negotiated between the two countries spaniards swarmed over to haiti and thence expeditions were sent out in every direction headed by private adventurers bearing their sovereign's commission the other antilles were soon explored and by the end of the century the spaniards had reached the south american mainland and rapidly explored the coast from the amazon up to the isthmus gold was picked up in the streams flowing from the colombian andes into the caribbean a few years later the northwestern coast of south america was granted out to noble adventurers who undertook its conquest and exploitation with their own means the eastmian region became the new centre of spanish power and commerce in america in fifteen thirteen balboa crossed the isthmus to the pacific ocean an event second in its far-reaching consequences only to columbus's first voyage during the following years the gulf of mexico was explored and in fifteen eighteen the greatest statesman and general whom spain ever sent to the new world hernando cortes began the conquest of the empire of the aztecs the mining done in haiti and along the caribbean coast seemed pitiably insignificant compared with the treasures found in mexico there followed a new influx of gentlemen adventurers who scoured the coast in every direction seeking another defenceless empire and mines as good as those of mexico the expeditions down the pacific coast of south america started from the isthmus peru was soon found and in fifteen thirty two pizarro and his band of bloodthirsty desperadoes with inconceivable audacity struck a vital blow at the heart of the great empire of the incas by capturing its emperor within half a dozen years nearly the whole of the vast region over which the inca power had extended was overrun and the outlying provinces were ready to submit at demand the rapidity with which a little band of spaniards conquered the vast and warlike empire of the incas is well-nigh incredible the terror inspired by horses and firearms did much but the capture of their emperor demoralized the imperial inca tribes still more once in the possession of the sacred person of the monarch the spaniards were regarded by the indians as the mouthpiece and the successor to his power from cuzco the capital a splendid system of roads and communications radiated to every part of the empire the military and political dominance of the imperial tribes had weakened the power of resistance in the provinces the elaborate structure which had been built up by the incas rather facilitated than hindered the spanish conquest once the decisive blow had been given at the centre the provinces submitted to the new rulers as fast as the spanish columns could march over the magnificent mountain roads south from cusco the indian empire extended two thousand miles it covered the whole andean region as far as the thirty-seventh degree of south latitude and extended from the pacific to the eastern slopes of the andean foothills in the present argentine it included the tribes living in the lesser chains which occupy the northwestern part of the republic some of these argentine tribes seem to have been only tributary to the incas others were completely dependent and extensive colonies had been founded in the cotton regions the general language was inca and that admirable system of irrigation and intensive culture which made peru proper a garden had been introduced on the eastern slopes of the southern andes the southern part of the great bolivian plateau seems to have submitted quietly to the spanish conquerors and the stream of adventurers passed on to the south in fifteen forty two diego de rojas led the first expedition of which a record had survived down through the umawaka valley into the actual territory of the argentine he himself perished in a fight with a wild tribe near the main chain of the andes but his followers continued their march 
Near Tucuman they passed out from the mountain defiles unto the Pampa, and leaving the desert to their right, penetrated through Santiago and Cordoba to the Paraná. No permanent settlement was then made, but the reports of thousands of peaceable and wealthy Indians inhabiting irrigated valleys, and the accounts of the magnificent pastures which stretched away to the east, soon tempted the Spaniards to take permanent possession. Seven years after the first exploration, a town was founded in latitude 27 degrees, midway between the Andes and the Paraná. About the same time, other adventurers came pouring over the Andes from northern Chile, and this current soon joined that from the north. The Spaniards established themselves as feudal lords, and the unhappy Indians were divided among them. In one district, 47,000 Indians were divided among 56 grandees. In 1553, Santiago de Estero, for many years the capital of the province of Tucumán, was founded. In 1561, the governor of Chile sent from Santiago de Chile over the Andes an expedition which founded the city of Mendoza, in a most beautiful region where the vine flourishes in perfection, and where a wonderful system of irrigation, inherited from the Indians, still exists to attest the latter's engineering skill. Next year, San Juan was founded, and these two towns were the centres for the settlement of the province of Cuyo, which remained a part of Chile for two hundred years. The immigrants from northern Chile and Bolivia established Tucumán in the tropical garden spot of the Republic in 1565. From Santiago del Estero, in 1573, an expedition was sent 250 miles to the south to a region of fertile valleys and plains at the foot of a beautiful mountain range. This was Cordoba, which at once became, and has since remained, the most populous of the interior provinces. By the end of the 16th century, the Spanish power was firmly established in settlements that have since become the Argentine provinces of Jujuy, Salta, Tucumán, Catamarca, Santiago, Rioja, and Cordoba. All these really formed a southern extension of Upper Peru. Their geographical, political, and commercial relations were with Charcas, Potosí, and Lima. The discovery in 1545 of the great silver mines at Potosí at once made the high Bolivian plateau, then known as the Audiencia of Charcas, the most valuable and important province of all the Spanish monarchs' South American empire. In 1571, the discovery of quicksilver mines in Peru vastly increased the output of precious metals. In 1575, the wonderful Oruro mines were opened, and before the end of the century, the copper pan amalgamation process was invented in Bolivia, revolutionizing the production of silver. The resulting prosperity of the mining regions of Bolivia stimulated the settlement of the northwestern provinces of the Argentine. The miners needed provisions which could not well be raised in the neighborhood of Potosí. There was a demand for cattle for beef and for horses and mules for transportation. A solid economic foundation was thus provided for the plain settlements, and the enslavement of the Indians and the breeding of cattle went on apace. By the end of the 16th century, northwestern Argentine, the province of Tucumán, as it was then called, was the seat of many thriving settlements whose Spanish inhabitants were mostly pastoral. The Indians in the neighborhood of each settlement had been reduced to slavery, and cultivated the fields that had been their fathers for the benefit of their white masters. The Spanish proprietors lived like feudal lords, while the Spanish authorities left these remote regions largely to their own devices. Conditions in Cuyo, the western province, just across the Andes from Santiago de Chile, were substantially the same. A political dependency of Chile, the few external relations it had, were with that capitancy general. The Spanish grantees ruled their Indian slaves in patriarchal fashion. Agriculture was the principal occupation. Pastoral industry was not so profitable as in Tucumán, and the region was more isolated. In both Tucumán and Cuyo, Spanish rule was superimposed upon a previously existing commercial and social structure. There was no attempt to expel or destroy the aborigines. On the contrary, they were the sole laborers, and their exertions the chief source of the wealth of their conquerors. There began a process of approximation and mutual assimilation between the Spaniards and their semi-civilized subjects. 
while the former continued to be a privileged and ruling caste, the latter absorbed much European knowledge from them. The Indian language long held its own alongside of the Spanish, and is still spoken in many parts of the region. On the Atlantic side, among degraded people who had not progressed beyond the wandering and tribal stages of existence, Spanish settlements proceeded on entirely different lines. There existed no well-organized body politic, into whose control the conquerors could step with hardly an interruption to industry. Campaigns could not be made with the confident expectation of finding abundant accumulation of food en route. Expeditions among the squalid tribes were slow and dangerous, and settlements stuck close to the rivers, instead of following fearlessly across the plateau to the spots where the finest lands and the most flourishing Indian communities lay ready for the spoiler. The beginnings of the coast provinces were painful and disastrous. The settlements were feeble. Centuries elapsed before the natural advantage of the region were utilized, and before its accessibility and fertility drew a great immigration. The assimilation of Indian blood did not take place on a large scale, and the immigrants and their descendants became perforce horsemen and fighters. End of section 1 Section 2 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Natter. Introductory, The Discoveries and Conquest, Part 2. Discovery of the Plate. The Portuguese discovery of the east coast of South America in 1500 was a disagreeable surprise to the Spanish government. The Treaty of Tordesillas had been framed with the purpose of giving America to Spain, while Africa and the shores of the Indian Ocean were left to Portugal. Nevertheless, the Portuguese vigorously asserted their right to the prize they had picked up by accident, and insisted on the letter of the treaty. They promptly explored the coast as far south as Santa Catarina, 600 miles north of the plate, but they had asserted no ownership farther south at the date when the Spanish expeditions began to be sent to the South Atlantic. In 1516, a celebrated sea captain from the north of Spain, Juan Díaz de Solis, was sent out by the Castilian government to explore the southern part of the continent. He simply reconnoitred the Brazilian coast, where the Portuguese had not yet established any settlements, and pressing on to the south, finally reached the plate. His first impression on rounding Cape St. Maria, where the Uruguayan shore turns to the northwest, was that he had reached the southern point of the continent and discovered the sea route into the Pacific. But the freshness of the water in the great estuary undeceived him. Following along the northern bank, he landed with a small party and was attacked and slain by a tribe of fierce and intractable Indians. When the news reached Lisbon, the Portuguese government protested against this invasion of territory, which it claimed lay east of the Tordesillas line. Portugal, however, did not follow up her protest or try to take possession for herself. At this very time, a celebrated Portuguese navigator, Fernando Magellan, disgusted by the neglect of his own country, was urging the Spanish government to give him the means of carrying out his great project for the circumnavigation of the globe. He was confident he could reach the East Indies by rounding the southern point of South America or by finding a passage through the continent in higher latitudes than had yet been reached. The year 1519, when Magellan sailed from San Lucar on the first voyage round the world, was big with fate for Spain. Cortes was adding a new empire by the conquest of Mexico, thus giving Spain control of the world's supply of precious metals. The popular assemblies of Castile and Aragon, of Catalonia, Valencia and Galicia, were preparing for a hopeless struggle against the might of a monarch who ruled two-thirds of Europe. At the very moment that Charles V was crushing peninsular freedom by brutal military force, the genius of Magellan and Cortes gave him the whole of America. Spain had heretofore been a federation of self-governing communes and provinces, but their independence was now destroyed. Military despotism proved strong enough to crush liberty, although it was unable to stamp out the feeling of local segregation. 
the very soldiers that conquered America, took over an intensive feeling that the central government was dangerous and inimical to the people, a sentiment which had always survived in some form among their descendants. Magellan stopped at the plate in the beginning of 1520, and explored the estuary to make sure that it did not afford the passage he was seeking. In October he reached the mouth of the strait that bears his name, and, wonderfully favoured by wind and weather, threaded his way to the Pacific in five weeks. Subsequent wayfarers were not so fortunate, and the strait never became a practicable commercial route until after the introduction of steam navigation. In the succeeding hundred years not half a dozen ships reached the Pacific round South America. Practically, the Pacific was accessible only over the Isthmus or by the immensely long journey round the Cape of Good Hope. Nevertheless, the importance of this epoch-making voyage has not been overestimated. The Pacific became, in a sense, a Spanish lake, in which she could maintain at will a naval preponderance. She occupied the Philippines and secured control at leisure of the Pacific coast of America. However, the scientific results were more important. Thereafter, the thorough exploration of all the shores of the South Sea was only a question of time. Magellan's voyage made geography an exact science. He sketched the map of the world with broad and sure strokes, and left nothing for subsequent explorers except the filling in of details. The occupation of the Philippines and Moluccas gave rise to new disputes between Spain and Portugal as to their rights under the Treaty of Tordesillas. The imperfect instruments of those days left the line doubtful on the eastern South American coast as well as on the other side of the world. In 1526, Sebastian Cabot was sent by the Spanish government to determine astronomically the location of the line in America, and then to follow Magellan's track to Western Asia. At the mouth of the plate he heard rumours among the Indians of silver mines on the river's banks and of the existence of a great and wealthy empire at its headwaters. This was Peru, not yet reached by the Castilians on their way south from the Isthmus, but the coast Indians showed Cabot silver ornaments which had been passed from hand to hand from the highlands of Peru and Bolivia down the river to the Atlantic. Cabot and his band of adventurers determined to neglect their surveying, trusting that the discovery of silver mines would excuse their disobedience. They spent three years in vain journeying and prospecting, exploring the Uruguay to the head of navigation, and following up the Paraná as far as the Apipe Rapids. Signs of neither silver nor gold nor of civilized inhabitants were found on either river. Their upper courses came down from the east, the direction opposite to that in which El Dorado was reported. The gently flowing Paraguay, coming down the plains in the center of the continent, seemed to offer a better hope of success. But Cabot's forces and provisions were inadequate to penetrating further north than the present site of Asuncion. Returning to a fort he had left on the lower Paraná, he found that it had been taken by Indians and its garrison massacred. Discouraged by such a succession of difficulties and misfortunes, he returned to Spain. The news of Cabot's expedition and its failure stimulated the Portuguese to undertake the colonization of the east coast of South America. Afonso de Souza started from Lisbon with an expedition, intending to take possession of the plate. Lack of provisions, fear of the Indians, the presence of a Portuguese castaway, one of those insignificant chances that sometimes change the course of empires as a twig diverts the current of a river stopped Afonso before he reached his destination. Instead of establishing a colony on the estuary, he founded San Vicente, just south of the Tropic of Capricorn. This became the southern outpost of the Portuguese possessions, and the temperate zone of South America was left open for the Spaniards to occupy when they chose. Two years after Cabot's failure, Pizarro overran Peru. All Europe ran with the exploit, the Spanish king was besieged by nobles who literally begged the privilege of risking their lives and fortunes in America. These adelantados contracted to conquer at their own charges the particular districts granted them, 
certain profits being reserved to the Crown, and Charles V freely granted such patents. Among the grandees was a Basque nobleman, Pedro de Mendoza, to whom was given the territory beginning at the Portuguese possessions south 200 leagues along the Atlantic coast towards the Strait of Magellan. He raised more than 2,000 men and reached the plate in 1535, where he immediately founded a city on the south bank which he named Buenos Aires. He intended to make it a base for an advance up the Paraná to find and conquer another Peru. His attempt was foredoomed to failure. The Indians surrounding Buenos Aires were implacable in their hatred of the invaders. They lived in scattered little tribes, and neither would nor could furnish food enough to maintain the Spaniards. The provisions brought from Spain were inadequate, sorties were useless, the Indians fled from large parties and ambushed small ones. The preparations for the advance up the river were delayed for months. Hundreds died of hunger and disease. Within a year the place had to be abandoned, and in a desperate condition the expedition fled up the river to Cabot's solid fort. Here the Adelantado stopped, sick and discouraged, while a few hundreds of more daring and persevering pressed on to the north, determined to reach El Dorado. Arrived at the junction of the Paraguay and Paraná, they chose the former river, and pushed on up it as far as the twentieth degree, to a place they called Candelaria. There they found vast lakes and swamps spreading to the west. It was necessary to protect their retreat before plunging into the difficult country that extends across to Bolivia. Accordingly, they divided, and one party remained on the dry ground near the river, while two hundred desperate adventurers pressed on through the wilderness, hoping to reach the Bolivian plateau. The party that stopped behind as a reserve was commanded by Domingo Irala, the real founder of the Spanish settlements in the Parana Valley. The main expedition never returned. Years afterward, friendly Indians brought back the tale that it had reached the slopes of the Bolivian mountains, obtained much gold and silver, and started back triumphantly, but had perished to the last men in an Indian ambush not far from the Paraguay and safety. Irala waited the appointed time and then floated down the river. He and his companions were well nigh in despair. So far as they knew, they were the only survivors of the 3,000 people who had accompanied Mendoza. To the north, the country was inhospitable and impenetrable, and from their experiences of the year before, they knew that at the mouth of the river, no provisions or succor were to be had. On their way up the river, they had passed, about the 25th degree, a beautiful and fertile rolling country, covered with magnificent forests, with park-like openings, and inhabited by a large and friendly Indian population. Opposite the mouth of the Pilcomayo, where there was a large Indian village, they stopped on their downward journey, determined to settle down and take some repose from their interminable and fruitless wanderings in search of the will-o'-the-wisp El Dorado. There, in 1536, they founded the city of Asuncion, the first Spanish settlement on the Atlantic slope of South America. The Foundation of Buenos Aires The failure of Mendoza, first adelantado, to establish a colony on the plate, did not discourage others from soliciting the grant of his territory. In 1540, Cabeza de Vaca, a conquistador celebrated for his feats in Florida, was appointed adelantado, and set out gallantly to find the second Peru, which everyone believed to exist at the headwaters of the Paraguay. Intent on reaching the interior as soon as possible, he made no attempt to establish a town and port at the mouth of the river plate, but landed at Santa Catarina, on what is now the Brazilian coast in the latitude of Paraguay, and set off across country with four hundred men and twenty horses. The distance was a thousand miles. The route led up a heavily wooded mountain range on the coast, and thence across a broken but open plateau, where great rivers point out the natural routes to the Paraná. The soil was fertile, and the Indians along the road were able to furnish considerable food supplies. 
Cabeza de Vaca made the journey without appreciable loss, and arrived in Asuncion eager to take command and dash across to the Andes. But the sturdy Basques had selected their able countryman, Domingo Irala, as chief of the colony, and gave the new adelantado a cold welcome. Irala insisted that a reconnoitering expedition be sent before risking the body of the Spaniards. Its command was given him, and he penetrated almost to the headwaters of the Paraguay. Next year Cabeza de Vaca followed, but as soon as he left the Paraguay he got into difficulties. He could not penetrate the swamps, nor make headway against the savage Indians who lived between the river and the eastern slopes of the Cordillera. He returned defeated and discouraged, and the people of Asuncion bundled him back to Spain. Though Irala subsequently did succeed in reaching Peru, by the route up the Paraguay, no practical results followed. Paraguay remained isolated from the Spanish Empire on the Pacific coast until a roundabout communication was established down the river, and thence went across the dry and level plains that stretch from the mouth of the river plate to the Cordillera. The early days of the Asuncion settlement were stormy. The rough adventurers fell to fighting among themselves, and their cruelties often drove the patient and submissive Indians into rebellion. Their greed for bigger plantations and more slaves pushed them on to conquering the aborigines in an expanding circle. By 1553 they had founded a settlement on the upper Paraná and were dominant from river to river in the southern half of the present territory of Paraguay. Until his death in 1557, Irala was the dominating personality in the colony. According to his lights, he was just in his dealings with the Indians. When he died, the settlement was firmly on its feet, and even the Indians revered him as their benefactor. The mass of the population was Indian, and Guarani has always remained the prevalent language in Paraguay. Absolutely isolated from other European colonies, and almost without communication with the mother country, the settlement was, however, an unpromising affair. The few hundreds of Spaniards might have sustained their social and military superiority over the hordes of Indians by whom they were surrounded, but without material and intellectual communication with Spain they could achieve no commercial success. An outlet to the sea was necessary. The original settlers had been adventurers, willing to follow Mendoza through swamp and forest up to the walls of El Dorado, and their children were not less enterprising. The horses brought over by the Adelantados had multiplied amazingly, and were spreading wild over the Pampa to the south. Cattle, sheep, and goats bred by millions. Before long, the attractions of a pastoral life began to appeal to the Spaniards and Creoles of Asuncion. The braver and more energetic preferred the free open existence of the Pampa to idleness in the sleepy villages of Paraguay. The Argentine nation proper began its existence when the Creole mounted his horse and took to cattle breeding on the plains. The possession of horses, as much as of firearms, gave the gaucho his military predominance over the fiercest aborigines, and the horse was also the cornerstone of his industrial system. The cattle of the open pampa gave him an unlimited supply of the best food, and his horses enabled him to procure it with a minimum of effort. Irala's successors repeatedly tried to establish a colony near the mouth of the plate, but they were not successful until the creoles on horseback had pushed their way south along the pampa and driven back or subdued the wandering Indians. In 1560, the Guaranis of Paraguay were definitely crushed in the horribly bloody Battle of Acari, but it was not until 1573 that the Spaniards from Asuncion succeeded in founding a city south of the confluence of the Paraná and Paraguay. Santa Fe was the first Spanish settlement on the plate in territory now a part of the Argentine Republic. The man who led the Creoles to the Pampa was Juan de Garay, a Basque who had been one of the soldiers in the army that conquered Peru. His energy and vigor, and the bravery of the Creole cavalry who followed his expeditions down the river and over the Pampas, at length opened up communications from Paraguay to Europe and gave Spain a seaport on the South Atlantic. 
Curiously enough, in the very year that Garay founded Santa Fe, the Spaniards from Peru founded Cordoba, the most eastward of the Andean settlements. Their hard riders had pushed on from Cordoba, reconnoitering as far as the Paraná, and there ran across Garay's men. The two currents of Argentine settlements met almost at the beginning, though two centuries were to elapse before they completely coalesced. Eight years later, Garay succeeded in founding Buenos Aires after Zarate, the first adelantado, had failed as badly as any of his predecessors. Garay, by sheer force of energy and fitness, became the real ruler of the settlements. Active, far-sighted, and able, he perceived that a purely military establishment at the mouth of the river was foredoomed to failure. To be permanent, the port and town must be self-sustaining, and therefore must be surrounded by farms and ranches, and be accessible by land from the upper settlements. In the spring of 1580, the acting governor sent overland from Santa Fe 200 families of Guarani Indians, accompanied by a thousand horses, 200 cows, and 50 sheep, besides mares, carts, oxen, and other necessaries. The soldiers of the convoy were mostly Creoles, born in Paraguay. Boats carried down from Santa Fe arms, munitions, seed grain, tools, and whatever in those rude days was essential to a settlement. He himself went by land with forty soldiers, following the highland that skirts the west bank of the Paraná from Santa Fe to Buenos Aires. The plate estuary affords no proper harbours. The immense volume of water spreading over vast shallow beds chokes it with sandbars, and the shores are so shelving that even small boats cannot approach the land. The north side is bolder, and at Montevideo and at the mouth of the Uruguay affords bays partly sheltered from the storms which sweep up over the level pampas and make anchorage in the river so unsafe but the north bank was cut off from land communication with the existing Spanish towns by the mighty Uruguay and Paraná, and Garay desired that his new city should be always accessible from his older settlements on the right bank of the Paraná. His choice of the particular spot, where the largest city of the southern hemisphere has since grown up, seems to have been determined by a few trifling circumstances. He kept as near the head of the estuary as possible, in order to shorten the land route from Santa Fe, and picked upon a slight rise of ground between two draws, which made the site defensible. The fact that a nearby creek, the Riachuelo, afforded a shelter for little boats may also have been given weight in reaching a decision. Though his settlers did not number five hundred, Garay laid out his city like a townside boomer. The surrounding country was divided into ranches, and the neighboring Indians were distributed among the citizens of the new town. A cabildo, or city council, was named, with the full paraphernalia of a Spanish municipal government. The new town started off in the full enjoyment of all the guarantees known to immemorial Spanish constitutional law. Troubles broke out almost immediately between the Creole settlers and the Spaniards, who had been sent over by the Adelantaro to fill offices and get the best things in distributions of land and slaves. Garay had hardly left the town to look after the rest of the province, than the Creoles, indignant over unfair treatment, forcibly demanded an open cabildo. This was an extraordinary popular assembly, which, according to old Spanish custom, might be called at critical times, and was something like a town meeting. In theory, the property owners and educated citizens were called together merely to give advice, but in practice it was a tumultuous assemblage to overawe the office holders. The Argentine Creoles were doing nothing more than asserting their constitutional rights as vassals of the King of Castile they compelled the Spanish office-holders to compromise. Meanwhile, Garay was clinching his claim to immortality as the founder of the Spanish power on the plate. He explored the Pampas to the south and west of the new city, and reduced many of the tribes to slavery or vassalage. He found the plains already overrun by hundreds of thousands of horses, the descendants of the few abandoned there forty-five years before, when the remnants of Mendoza's ill-starred expedition fled up the river. On his way back to Santa Fe, 
this great Indian fighter was ambushed by Indians and stabbed while he slept. His death was followed by outbreaks among the Creoles, who resented the efforts of the Adelantados' new representatives to establish a monopoly in horsehair. Scarcely had they found a way to make a little money by hunting wild horses for their hair, than the officials tried to absorb all the profit. The struggle between the repressive commercial policy of Spain and the interests of the plate colonists began with the foundation of the colony of Buenos Aires, and went on for more than two hundred years. In 1588 the Creoles obtained a foothold in the extreme north of the Mesopotamian region by founding the city of Corrientes near the junction of the Paraná and Paraguay. All the new commonwealths south of Asuncion obtained a solid economic foundation in the herds of cattle and horses which covered the plains. In the regions adjacent to the Andes, the Spaniards did not become so exclusively pastoral as their brethren of the Pampas near the plate. While they had more and better Indian slaves, their pasturage was not so good. Though apparently more isolated, their proximity to Upper Peru and the trade that went on with that great mining country, the goal of fortune-hunting Spaniards of those years, placed them more directly under the control of the viceregal authorities. Tucumán was a mere southern extension of the jurisdiction of the Audiencia at Charcas, and Cuyo was an integral part of Chile but this did not prevent the early development of a strong sentiment in favour of local self-government and of hatred of the imported Spanish satraps. By the year 1617, the settlements on the lower Paraná had become of considerable importance. Buenos Aires was a town of 3,000 people. The right bank of the river, as far as Santa Fe, was a grazing ground for the herds of the Creoles. Towns and ranches were flourishing in Corrientes. In that year, the Spanish crown abolished the office of Adelantado and erected the lower settlements into a province separate from Paraguay. The new province included the territory that is now Uruguay, as well as the four actual Argentine provinces of Buenos Aires, Santa Fe, Entre Rios, and Corrientes. Entre Rios and Uruguay were, however, as yet entirely unsettled. While the Creoles were thus firmly establishing themselves along the lower Paraná and in the Andean provinces, the Jesuits were converting the Indians in the east of Paraguay, and early in the 17th century these indefatigable missionaries had penetrated to the upper Paraná, crossed it, and were gathering the Indians by thousands into peaceful villages. End of section 2「South, from where the great mass of the Bolivian Andes shoves a shoulder to the east, as if seeking to join the Brazilian mountain system, and from where a low ridge stretches out to form the watershed between the Madeira and the eastward-flowing affluence of the Paraguay, extends an immense flat plain. Two thousand miles from north to south, and nearly five hundred miles in breadth, hardly a hillock rises above its surface from the foothills of the Andes westward to the sea. In the tropical north its surface is partly covered with trees, but south of the Chaco, the only woodlands are narrow belts following the streams. Everywhere stretch the grassy plains, without an obstruction or interruption. The soil is a fine alluvium, full of the right chemical elements, and admirably adapted to agriculture, wherever the rainfall is sufficient. As a pasture ground, it is the finest on the planet. Within recent geological times, this plain was the bottom of a great shallow gulf, which received the detritus washed down from the Andes on the one side and the Brazilian mountains on the other. The gradual uplifting of those youngest mountains, the Andes, raised their flanks until the adjacent floor of the gulf appeared dry land, a land already and prepared for human occupancy. Nowhere does man encounter fewer obstacles to his freedom of movement 
or find it easier to procure his food supply than on the Pampa. The characteristic topographical feature of the political division of South America, known as Argentina. Skirting the ridge on the east and draining the vast slopes of the Brazilian mountains of their tropical rainfall is the great river Paraná. In latitude 27 degrees, it turns abruptly to the west as if about to cross the Pampa, but a hundred miles further on it resumes its southward course. At this last turn, the Paraná flows into a river which comes straight down from the north, draining the bed of the old inland sea that used to divide South America. This junction of the Paraná and the Paraguay forms the second largest river in the world, a river without obstruction to navigation, but which is so immense that it cannot be bridged. In latitude 32 degrees, it turns back to the southeast, soon receives the Uruguay, a swifter stream that drains the southern part of the Atlantic Highlands, and then opens out into the great shallow estuary known as the River Plate. Between the Uruguay and the Paraná is the Argentine Mesopotamia, a flat region where the low-lying plains, covered with luscious greens, intersected with streams, and interspersed with timber, gradually rise upstream into the highlands of the missions. To the west, the Pampa is bounded by the foothills of the Andes and the parallel chains with which the great mountain system reinforces its flanks. At the Bolivian frontier, the great outward jutting shoulder of the Andes looms up among a series of subordinate chains. South of them, for a thousand miles, is a belt of broken country, averaging two hundred miles in width. The Pampa creeps up to the very foot of the mountain ranges, and where it is watered, blossoms like a garden. A quarter of the population of the Republic lives in the irrigated valleys of these Andean provinces. A comparatively narrow, arid belt stretches diagonally across the South American continent from the Pacific, in northern Chile, to the Atlantic in northern Patagonia. Consequently, from north to south, and from the Atlantic back toward the northeast border of that arid belt, the rainfall of Argentina decreases. On the northeastern frontier, it is about 80 inches a year, at Rosario, 40, at Cordoba, 30, at Buenos Aires, 35. In the Andean provinces, it decreases from over 40, near the Bolivian frontier, to 5 or 6, at San Juan, in the latitude of Santa Fe and Cordoba. In the eastern part of the Great Pampa, the rainfall is ample for cereal crops. In the western half, the rains are periodical, and the region is better adapted to grazing than to agriculture, and there the grasslands are intersected with tracts of deserts, which grow larger towards the south. In the Andes, the eastern ranges, catching the rain-laden upper currents, send down ample water to irrigate the valleys and adjacent plains. The Mesopotamian region, and the country directly south of the Plate Estuary, have, of course, an ample rainfall. South of the latitude of Buenos Aires, the rainfall of the Andean region, which has grown steadily less from the northern boundary, begins again to increase. The eastern slopes of the mountains south for an indeterminate distance are well watered, while the Patagonian plains to their east are dry and desolate. The climate varies from tropical, on the northern frontier, to arctic in Tierra del Fuego. The southern Pampa and the Andean provinces are temperate or subtropical, and admirably adapted for habitation by men of European descent. Tucumán is the hottest of these provinces. There the average temperature of the coldest month is 53 degrees, at Buenos Aires it is 50 degrees, at Cordoba it is 47. The average temperatures in these localities for the whole year are, respectively, 63, 61, and 63. When Columbus landed in the West Indies, this vast territory was occupied by two separate sets of aborigines. The Andean provinces were a part of the great Inca Empire. South as far as Mendoza, the Andean valleys were filled with vigorous yet peaceful population who had brought the art of irrigation to a high degree of perfection. Plantations of corn, mandioc, and potatoes flourished on the terraced hillsides and in the fertile valleys. The lower and hotter plains furnished cotton. 
constant communication, both commercial and governmental, was kept up with the centre of the Inca power in Cuzco, along roads that followed the eastern routes along the valleys and up over the passes to the Bolivian plateau, and thence to the central provinces of the empire. Chile, on the other side of the Cordillera, was a sister province, and the passes over the great range were well known and constantly used. The population was greater than it is at the present day. While the political solidity of the Inca Empire is doubtless exaggerated, it is certain that the same civilization extended from Ecuador to Mendoza and Santiago de Chile, and that the Cordilleran region was the home of twenty millions of people organized into vigorous, progressive, and expanding communities. The Andean civilization never showed any tendency to expand over the tropical plains of the great central depressions. The Incas themselves never cared to penetrate far down the wooded and steaming slopes of the Andes, lying directly to the east of their own capital. Their dependent states bordering on the Argentine Pampa did not cross the desert plains, where irrigating ditches could not reach. So far as we now know, the Andean Indians had never penetrated to the Atlantic. East of the Pampas, in the hilly woods of Paraguay and Brazil, tribes vastly inferior in intelligence, political organization, and civilization maintained a precarious existence. Many of those who belonged to the great Guarani family lived in palisaded villages and cultivated the soil, but none had advanced far on the road toward a reasonably efficient social and military organization. The procuring of food for their daily wants was their chief occupation. The tribes were too small to make effective warfare on a large scale. There was no prospect of any development into a higher culture. Certain tribes, inferior to the Guaranis, had spread from the wooded regions over the Mesopotamian provinces and into the adjacent Pampa, and the districts on both sides of the estuary, but they never ventured far from the water supply. Though brave and intractable, these people showed no real fighting capacity until after white men had taught them the use of horses. With this knowledge, however, they were able to offer a very effective resistance, which was not completely overcome until twenty years ago. The area of the whole republic is 1,212,600 square miles. The Mesopotamian region contains 81,000 square miles, being larger than England and even more uniformly fertile. The Pampa, suitable for grain production, including the semi-forested Chaco Plain in the north, has an area of not less than 350,000 square miles. The Andean provinces contain nearly 300,000, and Patagonia 316,000. The grazing Pampa is partly included in the Andean provinces. Its boundaries to the south and towards the Atlantic are not capable of exact definition but it includes perhaps half the territory of the republic. Except the higher mountains, and the so-called deserts of the center, the whole territory is productive. The description of the white man's spread over this immense country, the largest except Brazil of the South American states, and of all these the most immediately and unquestionably suitable for maintaining a large population of European blood, is tedious when told in detail but it is a story fraught with significance for the future of the world. On the plains of Argentina, the descendants of the Spanish conquerors have fought out amongst themselves all the perplexing questions arising from the adaptation of Spanish absolutism and ancient Burke law to a new country and to personal freedom. After more than half a century of civil war, constitutional equilibrium has been attained. The country ought to be interesting, where there has grown up within a few decades the largest city in the southern hemisphere, and the largest Latin city except Paris in the world. The growth of Buenos Aires has been as dizzying as that of Chicago, and the world has never seen a more rapid and easy multiplication of wealth than that which took place in Argentina between the years 1870 and 1890. Interesting, too, is Argentina as the scene of the most extensive experiment in the mixture of races now going on anywhere in the world except in the United States. In forty years, more than two millions of immigrants have made their homes in Argentina. The majority are from southern Europe, but the proportion of British, German, French, Belgians and Swiss is a fifth of the whole. 
Will the Northerners be assimilated and disappear in the mass of Southerners, or will they succeed in impressing their characteristics on the latter? Will a mixed race be evolved, especially suited to success in subtropical America? Will the system of administration, painfully evolved out of the old Spanish laws, prove permanently suited to the great industrial and commercial state that is growing up on the Argentine Pampa? Will the municipal and bureaucratic system prove adaptable and elastic enough to furnish a political framework for the tremendous economic development which has already made such strides, but which really has only begun? Will the intellectual and social ideas of the coming Argentine nation be military, bureaucratic, leisurely, or will they be purely commercial? Certain answers to these questions cannot yet be deducted from the data furnished by the history of Argentina. Their solution, however, inheres in the past of its people. The future of Argentina will have a profound influence on the rest of the continent. It has the largest territory except Brazil, the greatest per capita wealth, its population is increasing most rapidly, and it has received the greatest amount of foreign capital. Immigration and investment in the other countries may be expected soon to begin on a large scale. The experience of Argentina promises to prove invaluable to all of South America. End of section 3「Section 4 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1. Argentina. Chapter 2. The Spanish Colonial System. Spain, as a world power, reached her apogee in the year 1580, when Juan de Garay founded Buenos Aires. In that year, Portugal was united to the Spanish crown, and the East Indies and Brazil doubled Spain's colonial dominions. But at the very same moment the first symptom of her decline appeared. For the first time it was proved to the world that she could not hold the seas against her young rivals from northern Europe. Sir Francis Drake, the earliest harbinger of Britain's dominance on the seas, appeared off the plate on his way to the Pacific. Spain had trusted that the difficulty of threading the Straits of Magellan would protect the South Seas, but Drake slipped in in a spell of favorable weather and found few Spanish ships which were fit to fight him along all the coast to Panama. Drake's wonderful raid humbled Spanish pride where Spain was thought strongest and encouraged Englishmen to fight with a good heart a few years later the overwhelming invincible armada. In 1616, a great Dutchman, Schouten, found the passage into the Pacific around Cape Horn. This discovery revolutionized the navigation routes all over the world. Heretofore, the only practicable commercial route to the Pacific had been across the Atlantic to the north shore of the Isthmus. Nombre de Dios was the metropolis and the market where all the goods for South America were landed. Those intended to be sold on the shore of the Caribbean were sent along its coast, and those intended for the Pacific were carried overland to Panama to be shipped on coasters down to their destination. Direct communication across the Atlantic to Buenos Aires was forbidden by the Spanish government. Schouten's epoch-making discovery opened up the way for countless Dutch and English ships to ply a contraband trade with the towns of the Pacific coast, but it did not induce the Spanish government to change its time-honored policy or vary its trade routes. America was treated as the private property of the sovereign of Castile, and its commerce was to be exploited for his sole benefit. No Spaniard was allowed to freight a ship for the colonies or to buy a pound of goods thence without obtaining a special permission and paying for that privilege. Cadiz was the only port in Spain from which ships were permitted to sail for America, and the whole trade was farmed out to a ring of Cadiz merchants. To protect this monopoly and to prevent the export of gold and silver were the chief purposes of the Spanish colonial policy. Every port on the seaboard of Spanish South America was closed to transoceanic traffic, except Nombre de Dios on the north shore of the Isthmus. The towns on the Pacific and Caribbean coasts might admit coasting vessels properly identified as coming from the Isthmus and loaded with the consignments of the Cadiz monopolists, 
but the South Atlantic ports were absolutely closed so far as law could close them. Legally, no ships whatever, coasters or ocean carriers, could enter and unload at Buenos Aires. Her imports from Spain must first go to the Isthmus, be disembarked, and then transported across the mule paths to the Pacific. Thence the goods had to go in coasters to Callao, in Peru, where they were again disembarked, transported up the Andean passes, along the Bolivian plateau, and finally down into the Argentine plain. Under such conditions, in the southern provinces, European manufactures could only be sold at fabulous prices. On the other hand, such a system made exports impossible, except those of precious metals and valuable drugs. Hides, hair, wool, agricultural products would not stand the cost of such long transport by land and sea. The Spanish authorities seem deliberately to have come to the conclusion that America should be confined to producing gold and silver, and they ruthlessly strangled all other industries. The plate settlements especially suffered from the ruinous consequences of this system. Having no mines of precious metals, they were considered worthless, their interests were ignored, and their complaints given no attention. The mere existence of Buenos Aires was a source of anxiety to the monopolists and to the Spanish government. They feared that the English or Dutch might take possession of the mouth of the plate and thence send expeditions to intercept gold and silver shipments along the overland routes. More immediate and real was the danger of the establishment of a contraband trade which would deprive the Cadiz merchants of their enormous profits on goods sent by the Eastman route. The home government enacted laws of incredible severity in trying to enforce this policy. In 1599, the governor of Buenos Aires was instructed to forbid all importation and exportation under penalty of death and forfeiture of property. The shipping of hides and horsehair to Spain would seem to be harmless enough, but the Spanish government dreaded that gold and silver might be smuggled out in the packages. The government would lose its royal fifth, and the precious metals might be sent to Spain's rival and enemies in Europe. According to the economic ideas then accepted, gold and silver alone constituted wealth, and every ounce mined in America, which did not reach Spain's coffers, was considered irretrievably lost. To prevent clandestine shipments of the precious metals, all commercial intercourse from the coast to the interior was made illegal, and no goods whatever were permitted to pass along the road between Buenos Aires and Cordoba. In the very nature of things, such laws were unenforceable. Even the governors sent out for the special purpose of repressing evasions recommended modifications. But the Cadiz monopolists were stubborn, and their influence with the court was all-powerful. The laws remained on the statute books only to be constantly disregarded. No human power could keep people who lived on the seashore and who had hides, wool, and horsehair to sell from exchanging them for clothing and tools. Perforce Buenos Aires became a community of smugglers. English and Dutch ships surreptitiously landed their cargoes of manufactures and took their pay in hides or in silver dollars that had escaped the Spanish soldiers on the road down from Potosí. Rio and Santos in Brazil became intermediate warehouses for the commerce of the plate. The officials in Buenos Aires itself connived at evasions, and the very governors made great fortunes in partnership with smugglers. The guards along the interior routes shut their eyes when the mule trains passed, and the goods of Flanders and France reached Cordoba, Santiago, Potosí, and even Lima by way of Buenos Aires, and were sold at prices with which the Cadiz monopolists could not compete. Silver came surreptitiously from Chile and Bolivia to pay for these goods. The net result was that the trade followed its natural and easiest route, although there was a fearful waste of energy in the process. The bribe-taking official, the idle soldier at the road station, the smuggler handling his goods in small boats and risking his life at night, and the numerous middle men absorbed what might have been legitimate profit to the seller or to the consumer. Commerce was half-strangled, and with it the industries of the Spanish colonies. 
civil government itself suffered, for a community whose daily occupation it was to break one law could not be expected to have much respect for other laws, nor for the bribe-taking rulers and mulish legislators. Nevertheless, against these outrageously unreasonable regulations, the colonists for centuries made no armed protests. They never questioned the abstract right of the crown to forbid them to sell what the labor of their hands had produced. They evaded, but did not contest. Centuries of this sort of thing ingrained into South Americans the belief that industrial and commercial activity exists only by sufferance of the government. The right to sell, to buy, to exercise a profession or a trade depended on the permission of the government. The people saw the executives taxing industry at their pleasure and suppressing its very beginnings until such a procedure came to seem a matter of course. Commercial spirit was constantly hampered, and business skill deprived of its rewards. The evil effects of such a policy can be seen at every step of the development of the Spanish-American countries. It is no wonder that office-holding became the most popular of avocations. The farmer, the stock-raiser, and the merchant seemed to be allowed to exist only to pay the Spanish functionary, instead of the government's existing for the benefit of the producing community. To this day, service with the government is more esteemed than commercial pursuits. The national ideals are only slowly becoming industrial. The King of Castile was absolute sovereign and sole proprietor of America. The continent was an appanage of his crown. It did not form an integral part of Spain. America and Spain were connected solely through their common allegiance to him. The king governed America directly, assisted not by his regular ministers, but by a body of personal advisers called the Council of the Indies. His representatives in South America were the viceroys of Mexico and Peru. The latter's jurisdiction extended over all South America. Certain great territorial divisions had been made captaincies general, and though theoretically subordinate to the viceroy, they were in effect independent of him. In the great capital cities sat bodies of high judicial and executive officials known as audiencias. Amongst their functions was that of exercising the powers of the viceroy during his absence. Charcas, the capital of the mining region of Bolivia, was the seat of an audiencia, and since this city had no resident viceroy or captain-general, its audiencia was the real supreme authority over the Argentine and all the territory east of the Cordillera, from Lake Titicaca to the Straits. Viceroyalties and captaincies general were divided into provinces, each of which was ruled by a royal governor. When the Spaniards permanently occupied a new region, their first step was to found a city and organize a municipal government. Like the Romans, they knew no other unit of political structure. The governing body was called the Cabildo, and consisted of from six to twelve members who held office for life. It conducted the ordinary judicial and civil administration through officers selected by itself and from its own members. Though the governor was ex officio president of this body, and although its members had bought their places, they were not mere figureheads to register his will. Limited though their functions were, they represented the time-honored governmental form into which Spaniards had always crystallized, and the Creoles could not be prevented from obtaining a preponderant influence in them. Throughout colonial times, they represented local and creole interests, and operated continually as a check to the aggression of the military governors. The territorial jurisdiction of a municipality was usually ill-defined. Indeed, as a rule, in the days of settlement, it extended in every direction until the claim of another city was encountered, and the terms city and province were therefore usually synonymous. As population grew denser, new cities were founded, which, as municipalities, were independent of the capital town. But they were not necessarily separated from the original province. The cabildo of the capital of a province bore a peculiar relation to the royal governor, and often tried to exercise a control over the affairs of the whole province, deeming themselves his associates and the sharers of the functions he exercised outside of its own boundaries as well as within them. 
This assumption was favoured by the fact that no general body representing all the offices of a province existed, nor any constitutional machinery by which they could act in common. Spanish Americans have known only two forms of government which have everywhere and always coexisted, though they seem inconsistent. First, there is an executive, the limits of his power ill-defined, and often imposing his will by force in essence arbitrary and personal, and feared rather than respected by the people. Secondly, the cabildos, and the modern deliberative bodies. Never really elective, these have nevertheless performed many of the functions of bodies truly representative. They have checked the arbitrary executives, and furnished a basis for government by discussion. For centuries the communities looked to them for the conduct of ordinary local governmental affairs, and they survived all the storms of colonial and revolutionary times. On the other hand, their importance in the Spanish governmental scheme has been a most potent influence in preventing the growth of local representative government by elective assemblies and officials. Consequently, in national matters, freely elected and truly representative assemblies have been hard to obtain. Legislation has been controlled by the functionaries, and there has been no general and continuous participation in governmental affairs by the body of the people. Government by discussion and by the common sense of the majority is difficult to establish among a people accustomed for centuries to seeing matters in the hands of officials whom they had no practical means of holding to responsibility. The people have rarely felt that the executive was their own officer. He was imposed on them from above, he was not amenable to them, and so far as they were concerned he ruled at his own risk. The Creoles were intensely democratic in feeling and hard to control, and when they could not tolerate an executive, they turned him out by force, because no effective machinery existed by which they could turn him out peaceably. Though the colonial governor was required to give an account of his administration at the close of his term, as a matter of fact he was an irresponsible and despotic satrap who taxed, judged, and imprisoned people at his pleasure, restrained only by his traditional respect for the cabildos and by the fear of exciting revolt he commanded the armed forces and his power was in fact rather military than civil in origin method and application the cabildos selected the ordinary judicial officers of first resort from among their own members list but their authority was not very effective outside the town itself the vast plains between the settlements were largely governed patriarchally by the ranch owners and the popular and capable gauchos who grew into leaders a taste for town life soon became characteristic of the spanish americans and wherever able they crowded into the towns in preference to staying on their ranches wealth intelligence and political activity therefore came to be concentrated in a few foci the government of granting immense tracts of land and dividing up the indians as slaves among the proprietors would apparently have a tendency to produce a landed aristocracy but the money profits in colonial days were small and the great landowners lived in the same style as his poorer neighbour titles of nobility did not exist and the constitution of society was decidedly democratic from the very earliest times no love was lost between the creoles and the newly arrived spaniards the governor was almost invariably a spaniard while the cabildo and its officers were usually creoles End of section four. section five of the south american republics volume one by thomas cleland dawson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1. Argentina. Chapter 3. The 17th Century. The greatest name in the history of Buenos Aires during the early years of the 17th century is that of Hernán Darias Saavedra. Of distinguished ancestry and pure Spanish blood, he was born at Asunción in 1561. A thorough Creole, his education was confined to the instruction he received at the convent of the Franciscan Fathers in his native town. At fifteen he left school and joined an expedition against the Indians of the Andes. 
he showed remarkable capacity in fighting on the plains, and his shrewdness and firmness in dealing with the aborigines were even more valuable than his courage. Juan de Garay, the far-sighted Basque who founded Buenos Aires, was the patron, model, and hero of the young Hernandarias, who followed him in his great expedition over the southern Pampa. When Garay, the great Indian fighter and colonizer, perished, his mantle fell on the young man's shoulders. In 1588, Hernandarias distinguished himself in the defense of Corrientes against the Indians of Chaco, and was the leader in the difficult campaigns undertaken in retaliation. By the time he had reached thirty, he was the leading Creole in all the vast region from the upper Paraguay down to Buenos Aires, and when the Spanish lieutenant-general of Asuncion was deposed, an open cabildo called him to the vacancy. Eleven years later, in 1602, the governor of Buenos Aires died, and by common consent Hernandarias filled the office at interim. This popular selection was soon confirmed by royal commission. He signalized his term of office by an expedition down the coast in which he carried the terror of the white man's arms to the limits of the continent, and defeated the Indians wherever they resisted. Severe with the Indians when occasion demanded, he was inflexibly just, and as a rule protected them against the unlawful aggression of his countrymen. Though he did so much to curb their military power, he left behind him the name of being their best friend. He manumitted his own slaves, he opposed the extension of the system of encomiendas, with its enslavement of wild Indians, and after his first term as the governor of Buenos Aires, he was named official protector of the aborigines. Although a Creole, such was his ability as a military leader, and his shrewdness, wisdom, and firmness as a civil ruler, that the Spanish government could not ignore him. Though a governor was soon sent out from Spain to replace him and fatten of the provincials, Hernandarias remained the most powerful man in the colony. The Spanish authorities found that they needed him, and he retained their confidence as well as that of the Creoles. He wisely advised the latter against open opposition, believing that continued peace must make the colony so strong that its interests could not continue to be ignored. In 1610, the Spanish government promulgated laws forbidding the further enslavement of Indians, and Hernandarias did much to secure their enforcement. At the same time, he encouraged the Jesuits to extend their missions over the upper valley of the Uruguay, while he secured the ranchers of the western plains against the encroachment of these energetic priests. The Creoles prospered in the pastoral pursuits on the Pampas, while the Jesuits developed the more purely agricultural resources of the wooded hills in the east. The success of his policy soon became evident in the increasing prosperity of the colony. 300,000 hides were smuggled out of Buenos Aires in British ships alone in the year 1658, and by 1630 the Jesuit missions extended in a broad, continuous belt along the Paraná and the Uruguay from the Tropic of the Capricorn to the 30th degree. They were the rulers of a great theocratic republic, whose area could not have been less than 150,000 square miles, and whose population of something like a million was concentrated in thriving and peaceful villages. The Jesuits systematically studied the resources of the country, and taught their Indians the cultivation of many crops suitable for export. Their territory was commercially tributary to Buenos Aires, and contributed to her growth and prosperity. When the governorship of Buenos Aires again became vacant in 1615, by the death of the Spanish incumbent, Hernandarias entered on his own third term, and two years later, by his advice, the rapidly growing province was divided. Paraguay became a separate province, and the new province of Buenos Aires included all the territory east of Tucumán and south and east of Paraguay. The three provinces of Paraguay, Buenos Aires and Tucumán, were administratively separate, and each was directly dependent upon the Audiencia at Charcas and the Viceroy at Lima. One immediate purpose of the Spanish government in erecting Buenos Aires into an independent province was the enforcement of the prohibition of trade. It was thought that a governor, always on the ground and concentrating his attention on the subject, would be efficient in this direction. However, the result was the opposite of that expected. 
no Governor of Buenos Ayres could avoid making the interests of his capital city his own. If honest, he was constantly pressing the home government to open the doors a little and to make exceptions of particular cases. If dishonest, he went into partnership with the traders. Hernán Darias's career is the one striking example of success by a Creole in colonial times. Though the conquest and settlement of South America was accomplished by individual initiative, the men who had done the pioneering, who had fought and journeyed and suffered, who had stained their souls with horrible cruelties, whose adventures and successes would not be credited if the physical evidences did not prove the truth of the chronicles, were displaced with scant ceremony to make room for the impoverished court favorites. If the original conquerors were thus badly treated, the Creoles, unfortunate to have missed the inestimable advantage of being born on Castilian soil, could not look for favor or equal treatment with the office holders sent out from Madrid year after year. The story of the provinces that now form the territory of the Argentine Republic has not great interest during the long years that intervene from the completion of the Romantic conquest until the uprising against Spanish authority. With the end of the 16th century, the spirit of enterprise among both Spaniards and Creoles diminished. Throughout the 17th century, little progress was made in extirpating the savage indians even in regions as close to buenos aires as entre rios and uruguay settlements were confined to the right bank of the parana and the indians on the left bank protected behind the wide flood of that river's delta were left undisturbed on the other hand the dry and level pampas gave easy access to the thriving towns of the province of tucuman the Cordova range, the greatest of the outworks of the Andes, rises from the plain less than 200 miles from the Paraná at Santa Fe, and only 400 miles from Buenos Aires itself. The city of Cordova, in the fertile and well-watered slope at the foot of the Sierra, was the capital of the province, the seat of a university from 1613, and the centre of Creole culture. The intercourse of the Buenos Aires with their neighbours of the interior constantly increased in spite of the prohibitions of the spanish government while cordova and the other towns of tucuman prospered with the sale of pack mules to the mines of bolivia in the fertile andean valleys of rioja and catamarca had lived since inca times the powerful nation of calchaquies though they had acknowledged the suzerainty of the cuzco emperors they were ruled by their own chiefs the first spaniards that penetrated south from the bolivian plateau failed to reduce them to submission after a bitter experience the invaders passed to the west for fifty years this gallant people were left undisturbed in their andean fastnesses late in the sixteenth century aggressions again began the indians fought desperately but were overcome forty thousand were sold into slavery eleven thousand were exiled to santiago del estero to santa fe and buenos aires the town of quilmes now one of the suburbs of buenos aires was named from the mountain fastness where the calchaquis made their last stand rosario was also settled by families of these brave indians who were dragged across the pampas by the victorious spaniards about 1655, a leader presented himself to the remnants of this warlike people, claiming to be the descendant and heir of the ancient Inca princes. He was known to the Indians as Walpa Inca, while the Spaniards called him Boorquez. A woman of his own race, by the name of Coya, accompanied him, and she was greeted with all the ceremonious honors that belonged to the Inca queen according to ancient customs. Even the Jesuit missionaries recognized the validity of the claims of Borges, but the governor regarded him only as a menace to Spanish rule. He was pursued relentlessly, his followers rose in revolt. The rebellion spread northwards, but with the capture of the Inca it collapsed. He was sent to Lima, tried for treason, and executed, while the Calchaquis were placed under a military deputy governor, subordinate to the governor of Tucuman. Their descendants have repeatedly proved that they came of fighting stock. They were among the best soldiers on the Patriot side in the War of Independence. The province of Rioja never submitted to Rosas. It resisted Mitre even after Pavon, the last and decisive battle of the civil wars. 
and it was the last province to give its allegiance to the confederation the third province into which the whole territory which is now argentina was then divided was cuyo including the three modern provinces of mendoza san juan and san luis in its early years three settlements did not extend far from the andes late in the sixteenth century san luis was added thus connecting the spanish dominions from chile across to the borders of cordova the complicity of the spanish governors with the contraband commerce which were they especially charged to suppress is abundantly shown by contemporary documents the very first governor sent to buenos aires after its erection into a separate province was accused of agreeing to allow a lisbon merchant to land a shipload of goods he fled to sanctuary among the jesuits and there perished of grief and shame but others were more impudent and successful mercado villacorta came to his post announcing that he would so effectively enforce the prohibition that Quote, not a bird could pass with food in its beak from buenos aires to the interior End quote. however not so many months passed before a dutch ship applied for permission to disembark its cargo presenting papers signed by a natural son of king philip himself the captain offered to turn over his cargo in return for a certain amount of hides wool silver and enough food to take him back to flanders this proposition on its face was very advantageous and via corta accepted it on account of the royal treasury he made a faithful return of the enormous profits accruing from the cargo of the ship in question but neglected to report that three other dutch ships were anchored just out of sight and that she passed over to them in the night what had been laden on her the day before by chance a royal commissioner was in flanders and watched the unlading of all four ships he certified that three million dollars worth of hides wool woods and silver were taken out of their holds via corta was cashiered for the moment but a few years later we find him installed as governor of tucuman another governor andres de robles engaged so publicly and impudently in fraudulent transactions and corrupt contracts that his conduct was the text of sermons in all the churches but he calmly went his way and paid no attention to the clerical boycott and priestly denunciations imports by way of buenos aires increased so rapidly that soon the cadiz monopolists were complaining to the council of the indies that the potosi shops were filled with goods which had come by way of the plate absolute prohibition had manifestly failed and so palliative measures were tried permission was given to special ships to sail from cadiz for buenos aires carrying only enough merchandise to supply the demand of buenos aires itself and giving bonds to return to cadiz so that the return cargo could be checked over to see that no silver was included naturally this system proved impracticable and only opened another road to evasion the first severe blow to the extension of the spanish dominions over the valley of parana was struck by the portuguese creoles of sao paulo in sixteen thirty two though king philip of spain was at that time also monarch of portugal and brazil the paulistas viewed with alarm and jealousy the encroachments of the jesuits into the region lying to the southeast of the homes they had occupied for a century they had had a hard fight to keep the jesuits from establishing villages in their own neighborhood and now they saw these old enemies creeping up the slope of the tributaries of the upper parana shutting them off from expansion over the remoter interior the paulistas hated spaniards and jesuits they wanted indian slaves they wrecked little of the fine-spun discussions as to the whereabouts of the dividing line between the castilian and portuguese possessions their allegiance to the spanish monarch sat lightly upon them their homes were on the headwaters of tributaries of the parana and their expeditions followed fearlessly down the streams and across the plateau and burst unheralded on the northern villages of the jesuits the poor indians were defenceless and totally unprepared 
The Jesuits had taught them the arts of peace, but not of war. They had no arms; their spiritual rulers had bethought themselves safe in these remote plateaus in the middle of the continent; the few thousands of Paulistas away over on the Atlantic border had not been considered worth taking into consideration. Though few in number, the band of Portuguese Creoles created immense havoc. The Jesuit chroniclers said that 3,000 Paulistas killed and carried away into captivity 400,000 Indians in a few years. This is certainly an exaggeration, but we know that all the Jesuit villages were wiped out as far south as the Iguazu, and that north of that tributary the Spanish line was pushed back to the Paraná. The Jesuits protested, but their complaints availed nothing. A few years later, Portugal regained its independence of Spain, and the work of the Paulistas stood. Spain lost her opportunity of securing the whole Plate Valley, and the way was opened to the Brazilians to make the interior of the continent Portuguese. The Paulistas' raids extended as far as the Jesuit villages in Paraguay and those on the upper Uruguay, but here the priests managed to hold their own. Portugal's next move toward getting possessions of all the territory east of the Paraná and the Uruguay was made from the coast. In 1680, an expedition sent by the governor of Rio landed directly opposite the city of Buenos Aires and built a fort, calling it Colonia. This was the first permanent occupation on Uruguayan soil, either by Portugal or Spain. Both nations claimed it under differing interpretations of the Treaty of Tordesillas. Portuguese historians claim that the Paulistas had explored and asserted a right to the region in the early years of the 17th century, and Spanish authorities state that Jesuits had established a mission on the lower Uruguay about the same time. As a matter of fact, Colonia was the first permanent European settlement south of Santa Catarina and north of the Plate, on or near the Atlantic coast. The governor of Buenos Aires promptly raised a force, sailed across the estuary, and captured the new fort. However, Spain's diplomatic position in Europe at the time did not justify risking serious trouble over a matter that seemed so trifling as the possession of a piece of desert in South America. The governor was ordered to restore Colonia to the Portuguese authorities, leaving open for subsequent discussion and determination the question as to which nation was entitled to the territory on the north bank. With some interruptions, Portugal remained in possession of the port of Colonia for a century, and in existence was a constant source of annoyance to the Buenos Aires. It immediately became a rival for the trade with the interior, and its merchants had the advantage of the open aid of their own government. Their competitors at Buenos Aires, across the river, were confessedly engaged in breaking the law of their country. Exportable goods were never safe from seizure until they had left Argentine soil. Colonia was a convenient storing place, and the river crafts, once within its port, could discharge at their leisure, free from anxiety that active officials might threaten to enforce inconvenient laws. Every time a war broke out between the two countries in Europe, the exasperated governor of Buenos Aires would send over an expedition and capture the Portuguese town. Three times was it taken, and so often restored on the conclusion of peace. Colonia, in Portuguese hands, interfered with the trade of Buenos Aires merchants and the illicit gains of Spanish officials, and also destroyed any remnant of efficiency remaining to the prohibition of commerce across the Atlantic. Back of these commercial and temporary considerations was the menace to the future occupancy by Spaniards of the vast and fertile region extending from the boundaries of São Paulo to the mouth of the Uruguay. End of section 5section six of the south american republics volume one by thomas cleland dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by piotr natter part one argentina chapter four the eighteenth century the rapid decadence of spain itself during the reigns of the last kings of the house of austria was reflected in the colonies with the accession of the Bourbons, a forward movement began, and the colonial administration was roused into an appearance of activity. 
Something was done in the direction of adopting a more rational commercial policy, but it was already too late. The control of trade had irrevocably passed to Holland and England, and Spain could not recover the business of her own colonies. The efforts to improve administration were largely nullified by the conservatism of her aristocracy. It seemed that her medieval governmental machinery could not be adapted to the conditions created by her active rivals. In 1726, Montevideo, the strategic key to Uruguay, and the north bank of the plate was occupied and fortified. Thereafter, though Colonia still remained in Portuguese hands, it was isolated and scarcely tenable. Immediately, the north shore of the Uruguay began to be settled by Spaniards. Simultaneously, the ranchers of the right bank of the Paraná, who had long been tempted by the fine pastures on the opposite shore, finally ventured to secure a foothold in Entre Rios. The warlike Charruas had kept the white men out of this favoured region for two centuries, although it was so near to Buenos Aires. They did not yield without a struggle, but they were overcome, and those who refused to submit fled to the east bank of the Uruguay River, the present country of that name. There they were followed by the proselytizing Jesuits, and it was only a question of a few years before the Argentines proper had crossed the Uruguay and were pasturing their herds in the rolling Champagne country that extends from the river to the sea. The Spanish advance would have continued up the coast, probably as far as the northern boundary of the Rio Grande do Sul, if the Portuguese had not in the meantime established a town and fort at the mouth of the Duck Lagoon, which is the only port that gives access to the interior of that most valuable region. The increase in population, the extension of the occupied pasture ground, and the greater demand from Europe for hides and wool tended to multiply the volume and value of Argentine exportable commodities. Northern Europe made marvelous strides in purchasing power during the 18th century, and prices all over the world felt the impetus. The commercial policy of the Spanish government became more lax, and the trade prohibition fell into contempt and disuse. The system of fleets of Spanish ships under convoy was abandoned, and single ships, mostly foreignly owned, and trusting to their sailing qualities and equipment to escape capture, carried all the trade. The trade of Buenos Aires grew, and the population of the city increased in proportion. The exhaustion of the surface deposits and richer loads of precious metals in the mining provinces during the 18th century tended to increase the relative importance of Buenos Aires and her territory, even in the mind of the Spanish government, and to turn a current of immigration towards the pastoral and agricultural provinces. In 1750, the Spanish government made an effort to get rid of the Portuguese in Colonia by negotiation. Portugal agreed to exchange that port for the Jesuit missions, which covered the fine pastures in the western half of the present Brazilian state of Rio Grande. The helpless Indians were driven off or massacred in spite of their feeble resistance, but as soon as the treaty was made public, Spanish and Jesuit protests against the abandonment of the territory were so violent that the agreement was formally annulled by mutual consent. The Portuguese retained Colonia, and though they gave up their formal claims to the missions, the military operations they had so promptly undertaken against that region had pretty well rooted out Spanish influence on the east bank of the upper Uruguay. It was never re-established, and the dividing line of 1750 is still substantially the boundary between Spanish and Portuguese South America. In 1767, Spain followed the example of Portugal and France and expelled the Jesuits from her dominions. For generations they had been the largest property holders in the Plate provinces. In the larger towns, popular education was in their hands, their great schools, convents, and churches were the finest edifices in the country. To endow their educational and religious work, they had accumulated townhouses, ranches, plantations, mills, cattle, ships, and even slaves. Along the banks of the Upper Paraná and Uruguay, they had succeeded in dominating and absorbing the whole productive life of the community. 
their system in the indian regions smothered everything else no white man was allowed to visit their settlements the indians were kept in absolute ignorance of the existence of an external world the jesuits required their subjects to work gathering mate tea cutting wood cultivating the soil and tending cattle however the indians were kindly treated and were content with the easy life they enjoyed under the mild jesuit rule the fathers exported immense quantities of hides and controlled the production of mate then as now the favorite drink of creoles and indians in the southern half of the continent the indians received their living and the jesuits absorbed the surplus their misfortunes in brazil had taught them a lesson and they had tried to erect their theocracy in regions where they need not come into close contact and constant conflict with the lay settlers for a century they had been left undisturbed in southeastern paraguay and the region between the upper parana and paraguay neither their services to civilization nor regard for the interests of the indians nor their wealth and influence could avail anything against the mandate of the spanish monarch backed by the vatican and joyfully enforced by the colonial authorities the jesuits who had been employed in teaching in the towns were incontinently imprisoned and summarily shipped off across the seas while their schools were placed under the charge of other ecclesiastics and their estates sold at auction in the missions resistance was anticipated but none was made the indians accustomed to look to fathers for guidance in everything were aghast when they saw the jesuits leaving and spanish officials taking their places the new shepherds had not the skill to drive the flocks to the shearing and could not keep the indians together so as to exploit them for the benefit of the royal treasury from their cruelties and exactions the indians fled and sought refuge among the creole settlements of entre rios and uruguay where they constituted a valuable addition to the population this transplantation had hardly been accomplished when the spanish government took a step which revolutionized the administration of the southern half of the continent during the remainder of colonial times and determined the future boundaries of the nations of south america on the first of august seventeen seventy six the viceroyalty of buenos aires was created all the territory south of lake titicaca was separated from the viceroyalty of peru and the province of cuyo was detached from the capitancy general of chile the new viceroyalty covered the territory that has since become the four countries bolivia paraguay uruguay and argentina in colonial times it was divided into eight intendencias of which the northern four covered the region that is now bolivia and was then known as upper peru the four southern intendencias were paraguay salta covering the northwestern provinces cordoba covering the central and western provinces and finally buenos aires which besides the present province included santa fe the whole mesopotamian region uruguay and the jesuit country of the upper parana the creation of the viceroyalty was a reluctant and tardy reversal of the colonial policy which had steadfastly refused to recognize in buenos aires the inevitable outlet of the region although the four northern intendencias contained more than half the population and paraguay probably half the remainder buenos aires was made the capital situated at the mouth of the great system of waterways it was the natural commercial centre of the whole viceroyalty in fifty years it had doubled in population while the old cities on the bolivian plateau had remained stationary in seventeen seventy six the population did not much exceed twenty thousand souls but was rapidly increasing heretofore it had been rather a resort of smuggling merchants than a centre of political and social influence nevertheless from this unpromising route was to spring the spreading tree of south american independence buenos aires is the only capital that never readmitted the spanish authorities once they had been expelled and within her walls san martin drilled the nucleus of the armies that drove the spaniards out of chile and peru the alarming growth of the portuguese power southward was another potent reason for the establishment of a strong and independent military jurisdiction at the mouth of the plate 
The Spanish Government had at last determined on vigorous measures to take Colonia, drive the Portuguese from Rio Grande, and push the Spanish boundaries east to the original Tordesillas line. Pedro de Ceballos, the first viceroy, sailed in November 1776 in command of the largest force which up to that time had been sent to the western continent. Against his 21,000 men and great fleet, the Portuguese had no force, military or naval, strong enough to make a serious resistance. The flourishing Brazilian settlement of Santa Catarina was easily reduced, and leaving it garrisoned, the fleet and army went on to the plate. Colonia surrendered without resistance, and the army prepared to march northward and drive the Portuguese from all the coast as far north as Santa Catarina. Hardly was the advance begun when news was received that peace between Spain and Portugal had been signed. The latter retained eastern Rio Grande and Santa Catarina was restored, while Spain's title to Uruguay and the missions was recognized. Ceballos returned to Buenos Aires and actively engaged in the military and civil organization of the new viceroyalty. A fresh set of special regulations had been prepared in Spain, creating an elaborate hierarchy of executives. The chief provincial governors, now called intendencias, were subject to the orders of the viceroy in military matters, but as to taxation they were directly responsible to the crown. They were entrusted with the paying of governmental employees, which gave them great influence with the cabildos and functionaries. The intention of the Spanish government was manifestly to enforce close relationship and greater subjection to the central authority at Madrid. In practice, however, the financial independence of the provincial governors stimulated the feeling of local independence, increased the influence of the cabildos, and paved the way for the revolution. Since 1765, the rest of South America had enjoyed the privilege of free commerce from the mother country. Now the same rule was applied to Buenos Aires, and trade with Spain quickly attained respectable dimensions. In the five years from 1792 to 1796, more than 100 ships made the voyage to Spain, and exports ran up to $5 million annually. Buenos Aires became the entrepot of the wine and brandy of Cuyo, the poncho and hides of Tucuman, the tobacco, woods and mate tea of Paraguay, the gold and silver of Upper Peru, the copper of Chile, and even the sugar, cacao, and rice of Lower Peru. By the end of the century, the population of the city was 40,000. 30,000 more lived in the immediate vicinity. Montevideo had 7,000, and the outlying settlements of Uruguay, 25,000 inhabitants. The civilized population of the Buenos Aires Intendencia was about 170,000, and in population and in wealth it had become easily the first among the eight great districts of the Viceroyalty. End of section 6section seven of the south american republics volume one by thomas cleland dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain part one argentina chapter five the beginnings of the revolution the viceroyalty was a heterogeneous mass the common subjection of its component parts to the viceroy gave it a mere appearance of cohesion the centering of the commercial currents in buenos aires did not furnish an organic connection sufficiently strong to united provinces and cities so widely separated and so different in social and industrial constitution. Upper Peru had been a mining region, and its white population was largely of a shifting character. The bulk of the population were Indians, and the inhabitants of Spanish blood were still taskmasters. Society was as yet in unstable equilibrium, and the different elements had not thoroughly coalesced. Paraguay was an isolated and almost self-sufficing commonwealth. It was essentially theocratic and averse to receiving external impressions. In Salta and Cordoba, the proportion of Indian blood was not so preponderant as in Bolivia and Paraguay. Agriculture was the economic basis. The Creoles and Indians had largely amalgamated politically and socially 
and though the people of Spanish descent lived mostly in the towns, they were in close and friendly contact with the civilized Indians who laboured in the irrigated valleys. On the white pampas a new race of men had sprung into existence, the gauchos, whose business was the herding of cattle, whose homes were their saddles, and who were as impatient of control and as hard to deprive of personal liberty as Arabs or Parthians. The proportion of white blood increased towards the coast. Buenos Aires was the boom town of the region and the time. Its population was recruited from among the most adventurous and enterprising Spaniards and Creoles. Lima and Mexico were centres of aristocracy and bureaucracy, while the social organisation of Buenos Aires and its surrounding territory was completely democratic. All were equal, in fact. Neither nobles nor serfs existed. The viceroy was little more than a new officer, imposed by external authority, and having no real support in the country itself. It is not a mere coincidence that the three centres, Caracas, Buenos Aires and Pernambuco, whence the revolutionary spirit spread over South America, should all have been democratic in social organization and far distant from the old colonial capitals. In Buenos Aires, the viceroy himself could not find a white coachman. An Argentine Creole would no more serve in a menial capacity than a North American pioneer, and a Creole hated a Spaniard very much as his contemporary, the Scotch-Irish settler of the Appalachians, hated an Englishman. Not even religion furnished a strong bond of union between the widely dispersed cities and provinces of the viceroyalty. The priests had not been organized into a compact hierarchy. They had little class feeling. They lived the life of the Creoles and shared the same prejudices. Half the members of the first Congress after the revolution were priests, but they pursued no distinctive policy of their own and offered no effective resistance to the growth of the power of the military chiefs. Commerce with Spain had been authorized, but with other nations it was still unlawful. The Cadiz monopolists still fought hard to preserve their privileges and to control the Atlantic trade as they had controlled the route by the Isthmus. Great Britain had enjoyed a monopoly of the traffic in Negroes during most of the colonial period, but in 1784 all foreign ships carrying slaves were allowed to enter, unload, and take a return cargo of the Quote, products of the country. Unquote. The Cadiz merchants contended that hides, then the principal article of export, were not products within the meaning of this law, and the Spanish courts decided in their favor. This absurd decision created a storm of opposition in Buenos Aires, but even more unreasonable restrictions continued to be insisted upon. The proposition to allow the colonies to trade with one another was vehemently opposed by the people of Cadiz and their agents in Buenos Aires. Meanwhile, England's maritime victories in the War of the French Revolution were sweeping Spanish commerce from the sea, and the people of the Plate saw themselves again about to be shut off from the sea unless permissions were granted to ship in foreign vessels. Dissatisfaction grew apace and the prestige of the viceregal government and the influence of resident Spaniards were seriously compromised. At the same time, there were fermenting among the intelligent and educated youth of the city the new ideas of the North American and French revolutions, liberty, the rights of men, representative government, and popular sovereignty. For generations, England had cast covetous eyes at South Africa and South America. Menaced with exclusion from Europe in her giant conflict with Napoleon, her statesmen determined to seize outside markets and possessions. The Cape was captured in 1805, and the next year came the turn of Argentina. June 25, 1806, Admiral Popham appeared in the estuary, and 1,500 troops under the command of General Beresford were disembarked a few miles below Buenos Aires. The Viceroy fled without making resistance and on the 27th the British flag was run up on his official residence. At first the population appeared to acquiesce, but finally Liniere, a French officer in the Spanish employ, gathered together at Montevideo a thousand regulars and a small amount of artillery. The militia of Buenos Aires soon proved themselves anxious to rise against the heretic strangers. Liniere crossed the estuary and, advancing without opposition to the neighborhood of Buenos Aires, established a camp to which the patriotic inhabitants flocked. 
Within a short time he had armed an overwhelming number of the citizens. The scanty British garrison was shut up in the fort, and on the 12th of August the Argentines advanced. After some hard street fighting, the English were forced to surrender, and the flags which were captured that day are still exhibited in the city of Buenos Aires, with just pride as trophies of Argentine valour. The British expedition might have been successful had it been more numerous, or had it been promptly reinforced. If the capture of Montevideo had followed that of Buenos Aires, the Argentines would have had no base of operations, and their militia would have remained without ammunition and artillery stores. It is interesting to speculate what would have been the subsequent history of the temperate part of South America in such a case. It is possible that the plate would have become part of the British dominion, British immigration would have followed, and the plate might have become the greatest of British colonies. But the opportunity was quickly gone. The successes of 1806 so strongly aroused the spirit of national and race pride that thereafter the conquest of Argentina was a task too great for the small armies which in those days could be transported overseas. No sooner was Beresford expelled than the victors met in open cabildo, declared the cowardly viceroy suspended from office, and installed the royal audiencia in his place. A few months later, the dreaded British reinforcement came. Four thousand men disembarked in eastern Uruguay, and Montevideo was taken by assault. In Buenos Aires all was confusion, but the people were resolute to resist. Again an open cabildo assembled, and Linier, the French officer under whose leadership the victory of last year had been won, was given supreme authority. Military enthusiasm spread among all classes, and the people were rapidly enrolled in volunteer regiments. When General Whitlock approached the city with several thousand regulars, the Argentines confidently marched out to meet him. In the open they stood no chance, and they were compelled to fly back to the shelter of their narrow streets and stone houses. On the 5th of July, 1807, the British troops, disdaining all precautions, marched into the city. Both sides of the narrow streets were lined with low, fireproof houses, whose flat roofs afforded admirable vantage ground. The Buenos Aires men were well supplied with muskets, and the women and boys rained down stones, bricks, and firebrands on the masses crowding the pavements below. The British could not retaliate on their enemies, but pushed stubbornly on towards the centre of the city, dropping by hundreds on the way. At the main square, in front of the fort, barricades had been thrown up, and there the English met a reception which flesh and blood could not endure. For two days the conflict raged, but finally the English general was obliged to give up and ask for terms. He had lost a fourth of his force, and was allowed to withdraw the remainder only on agreeing to evacuate Montevideo within two months. The political and commercial consequences of the English invasion were vastly important. The military power of the Argentine Creoles, hitherto unsuspected, stood revealed. Local pride had been stimulated, and at the same time the invasions gave a tremendous impulse to foreign commerce. A fleet of English merchantmen had followed the warships. Untrammeled commerce with the world at last became a fact. English manufactured goods flooded the market. Articles, until then beyond the reach of all but the wealthiest, now became cheap enough for the purses of the gauchos. Buenos Aires's trade was boomed by the sales of imported goods to the interior provinces. Creole jealousy of Spaniards rapidly became accentuated. From this time dates the general use of Goths applied to Spaniards as a term of opprobrium, and of Argentines as a designation for the natives of the plate. Recognition could no longer be withheld from the men who had organized and commanded victorious troops, and henceforth the Creoles were in fact, as well as in law, eligible to offices of trust and profit. Even in the Buenos Aires Cabildo, though all the members were native Spaniards, Creole ideas predominated. Scarcely had the English retired from Montevideo when the course of events in Europe precipitated Spanish South America into confusion. Charles IV, the pusillanimous king of Spain, allied himself with Napoleon and aided the latter's aggressions against Portugal. The Portuguese monarch was driven to Brazil, the latter country thereby gaining complete commercial freedom and virtual political independence. 
This naturally suggested to the Argentines that they were entitled to the same privileges from Spain. Charles IV and Godoy, the accomplice of his wicked wife, who really governed in his name, were bitterly hated at home. Napoleon's troops swarmed over the country, and the monarchy itself was clearly tottering to its fall. Ferdinand, heir of Charles IV, conspired against his father and forced the latter to resign him his favour. The Spanish governor of Montevideo at once took the oath of allegiance to the new monarch, an act of insubordination to his tutelar superior, the viceroy. The latter was the Frenchman Linier, who sympathized with the Creole party in desiring to wait and obtain concessions for the colony before recognizing any of the various climates. A dispute over the oath of allegiance to Ferdinand arose, which marked a definite rupture between the Creoles and the old line Spaniards, between those who regarded the special interests of the colony as paramount and those who wished at all hazards to maintain connection with the mother country. Charles's abdication was only the beginning of complications. He protested that it had been obtained from him by duress, and with Ferdinand he appealed to Napoleon as arbiter. The latter forced them both to renounce their claims in favour of his brother Joseph. Everyone in South America was agreed not to recognise Joseph Bonaparte as King of Spain, but there was wide diversity of opinion as to what affirmative action ought to be taken. Most regarded Ferdinand as the legitimate king, but he was in a French prison. Charles still claimed the throne, while provisional governments were formed in many cities of Spain to resist the enthroning of Joseph. A central junta at Seville claimed to be the depository of supreme executive power, pending Ferdinand's return, and to this junta the Spaniards of the plate gave their earnest and unhesitating allegiance. But the Creoles could not see their way clear to an unconditional recognition of such a self-constituted revolutionary body. Few believed that the Spanish patriots could withstand Napoleon's armies. If Spain had submitted to Joseph, the various parts of South America would have become independent without any serious struggle. The Goths in the plate were united in a definite policy, loyalty to the only Spanish government that was vindicating the nationality. The Creoles could agree on no affirmative program, but all of them were determined that the Goths should not get the upper hand. The latter rose against Linier and tried to install a junta on the model of that of Seville. In view of the menacing attitudes of the Creole militia, the attempt was a failure, but the Frenchman did not have the resolution to maintain his advantage. The Seville junta finally named a viceroy, and though some of the resolute spirits among the militia leaders wished to resist, the majority shrank from open defiance of the highest existing Spanish authority. On the 30th of July, 1809, the new viceroy took possession. He gained popularity by his decree declaring free commerce with all the world, but his next act opened the eyes of the Creoles to the real effect of the re-establishment of the Spanish system. He sent a thousand men to Charcas, in the northern part of the Viceroyalty, to aid in the bloody suppression of a revolutionary movement undertaken by the Creole inhabitants of that city. The story that shortly came back of wholesale confiscations and executions widened the breach between the Spaniards and Creoles. Meanwhile, another crisis in Spanish home affairs was approaching. Napoleon's armies were sweeping the peninsula from end to end. In the early months of 1810, they overran Andalusia, the center of resistance. It seemed as if the subjection of Spain was about to be completed. On the 18th of May, Viceroy Cisneros issued a proclamation frankly revealing the critical situation of the Spanish patriot and of the junta under whose commission he was acting. All classes of Buenos Aires immediately engaged in feverish discussions as to what should be done. The Spaniards wished to retain their privileged position. The Creoles were determined to put an end to discrimination against themselves. These were the real purposes of the two parties. The Spaniards did not especially favour absolutism, nor did the Creoles in general intend to renounce the sovereignty of Ferdinand should he ever escape from captivity. Among the Creoles were many liberals, mostly young and ardent men, whom study and travel had convinced of the necessity for racial reform and colonial autonomy. 
Among their leaders were Saavedra, the commander of the most efficient militia regiment, Vieites, at whose house the meetings of the conspirators were held, Manuel Belgrano, afterwards the brains and right arm of the movement, and two eloquent young leaders, Castell and Paso. The active spirits conspired to depose the Viceroy, confident that the measure would be popular amongst all classes of Creoles. On the 22nd of May, a committee of popular chiefs waited on him to demand his resignation. Resistance was futile, for he could not rely on the troops. They were Creoles, and proud of the fact that Argentines had expelled the British. The office holders tried to arrange a compromise by which an open cabildo should elect the ex-viceroy president of a new governing junta. The populace and the militia would not submit, and on the 25th of May, now celebrated as the anniversary of the establishment of Argentine liberty, a great armed assembly met in the plaza. The Creole badge was blue and white, then adopted as the Argentine colors. The proceedings were frankly revolutionary. A junta was named from among the Creole leaders, and the Buenos Aires Cabildo obediently proclaimed this body the supreme authority of the Viceroyalty. There was no pretense of consulting the other provinces. Spanish constitutional law provided no machinery through which they could be heard, and the capital assumed, as a matter of course, the right of governing the dependencies. The events of the 25th of May were not intended to sever relations between Spain and Buenos Aires. The acts of the new government ran in the name of Ferdinand VII, King of Castile and Leon. An able and ambitious coterie of young men came to the front, whose achievements in war, administration and diplomacy were to change the face of South America. In the neighboring cities there were no spontaneous uprisings against the Spanish governors, but the Buenos Aires patriots lost no time in sending out armies to spread their liberal and anti-Spanish doctrines. The first movement was towards the old university town of Cordoba. Here ex-Viceroy Linier had managed to get a few troops together, but not enough to make effective resistance. At the first encounter they were all captured, and the Buenos Aires Junta immediately ordered the execution of the captured officers and of the anti-Creole chiefs. This barbarous act is a fair sample of the horrible bloodthirstiness of the war between Creoles and Spanish sympathizers. As a rule, both sides slew their prisoners, and the combats were, therefore, incredibly bloody for the numbers engaged. The Buenos Aires army continued its triumphal march through the provinces of Cordoba and Salta up to the Bolivian mountains. The Creole townspeople reorganized the municipal governments on an anti-Spanish basis, and the army increased like a rolling snowball. Not until it had reached the highlands of Bolivia was serious resistance encountered. On the 7th of November the patriots gained the Battle of Suipacha. The Creoles of Bolivia rose, and the Buenos Aires penetrated rapidly as far as the boundaries of the Viceroyalty. Meanwhile, Manuel Belgrano had led a small expedition to Paraguay. However, the inhabitants of that isolated region showed no disposition to join the Buenos Aires in their revolutionary movement. The Spanish governor allowed Belgrano to advance nearly to Asuncion, but there his little army was overpowered and forced to surrender on honorable terms. Montevideo's capture seemed essential to the safety of Buenos Aires itself. Spanish ships, under the orders of its governor, blockaded the river and constantly menaced an attack on the patriot capital. Early in 1811, Artigas, with a band of gauchos from Entre Rios, crossed the Uruguay and overran the country up to the walls of the fortress, defeating the Spaniards in the Battle of Piedras. Reinforcements came from Buenos Aires, and a siege of Montevideo was begun. At this juncture, news came of a great disaster in the north. The Argentines had at first been joined by Bolivian patriots, but the latter were jealous, and the former, bred on the plains, could not well endure the high altitude, suffering in health and efficiency. The Viceroy of Peru rapidly recruited a considerable army among the sturdy and obedient Indians of the high Peruvian plateau. On the 20th of June, 1811, the Patriot Army was attacked at Waki, near the southern end of Lake Titicaca, and was virtually annihilated. Bolivia was lost to the Patriots, and Spanish authority was re-established as far south as the Argentine plains. 
this great defeat completely changed the attitude of affairs. The Argentines evacuated Uruguay, and the Spanish colonial authorities everywhere took the offensive. The heroic resistance which the Spanish people were now making to the army of Napoleon's marshals encouraged the Viceroy and Governor to believe that Ferdinand would soon again be seated on the throne of his fathers. Spanish ships dominated the delta of the Paraná, and the Spanish troops from Montevideo descended at pleasure on the banks of the Plate or its tributaries. The Spanish residents at Buenos Aires plotted against the Junta, but their conspiracy was betrayed, and in the middle of 1812 their chiefs, to the number of 38, mostly wealthy merchants, were arrested and garroted. The situation of the revolutionary government was so desperate that it is not hard to understand why the Junta ruthlessly repressed all signs of disaffection. Victorious Spanish armies threatened them from both Bolivia and Montevideo, and fire in the rear would have been fatal. In this crisis of their fate, Manuel Belgrano, the great leader of the Buenos Aires Creoles, came to the front. A native of the city, he had been educated in Spain, where he had imbibed liberal principles. On his return, he threw himself with all the prestige of his learning, talents, and wealth on the side of the Creoles. His faith in the triumph of liberal principles was unalterable, and he was a more radical advocate of independence than most of his associates. Though without military training, and though his expeditions in Paraguay and Uruguay had not been successful, his prestige and his unwavering confidence in the patriot cause pointed him out as naturally the fittest leader. Again he was entrusted with the command, and went north to Tucuman, where the disheartened fragments of all patriot army were fearfully waiting for the descent of the victorious Spaniards. The inhabitants of Jujuy and Salta had been driven from their homes, and for the first time gaucho horsemen appeared as the principal element of the Argentine army. The junta ordered Belgrano to retire, so as to protect Buenos Aires, but he disobeyed and stuck to Tucuman and let the Spaniards get between him and the capital. With the country up in arms and the exasperated gauchos harassing his march, the Spanish general did not dare leave Belgrano's army behind him. The Spanish army turned back to Tucuman to finish with the mass of militia there before resuming its march to the capital. To the surprise of South America, the result was a decisive Patriot victory. The gaucho cavalry, armed with knives and bolos, mounted on fleet little horses, carrying no baggage, and living on the cattle they killed at the end of each day's march, followed the fleeing Spaniards up into the mountains and inflicted enormous losses. This victory gave the Argentines, for another year, assurance against invasion by land, and Buenos Aires remained a focus whence anti-Spanish influence could spread over the rest of South America. The Patriots again invaded Uruguay, shut up the Spaniards within the walls of Montevideo, and prepared once more to carry the war into Bolivia. All this while the government at Buenos Aires was involved in internal quarrels. The first junta soon expelled its fiercest, strongest, and most active spirit, Moreno, who seemed to have been the only man of the period who foresaw the necessity of establishing a federative form of government. With the disaster of Waki, the necessity for a more compact executive became urgent. A triumvirate assumed the direction of affairs. Its policy was at once despotic and feeble, and satisfied neither federalists, advanced liberals, nor the military element. The latter was becoming daily more predominant. A radical republican society called the Lautaro, composed largely of young officers, was organized and became virtually a ruling oligarchy. San Martin and Alvear arrived from Europe, and the prestige which they had acquired on European battlefields at once secured for them prominent positions. When the news of the victory of Tucuman reached the city, the military classes revolted, deposed the old triumvirate, and installed a new one. This revolution marked the final triumph of the sentiment of independence. The new government was active in every sense of the word. Belgrano was reinforced. San Martin was encouraged in his chosen work of forming the nucleus of a disciplined army fit for offensive warfare. The worn-out pretense of employing Ferdinand's name on public documents was dropped, 
The Inquisition, the use of torture, and the titles of nobility were abolished. The Argentine revolution had finally assumed a military and republican character. Independence was clearly henceforth its end and purpose. End of section 7section eight of the south american republics volume one by thomas cleland dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain part one argentina chapter six completion of the war of independence belgrano followed up his victory at tucuman by another invasion of the bolivian plateau even to a trained general and a regular army such a campaign would have been difficult the defective organization of his hastily gathered militia his own unfamiliarity with the art of war and the fact that he was opposed by a clever commander whose army was better drilled and better adapted to operations in that high altitude all conspired to leave the result in no doubt october the first eighteen thirteen he was badly defeated at via Pujo, and six weeks later his army was nearly destroyed at Iouma. With the remnant, he fled south to Argentine territory and was replaced in his command by San Martin. The advent of this consummate general and single-minded patriot revolutionized the character of the military operations. Unlike his predecessors and colleagues, he did not concern himself with political ambitions. He had but one purpose, to drive the Spaniards from South America. He knew but one way of achieving it, to whip them on the field of battle. He had none of the brilliantly attractive qualities, none of the eloquence of charm of most South American leaders. He had a horror of display, and made but one speech in all his life. By sheer force of will and attention to detail, he organized an efficient regular army. The victories that followed were as much due to his painstaking care and foresight as to his brilliant strategical combinations and admirable tactical dispositions. Because he thought another could finish his work better than himself, he voluntarily resigned supreme power on the very eve of the campaign which expelled the last Spaniard from South America, and, disdaining to offer an explanation, went into lifelong exile. So modest was he that his name and services well nigh fell into oblivion. That he is now recognized as the saviour of South American liberty is due as much to the literary labours of the greatest of Argentine historians, Bartolomé Mitre, as to the spontaneous opinion of his countrymen during the first decades after his retirement. General San Martín was born on the 25th of February, 1778, in a little town which had been one of the Jesuit missions far up the Uruguay River. His mother was a Creole, and his father a Spanish officer, who destined his son to his own profession. When a child of only eight, he was taken to the mother country and educated in the best military schools of Spain. At an early age, he entered the army and served in all the many wars in which Spain engaged after the outbreak of the French Revolution. He saw much active service and became a thorough master of his profession. He imbibed liberal ideas and joined a secret society pledged to the work of establishing a republic in Spain and independent governments in her colonies. When the Spanish people rose against the French conquests, San Martin threw himself heart and soul into the conflict on the side of the patriots and distinguished himself in the battles that opened the way to the recovery of Madrid. He was promoted to the lieutenant colonelcy but the next year he resigned his commission to return to his native land to aid her in her fight for independence. By a curious coincidence, the ship that bore the South American who achieved the independence of his country was called the George Cunning, after the European who, thirteen years later, did most to secure the independence of South America from external attack. He landed in Buenos Aires in March 1812. At that moment, the anti-Spanish revolution seemed everywhere to be on the point of suffocation. Bolivia and Uruguay were lost. The reaction was gaining ground in Venezuela. Chile was menaced by an army from Lima and shortly fell back into Spanish hands. Peru was steady for the old system. Only in Argentina and New Granada were the fires of insurrection still burning, and between them intervened Peru, the stronghold of Spanish power in South America, a citadel impregnable behind mountains, deserts, and the ocean. 
The war of independence could only succeed by aggressive campaigns, which must be conducted through difficult country and over the whole continent, and against forces superior in both numbers and equipment. San Martin's first step was to organize and drill some good regiments in Buenos Aires. He selected the finest physical and moral specimens of youth that the province afforded, and subjected them to a rigid discipline. After his ruthless pruning, only the born soldiers remained, and this select corps furnished generals and officers for the wars that followed. On succeeding Belgrano in command of the Army of the North, San Martin saw at once that all attempts at conquer Peru by an advance through Bolivia were foredoomed to failure. A campaign over a mountainous plateau, with the Spaniards in possession of the strategic points, and the inhabitants divided in their sympathies would be suicidal on the other hand to attack and defeat the spanish forces in peru itself was absolutely necessary the three hundred thousand inhabitants of argentina distracted by intestine warfare could not hope indefinitely to resist the spanish power backed by secure possession of the rest of the continent decisive victories were necessary to encourage the partisans of independence in chile peru bolivia and ecuador san martin's solution of the problem was to organize an army on the eastern slope of the andes to invade chile to drive the spaniards thence and to make the country the base of further operations to improve a fleet and with it gain command of the pacific and finally to attack peru from the coast the scheme seemed complicated but San Martin was one of those rare geniuses born with a capacity for taking infinite pains, and his pertinacity was indefatigable. He foresaw and provided against every contingency, and carried his plan to a triumphant conclusion. The story of the liberation of South America within the succeeding eight years might be completely told in the form of two biographies, San Martin's and Bolivar's. Trusting the defense of the Bolivian frontier to a few line soldiers and the gauchos of Salta, San Martin solicited and obtained an appointment as governor of Cuyo. This province was directly east of the populous central part of Chile, and was the refuge of the patriot Chileans, who had been compelled to flee into exile after quarrels among themselves had delivered their country to the Spaniards. His authority was purely military, and derived only from the dictum of the revolutionary government at buenos aires but san martin was not a man to hesitate on account of scruples over constitutional questions he laid the province under contribution and started to create an army capable of crossing the andes and coping with the spanish regulars in chile the inhabitants of cuyo were determinedly anti-spanish brave enduring and enthusiastic it was a good recruiting ground in itself the Chilean exiles were numerous and all anxious to join in an effort to redeem their country. The government at Buenos Aires sent him a valuable addition in a corps of manumitted Negro slaves, but his nucleus was the regiments which he himself had drilled at Buenos Aires. Though civil wars went on in the coast provinces, he was not to be diverted from his purpose. He kept aloof from them and for the three years laboured steadily, building his great war machine, recruiting, drilling, instructing officers, taxing his province, gathering provisions, building portable bridges, making powder, casting guns, organising his transports and commissariat. Meanwhile, Alvear, his old colleague in the Spanish army, had assumed the leading position in the oligarchy that ruled at Buenos Aires. He suppressed the triumvirate and placed his relative, Posadas, at the head of the government. The patriot armies were besieging Montevideo from the land side, but it was not until a fighting demon of an Irish merchant captain, William Brown, had been placed in command of a few ships which the Buenos Aires had gathered, that there was any hope of reducing the place. The remarkable man was nearly as important a factor as San Martin himself in the war against Spain with incredible audacity he attacked the spanish ships wherever he found them numbers and odds made no difference and he was never so dangerous as just after an apparent reverse his victory on the fourteenth of june put the spanish fleet out of commission 
The reduction of Monte Video followed as a matter of course, and the destruction of the Spanish sea power on the Atlantic side made San Martin's campaign on the Pacific coast possible. Civil wars broke out between the Buenos Aires oligarchy and local military chiefs in the Gaucho provinces, and soon hurled Posadas from power. He was succeeded by Alvear, but the commanders of the armies refused to recognize the latter's authority, and an insurrection in Buenos Aires itself drove him too into exile. One military dictator succeeded another, while the provinces more and more ignored the Buenos Aires pretensions to hegemony. The frail fabric of the confederation fast crumbled into fragments. With the end of the Napoleonic Wars, reinforcements began to arrive from Spain, and the royal arms were again victorious and threatened to wipe out the distracted republic. Rondeau, one of the generals who had helped depose Posadas and Alvear, had been rewarded with command of the Army of the North. Disregarding the experience of his predecessors, he made the third great effort to conquer Bolivia and strike at the heart of Spanish power in Peru by the overland route. His campaign ended with the crushing defeat at Sipe Sipe. Considerable Spanish forces followed him down into the Argentine plains, but as San Martin had predicted, the Gaucho cavalry under Güemes were able to keep back their advance. Belgrano and Rivadavia had been sent to Spain in 1813 to try and arrange terms on the basis of autonomy or the making of Buenos Aires a separate kingdom under some members of the Spanish family. They were informed that nothing except unconditional submission would be accepted, and they were then ordered to leave Madrid. Scheme after scheme was presented in Buenos Aires, discussed and abandoned. Belgrano wanted to make a descendant of the Incas emperor of South America. Others wished to offer submission to Great Britain in return for a protectorate. The English government rejected the overtures. A more popular idea was to elect a monarch from the Portuguese Braganza family, then reigning in Brazil. The only definite result of all these confused negotiations was a formal declaration of independence, made on the 9th of July, 1816, by a congress at which most of the provinces were represented, and which met in the city of Tucumán. Many of the members had no hope of being able to enforce such a declaration. However, it cleared the way for obtaining foreign help, and negotiations were continued with a view to inducing some European prince to accept the throne. Artigas, the independent military chieftain of Uruguay and Entre Rios, attacked in 1813 the missions to the left of Upper Uruguay, which the Rio Grande Brazilians had seized twelve years before. He was defeated by the troops of John the Sixth who followed him into Uruguay proper, and in 1816 captured Montevideo. Though the Buenos Aires had been compelled to concede Uruguay's independence, the movement excited among them an intense jealousy of the Portuguese. The scheme for a Braganza monarch at once became unpopular and impracticable. The taciturn general in Cuyo was, however, preparing a thunderbolt that would clear the Argentine sky of all these clouds, except that most portentous of all, civil war. After three years of incessant preparation, San Martin believed that his army was ready to undertake the great campaign. Though it numbered only 4,000 men, it was the most efficient body of troops that ever gathered on South American soil. Among the Argentine contingent were the picked youth of Buenos Aires and the provinces, reckless, enthusiastic youths, whose ambition, patriotism, or love of adventure made them willing to follow anywhere San Martin might dare to lead. Not inferior to their white comrades were the manumitted Negroes. The cruelest charges and the heaviest losses fell to their lot, and few of them ever returned over the Andes. The Chilean exiles were picked men, those who preferred death to submission, or who had offended so deeply that their only hope of seeing their homes was to return sword in hand. This force had been drilled and instructed on in all the art of war, as practiced during the Napoleonic era by San Martin himself, a veteran soldier of the great European campaigns, one who had fought with Wellington and against Massena and Salt. He was indefatigable in attending to details, and he seems to have foreseen everything. The last months were spent in preparing rations of parched corn and dried beef, 
in gathering mules for mountain transportation, and in making sledges to be used on the slopes which were too steep for cannon on wheels. The most careful calculations were made of the distances to be traversed, every route was surveyed, spies were in every pass, the Spaniards were kept in uncertainty as to which of the numerous passes along hundreds of miles of frontier would be used for the attack. San Martin's real intentions were not revealed by him even to the members of his staff until the very eve of the advance. When summer came in 1817 and all the passes were freed from snow, he was ready. In the middle of January he broke camp at Mendoza and divided his army into two divisions. Directly to the west was the Uspallata Pass, then, as now, the usual route between western Argentina and central Chile. Its Chilean outlet opens into the plain of Aconcohua, which is north of Santiago, and only separated from that capital by one transverse spur of the Andes. Off to the north was the more difficult pass of Patos, its eastern entrance also easily accessible from Mendoza, though by a longer detour, and opening at its other end into the same valley of Aconcohua. The smaller of the two divisions was to advance over the Uspallata Pass, so timing its movements as to reach the open ground of the Aconcohua Valley at the same time as the larger division, which, under San Martin himself, went to the north around the Patos route. The Spaniards had a guard at the summit of the Uspallata Pass, but the advanced troops of the Argentines charged it. Before reinforcements could come up, the division was over, and advancing confidently down the canyon on the Chilean side. Had the Spaniards sent up a force sufficient to prevent the Uspallata division from debouching onto the Aconcagua plain, it would have been caught in a trap. The second division could have bottled it up from below by leaving a small body at the mouth of the canyon. But before the Spanish commander had made up his mind what to do, news came that another army was rapidly coming down the valley leading into the Aconcagua valley from the north. Disconcerted by this attack from an unexpected direction, the Spanish commander hastened off with an inadequate force to repel it. He did not reach a defensible point in time. His vanguard was defeated, and he retreated along the high road to Santiago, leaving San Martin to reunite his two divisions at his leisure in the broad Aconcagua plain. Though the army had crossed the Andes over two of the loftiest and steepest passes in the world, so admirably had all dispositions been made that hardly a stop was necessary to refit and recruit. Artillery and cavalry, as well as infantry, were ready within four days after reaching the Chilean side to take up the pursuit of the Spaniards. Marco, the Spanish general, had not had sufficient time to concentrate his scattered regiments since the first news had come that San Martin was coming in force by the northern passes. Of his 5,000 men, only 2,000 were able to get between San Martin's advance and Santiago. The Argentine general was sure of having the largest numbers at the point of conflict, but the Spanish troops were veterans of the peninsula and were commanded by a skillful and resolute general. He concentrated his force in a strong position in a valley on the south side of the transverse range that separates Santiago from the Aconcagua Valley. He had hoped to make his stand at the top of the pass, there 4,000 feet high, but San Martin had been too quick for him. However, the position was admirable for a stubborn defense. The high road to Santiago descended from the pass down a narrow valley, which, just in front of the Spanish position, opened into a larger valley, running at right angles. The artillery of the Spaniards commanded the narrow mouth of the upper valley, and on a side hill there was a room to deploy the infantry and cavalry. The Argentine troops would be enfiladed in a close gut before they could form in line of battle. San Martin employed the tactics of the Persians at Thermopylae. There was an abandoned road running over the summit a little to the west of the travelled route and debouching into the same valley a little below the Spanish position. Through this, O'Higgins, the chief of San Martin's Chilean allies, at two o'clock in the morning on February the 12th, started with 800 men. By 11 he had reached the main valley and turned up it to attack the Spaniards on their left flank. 
His first assault, made without waiting for the other division to come down in front, was repulsed. San Martin, sitting on his war horse on the heights above, galloped down the slope, leaving orders to hasten the descent of the main body. As he reached the lower ground and joined the Chileans, he saw the head of his main column appear through the mouth of the pass. O'Higgins again attacked, and the Spaniards, taken in flank and with their centre assailed in echelon by the Argentine squadrons and battalions, were at a hopeless disadvantage. The position of their infantry was carried by the bayonet, while the Patriot cavalry charged the artillery and sabred the men at their guns. The infantry were the flower of the Spanish regulars. They formed a square and for a time held their stand. Finally, surrounded on their sides, their artillery gone, and fighting against double their number, they broke and retreated over the broken ground in their rear. Less than half escaped, and a quarter were killed on the field and in the pursuit. The Patriots lost only twelve killed and one hundred and twenty wounded. Though the numbers engaged were insignificant, and though the victory was easily won, the Battle of Chacabuco was decisive in the struggle between Spain and her revolted subjects in the southern colonies. Since the outbreak of 1810, the revolutionary cause had been losing not only territory but morale, conviction, and self-confidence. Spanish authority seemed certain finally to be completely re-established, perhaps by a compromise and concession to autonomy, but still on a basis gratifying to the pride of the mother country. The day before San Martin started on his march over the Andes, Chile was quietly submissive, Uruguay was occupied by Portuguese troops, Argentina was a mere loose aggregation of discordant and warring provinces, whose most intelligent statesmen had nearly given up hope of peace and autonomy, except by foreign aid or submission to some alien monarch. But the day after Chacabuco, the Spanish governor was flying from Santiago to the coast. Chile had become and has remained independent. In Argentina there was no more talk of Portuguese princes, of British protectorates, of compromise with Spain. The declaration of Tucumán had become a reality. There was much more hard fighting still to be done, and time after time during the next seven years the final result seemed to tremble in the balance. But hope and national spirit had been so aroused in South America that defeat was never irremediable. The rest of San Martín's military career belongs rather to the history of Chile and Peru than to that of Argentina. It is enough to say that he established his friend O'Higgins as dictator of Chile, thus assuring her cooperation in the prosecution of the war against Peru. Spanish successes in Chile and civil war in Argentina delayed for years his overmatching the Spanish naval power of the Pacific. Without command of the sea, he would have had to march his arm up to a desert coast between the Cordillera and the ocean, an undertaking almost impossible. The help of the Buenos Aires fleet was essential, and so was the aid of the Argentine treasury in buying more ships and paying foreign seamen. His friends at Buenos Aires were struggling for their lives against their rivals for supreme power. To San Martin's demand for assistance, they responded by begging him first to use his army to crush the rebellion. That he refused them in their hour of bitter need has been pointed out as a blot upon his fame, but his resolution was Spartan. Not even the considerations of gratitude to personal friends diverted him from his great purpose. He had that element of supreme great achievement, steadfastness to adhere to a purpose once conceived that nothing could shake. Pueyrredon might be driven into exile, the warring factions might tear Argentina into fragments, and jealous Cochrane might unjustly accuse him. The ambitious and selfish Bolivar might regard him only as an obstacle to his own supremacy. None of these things could change his course or alter his devotion to the one great purpose of his life. In 1820 he finally started up the coast, and in four months, without a pitched battle, he had rendered the Spanish position on the coast of Peru untenable. He met Bolivar at Guayaquil, and the personal interview between the liberators of the northern and southern halves of South America was the end of San Martin's public career. He went to it with the purpose of arranging a joint campaign to drive the Spanish from their last stronghold, the highlands of Peru. But Bolivar did not see his own way clear to cooperation. 
San Martin explained his predicament to no one, he uttered no word of complaint or regret, he simply gave up the command of the army which he had led for seven years, and resigned the dictatorship of Peru. There was no place for him in distracted Argentina except as a leader in the civil wars, a role he disdained. He went into exile without saying a word as to the reason for his action. Rather than precipitate a division between the patriots, before the last Spaniard had been driven from South America, he submitted in silence to the reproach of cowardice. Rather than geopart independence, he sacrificed home, money, honours, even reputation itself. The history of the world records few examples of finer civic virtue. The rest of his life he spent poverty-stricken in Paris. Only once he tried to return to his native country. At Montevideo he heard that Buenos Aires was in the throes of another revolution, and that his presence might be misconstrued. Without a word he took the next ship back to Europe. For many years his struggles against poverty and ill-health were pathetic. It was the generosity of a Spaniard, and not a fellow countryman, that relieved the last days of his life but throughout those weary thirty years he never wavered in his devotion to south america his last utterance about public affairs was a vehement laudation of rosas tyrant though he thought him because the latter had defied france and england when they disregarded argentina's rights as a sovereign member of the family of nations reading was the only resource left to lighten his old age and his last months were embittered by the approach of blindness his heart began to be affected, symptoms of an aneurysm appeared, and he went to Boulogne to take the sea air. Standing one day on the beach, he felt the awful shock of pain that announced his approaching end. Quote, Gasping and raising his hand to his heart, he turned with a touching smile to that daughter, who ever followed him like a latter-day Antigone, and said, C'est l'orage que men au port. On the 17th of August, 1850, being 72 years of age, he expired in the arms of his beloved daughter. Chile and Argentina have raised him statues. Peru has decreed a monument to his memory. The Argentine nation, at last one and united, as he had ever desired, has brought back his sacred remains and celebrated his apotheosis. Today his tomb may be seen in the Metropolitan Cathedral, bearing witness for Argentina to his just distinction as the greatest of all her men of action. End, quote. End of section 8section nine of the South American Republics, Volume One, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Nater. Part 1. Argentina. Chapter 7. The Era of Civil Wars. For half a century, from 1812 to 1862, the story of Argentina is one of almost continual civil wars, of disturbances and armed revolutions affecting every part of the Republic. But through the confused records of this half century there runs the thread of a steady tendency and purpose. The nation was instinctively seeking to establish an equilibrium between its centripetal and centrifugal forces, between the spirit of local autonomy and the necessity for union. At the same time, the irrepressible conflict between military and civil principles of government was fought out. Argentina emerged strong and united, while the provinces retained the right of local self-government, and the military classes were relegated to their proper subordinate position as servants of the civil and industrial interests of the community. When studied in detail, the story of the civil wars is confusing and tedious. It is my purpose to omit all that does not bear on the final rational and beneficent result. At the outset of the revolution against Spain, the oligarchy of liberals who ruled Buenos Aires assumed the sovereignty of the whole viceroyalty. They regarded themselves as successors to the power of the viceroy himself, and attempted to rule the outlying provinces with no more regard for the latter's interests than if they had been delegates of an absolute monarch. Though the people of the city of Buenos Aires often quarrelled as to what individual should exercise the supreme power, 
they were united in insisting that the capital should continue to enjoy the privileges and exclusive commercial rights with which the Spanish system had endowed it. Hardly had the revolution begun, when the districts in the neighbourhood of Buenos Aires showed symptoms of revolt against the central authorities. The cities of Santa Fe, Concepcion and Corrientes, each with its dependent territory, aspired to the status of independent provinces. Military chieftains called caudillos organized the gauchos, who were excellent cavalry ready-made to their hands, and defied the Buenos Aires oligarchy. José Artigas, a fierce chieftain of the plains on the lower Uruguay, gathered about him a considerable army from among the gauchos east of the Paraná, and did more than the Buenos Aires themselves to shut up the Spaniards in the fortress of Montevideo. He refused to accept the concessions offered by the Buenos Aires oligarchy, and a desperate civil war broke out. Buenos Aires successively lost Uruguay, Entre Rios, Corrientes, and Santa Fe. The fighting was bloody, and these districts were all terribly devastated. Cordova and the Andean provinces also refused to recognize the validity of orders emanating from Buenos Aires. By the year 1818, all the provinces were practically independent of Buenos Aires, though the latter abated not a jot of her pretensions to hegemony, and continued to send troops against the various caudillos. Her armies obeyed their own generals, rather than the orders of the central government, in desperation, the oligarchy finally peremptorily ordered San Martin and Belgrano to bring down their armies from the western and northern frontiers and suppress the independent chieftains. San Martin refused to obey, but the imaginative, warm-hearted Belgrano was not made of the same sterling stuff. He managed to lead the army of the north as far as the province of Cordoba, but at Arequito the troops, at the instigation of ambitious officers, revolted and scattered. Many joined the caudillos, and on the 1st of February the provincials completely overthrew the Buenos Aires militia in the decisive battle of Cepeda. This ended for a time the capital's pretensions to hegemony. Decentralization went on apace. Cuyo dissolved into the three provinces of Mendoza, San Luis, and San Juan. The old Intendencia of Salta became four new provinces, Santiago del Estero, Tucumán, Catamarca, and Salta, to which a fifth was added when the city of Jujuy erected itself into a separate jurisdiction in 1834. From the Cordoba of colonial times, Rioja split off, while the Intendencia of Buenos Aires had been divided into four great provinces, Santa Fe, Corrientes, Entre Rios, and Buenos Aires besides the independent nation of Uruguay. Each of these provinces practically corresponded with the leading city and its dependent territory, and the cabildo of each municipality was the basis of new local government. This process was spontaneous, and the provinces then formed have ever since been the units of the Argentine Confederacy. To many intelligent patriots of the time, however, decentralization seemed to be only a sure sign of swiftly approaching anarchy. Power fell more and more into the hands of the military leaders, and war became almost the normal condition of the country. During the four years from 1820 to 1824, there was no material change in the position of the contending forces. The provinces much desired to make a confederation, of which Buenos Aires should be an equal member, but the latter refused, and only waited for an opportunity to order to renew her pretensions to hegemony. Two opposing tendencies were, however, at work, which soon created two parties within the walls of Buenos Aires itself. Commercial interests had suffered so severely in the civil wars, and communications were so uncertain and so burdened with arbitrary exactions by the provincials that the property-holding classes began to press hard upon the office-holders of the oligarchy with demands for an accommodation and some sort of a union with the provinces. This was the beginning of the Federalist Party, which naturally found efficient support among the cattle-herding inhabitants on the great pampas of the province of Buenos Aires. On the other hand, the Unitarians were becoming more compact, more determined, and more definite in their purposes. Rivadavia, the greatest constructive statesman of the era, undertook the reform of the laws and the administration. 
he created the University of Buenos Ayres, founded hospitals and asylums, introduced ecclesiastical and military reform, bettered the land laws, and infused into the legislation a modern spirit. The improved tone of political thought tended to stimulate a more general and rational discussion of a modus vivendi with the provinces. The Federalists favoured the establishment of a system like that of the United States, while the Unitarians clung to the idea of a nation organised more after the model of the French Republic. In 1825 the provinces were represented at a general constituent congress which assembled in Buenos Aires. After much discussion, the Unitarians, with Rivadavia at their head, finally obtained control. In 1826 he was elected executive chief of the federation. This election, however, did not make him president in fact. Recognition from the cabildos and the caudillos was practically of greater importance than the vote of a congress of delegates who were unable to ensure the acquiescence of their constituents. Rivadavia's favorite plan of placing the city of Buenos Aires directly under the control of the central government excited bitter opposition among the Federalists of Buenos Aires. Under their leader, Manuel Dorrego, they protested vehemently against the dismemberment of their home province. Meanwhile, the crazy fabric was subjected to the strain of a serious foreign war. In 1825, the country districts of Uruguay rose against their Brazilian rulers. The Argentines went wild with joy when they heard of the victory which the Gauchos won over the imperial forces at Sarandí. Congress promptly decreed that Uruguay had returned herself to the Federation. The Emperor's answer was a declaration of war and a blockade of Buenos Aires. The fighting Irish sailor, Admiral William Brown, again came to the front, and his daring seamanship rendered the Brazilian blockade ineffective. He destroyed a large division of their fleet at the Battle of Uncal, while fast Baltimore clippers, commanded by English and Yankee privateer captains, swept Brazilian commerce from the seas. Late in 1826, an Argentine army of 8,000 men was assembled for the invasion of Rio Grande do Sul. Alvear, now returned from exile, was entrusted with its command, and on the 20th of February, 1827, the Brazilians were overwhelmingly defeated at Ituzaingo, far within their own boundary. The Argentines were not able to follow up their victory, and shortly returned to Uruguayan territory, but the Emperor was never again able to undertake an aggressive campaign. Negotiations for peace were begun, and Rivadavia's envoy signed a treaty by which Uruguay was to remain a part of the Empire of Brazil. A storm of indignation broke forth at Buenos Aires, and Rivadavia had to disavow his minister and continue the war. The blow to his prestige was, however, mortal. The Federalists had, indeed, never ceased to make war against him, and the Unitarian Constitution, which Congress had adopted, at his dictation, was rejected unanimously by the provinces. He resigned, and Dorrego, chief of the Unitarians, succeeded him as nominal executive chief of the Confederation. In reality, however, the Republic was divided into five quasi-independent military states. Dorrego ruled in Buenos Aires, López in Santa Fe, Ibarra in Santiago, Bustos in Cordoba, and Quiroga in Cuyo. Many of the officers of the army, which had been victorious at Ituzaingo, were dissatisfied with the triumph of Dorrego at Buenos Aires. They belonged to the Unitarian Party, and they were anxious themselves to usurp the places of the various caudillos. The first division that reached Buenos Aires after the signing of the preliminary peace with Brazil raised the standard of rebellion in the city itself. General Lavalle declared himself governor, while Dorrego fled to the interior, only to be pursued, captured and shot without the form of trial by Lavalle's personal order. This began the fiercest and bloodiest civil war which ever desolated the Argentine. The gauchos of the southern provinces rose en masse to fight the Unitarian regulars, while the generals of the latter began a series of campaigns against all the Federalist provincial governments and caudillos. General Paz advanced on Cordoba to give battle to Bustos, while Lavalle's forces invaded Santa Fe. 
Rosas, the chief of southern Buenos Aires, had rallied the Federalists of that province. He himself joined López, the caudillo of Santa Fe, while he left behind a considerable force of his gauchos to threaten the city from the south. Lavalle sent some of his best regiments against the latter body, but to his surprise his veterans were completely cut to pieces by the fierce riders of the plains. He himself had to retreat to Buenos Aires, while Rosas and López defeated him under the very walls of the city. These victories made the Buenos Aires Federalist leader, José Manuel Rosas, the chief figure in Argentine affairs. Thenceforth, for more than twenty years, he was the absolute dictator and tyrant of Buenos Aires. The most bitterly hated man in Argentine history, probably no other leader had as profound an influence in preparing the Argentine nation for the consolidation which was so shortly to follow his own fall from power. His personal characteristics and his public career are equally interesting. The scion of a wealthy Buenos Aires family, from his childhood he devoted himself to cattle raising on the vast family estates of the southern Pampas. He became the model and idol of the gauchos. By the time he was twenty-five he was the acknowledged king of the southern Pampas, with the thousand hard-riding, half-savage horsemen obeying his orders. In 1820, he and his regiment were chief factors in the revolution that placed General Rodriguez in power at Buenos Aires. Through the more peaceful years that followed, his power grew until he was the acknowledged head of the country people of Buenos Aires province and their champion against the city. He had been fairly well educated, his information was wide, and his intellectual abilities were of a high order but he thoroughly identified his tastes and prejudices with those of his rude followers, and in politics he was fiercely unitarian. The victories of 1829 over Lavalle placed him in supreme power at Buenos Aires and made him the nominal head of the whole Argentine. His real power was, however, far from extending over the whole territory. General Paz, with his veterans of the Brazilian War, had expelled Bustos from Cordoba and firmly established himself as ruler of that province. Quiroga, the redoubtable caudillo of the Cuyo province, gathered his swarms of fierce gauchos from the western pampas in the slopes of the Andes and descended to the very walls of Cordoba, there to be twice defeated with awful slaughter by General Paz. The latter followed up his victories by establishing unitarian governments in the northwestern provinces. In Cuyo he was not so successful, and Quiroga managed to sustain himself. Rosas came to the rescue of the despairing Federalists with the whole force of Buenos Aires. In that province all opposition to him had been crushed, and he was able to send a strong army against Cordoba, which surprised and captured General Paz himself. This misfortune demoralized the Unitarians. The Federalists and the terrible Quiroga again triumphed in most of the western provinces. It is estimated that more than 23,000 Unitarians fell in battle. Part of Paz's army retired to Tucumán and were there surrounded by an overwhelming force under Quiroga. Though their position was hopeless, they did not offer to surrender, nor would quarter have been given them had they asked it. In these internecine conflicts, the beaten side usually fought it out to the last men, selling their lives as dearly as possible. Five hundred prisoners taken at Tucuman were shot in cold blood, and only a few small bands escaped to Bolivia. Rosas filled the offices in the provinces with his partisans, while the obsequious authorities of the capital conferred upon him the high-sounding title Restorer of the Laws. He made a feint or two of resigning the governorship, and in fact left it in other hands while he led an army against the Indians of the South. He soon returned with the prestige of having extended wide domination far beyond its former boundaries. After much show of reluctance, in 1835 he accepted the title of governor and captain-general, and a special statute expressly confided to him the whole, quote, some of the public power. End quote. The thousands of murders, betrayals, and treasons of the long civil war had sapped the foundations of good faith in human kindness. 
The Unitarians were mere outlaws, their property was constantly subject to confiscation, and their lives were never safe. Rosas himself, least of all, could confide in the faithfulness of his partisans. Things had come to such a pass that no one could rule except by force. Whoever was in power was sure to be hated by the majority and plotted against by many, though he might have been raised to command by the acclamation of the whole population. Rosas was a product of the conditions that surrounded him. Belgrano, Rivadavia, and everyone who had tried to establish a civil government had failed. The forces of militarism and federalism had been too strong for them. From among the ambitious military chieftains, the strongest and fittest survived. Rosas understood the conditions under which he held power, and took the measures his experience had taught him would be the most effective in preserving it. He undertook to forestall revolt by creating a reign of terror. He replaced the blue and white of Buenos Aires by red, the color of his own faction. The wearing of a scrap of blue was considered proof of treason. A club of desperados, called the Massorca, was formed of men sworn to do his bidding, even though it might be to murder their own relatives. No one suspected of this affection was safe for a day. Sometimes a warning was given so that the victim might flee, leaving his property to be confiscated. Sometimes he was dragged from his bed and stabbed. The charge of deliberate bloodthirstiness against Rosas is, however, hardly borne out by the facts. For political reasons he did not hesitate to kill, and to kill cruelly, but he did not kill for the mere sake of killing. He was passionately jealous of foreign interference. Early in his reign he quarrelled with the government of France over questions in regard to the domicile and obligations of foreign residents. The French fleet, assisted later by that of Great Britain, blockaded Buenos Aires, but Rosas defied their combined power, although in this very year, 1835, he was menaced by a formidable invasion from the banished Unitarians. In Uruguay, the Colorados occupied Montevideo and had formed a close alliance with the Argentine exiles. Montevideo was the centre of resistance to Rosas, and from its walls went out expeditions to end the revolts which continually broke forth. In 1842, the Allied Unitarians and Colorados suffered a great defeat from Rosas's right arm in the field, General Urquiza, and thenceforth Uribe, chief of the Uruguayan Blancos, besieged the Colorados in Montevideo and controlled the country's districts. This apparently ended all hope of expelling Rosas from power. The immigration of the intelligent and high-spirited youth of Buenos Aires to Montevideo and Chile increased. Among these exiles and martyrs to their devotion to constitutional government were many Argentines who shortly rose to the top in politics, and whose abilities gave a great impulse to the intellectual movement. Among them were Mitre, Vicente López, Sarmiento, Valera, and Echeverria, who shared the honor of establishing civil government in Buenos Aires, and who aided Urquiza in preventing South America from becoming a military empire and in uniting the Argentine province into a stable nation. The longer the tyrant reigned, the less men remembered their own factional divisions. Practically the whole civil population of the capital was ready to support a rebellion. Rosas, however, was to fall not by a revolution in Buenos Aires, but because his system was inconsistent with the local autonomy of the provinces. He put his partisans into power as military governors, but no bond was strong enough to keep them faithful to his interests. As soon as they were well established in their satrapies, they became jealous of their own prerogatives and of the rights of their people. Rosas ceased to be a real federalist when he made Buenos Aires the centre of his power. He lived there, he raised most of his revenue there, and the city's interests became in a sense synonymous with his own. He excluded foreigners from the provinces, he forbade direct communication between the banks of the Paraná and Uruguay and the outside world. Everything was required to be transshipped at Buenos Aires, so that it might be subject to duty. The chief lieutenant of Rosas was General Urquiza, whom he had appointed governor of Entre Rios. 
The latter's generalship overcame the Unitarian rebellions in that province and repelled the invasions from Uruguay. Under his wise and moderate rule the province flourished and recovered from the devastation of the previous civil wars. Its fertile plains were covered with magnificent herds of cattle and horses, which fed and mounted an admirable cavalry. Urquiza himself was the greatest rancher in the province, and could raise an army from his own estates. Entrenched between the vast moving floods of the Uruguay and Paraguay, he was practically safe from attack, and his relations with his neighbours in Corrientes, Uruguay, Paraguay and Brazil were those of warm friendship and alliance, as soon as he had declared against the tyrant, who, seated at the mouth of the plate, cut off the countries above from free access to the sea. Though Urquiza was a caudillo, he had no such ambition for supreme power as plagued Rosas. He was even tempered, of simple tastes, and careless of military glory. In 1846 the rupture between him and Rosas came, and thenceforth he devoted himself to the overthrow of the tyrant. Three times his attacks failed, but in 1851 he arranged an alliance with Brazil, and with the Colorado faction in Uruguay. The war was opened by Urquiza's crossing the Uruguay, and in conjunction with a Brazilian army, suddenly falling upon the Blancos, who in alliance with Rosas were besieging Montevideo. Most of the defeated forces joined his army, and accompanied by his Brazilian and Uruguayan allies, he recrossed the Uruguay and moved over the Entre Rios plains to a point on the Paraná, just at the head of the delta. The Brazilian fleet penetrated up the river to protect his crossing, and on the 24th of December the entire force of 24,000 men, the largest which up to that date had ever assembled in South America, was safely over and encamped on the dry pampas of Santa Fe. The road to Buenos Aires was open. Rosas could do nothing but wait there and trust all to the result of a single battle. On the 3rd of February he was crushingly defeated in the Battle of Caseros, fought within a few miles of the city. Of the 20,000 men he led into action, half proved treacherous, and many of his principal officers betrayed him. He took refuge at the British legation, and thence was sent on board a man of war which carried him into exile. End of section 9「Section 10 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Nater. Part 1. Argentina. Chapter 8. Consolidation. After forty years of struggle, no formula had been found which would satisfy the aspiration for local self-government, and at the same time secure the external union so essential to the welfare of the whole country. The questions between the provinces and Buenos Aires, and between the different cities, which were rivals in the race for national leadership, seemed to a superficial glance to be as far as ever from solution. There had, however, been a shifting of the material balance of power, which was soon to change the situation. The provinces had suffered most severely from the long civil war. Corrientes was well nigh a desert. In Santa Fe the Indians roamed up to the gates of the capital town, and the Andean provinces were isolated and poor. The long peace under Rosas's rule had increased the wealth and population of Buenos Aires. The city lost hundreds of enthusiastic young liberals, but it gained thousands who fled from the disorders of the interior. Its population had doubled since his accession. 30,000 English, Irish, and Scotch had crowded in to engage in sheep raising, and the rural population of Buenos Aires province was nearly 200,000. City and country together had doubled, while the rest of the confederation had only increased one half. The capital province now contained 27% of the total population, and the proportion in wealth and percentage of foreigners was far greater. The number of sheep increased from two and a half million in 1830 to five times that number, and by 1850 there were eight million cattle and three million horses in the single province. All over the country, rational ideas about government had made progress. The people were thoroughly sickened of military rule. 
civilization, education, and general intelligence were spreading their beneficent influences. Industry, commerce, and the pursuit of wealth were absorbing more of the national energies. Urquiza, greatest of the caudillos, saw that without peace and union, Entre Rios could not be ensured prosperity. He had no sooner entered Buenos Aires than he took measures looking to the framing and adoption of a federal constitution. After his victory, he was named provisional director of the confederation, but he showed no wish to play the role of a Rosas. All the governors met and agreed to the calling of a constituent congress, in which each province was to have an equal vote. As a further precaution against the predominance of Buenos Aires, the session was to be held in Santa Fe. The provinces were anxious to form a strong federation, and the only opposition came from Buenos Aires. Her statesmen did not realize that she was bound to be the center of the system, and that the pull of her superior mass would, before many years, be sufficient to control the aberrations of the satellites. Though the governor of Buenos Aires had agreed on behalf of his province, and though Urquiza's military power was overwhelming, the legislature of that province refused its assent. It was clear that Buenos Aires and the other provinces would not be able to agree upon a basis of union. The ambitious cities of the interior each aspired to take the place of Buenos Aires as the capital, and to this humiliation the latter city would never submit unless after another civil war. Urquiza determined not to use force, and retired to his ranch. As soon as he was out of sight, the city rose in arms against his nominees. The broad-minded Entre Rios chieftain sent back word that he had won the Battle of Caseros for the sole purpose of giving Buenos Aires her liberty, and that he would not now intervene to prevent her making the use of it she chose. He even disbanded his troops. However, when the Buenos Aires marched an army to the attack of Santa Fe, where the Constituent Congress, attended by delegates from all the other provinces, was holding its sessions, he again took the field. A counter-revolution broke out in the rural districts of the Buenos Aires province against the faction dominant in the city. Urquiza joined his forces to theirs and besieged the town. A land siege was useless without a blockade on the water side, and Urquiza tried to establish one. He was unsuccessful because the commanders of his ships treacherously betrayed him, surrendering to the city party for a heavy bribe. He raised the siege and retired to the northern provinces. Buenos Aires virtually declared her independence of the other provinces by this action, but the latter took no further steps to force her into their union. Urquiza and his followers had, however, accomplished more toward uniting the Argentine into a firmly knit nation than had been done in the previous forty years. The opposition of Buenos Aires helped convince the other provinces of the necessity of a union. With the mouth of the river in the hands of a hostile state more powerful than any of them separately, the position of Entre Rios, Santa Fe, or any one of the others would have been critical. Only by uniting could they hope to maintain themselves and avoid absorption in detail. Intelligent Argentines had long been convinced of the desirability of a firm and enduring union, and the present danger crystallized that conviction in man's mind. Back of all, this was Urquiza's influence. At last, a military chief had come to the possession of a supreme power who was willing to aid his country in establishing a stable and free government, and whose purpose was not merely the gratification of his own love of power. Argentine writers are divided in their opinion of Urquiza's real abilities, and many think that ignorance and irresolution, rather than a lofty patriotism, cost his moderation after his victory over Rosas. Intelligent foreigners, however, who saw the plate for themselves during this period, were unanimous in praising his character, his dignified bearing, his liberality, and his capacities. Argentina had passed the stage when a military dictator was her natural chief. The day for constitutional government had arrived. Urquiza was a product of his time, and consciously or unconsciously embodied the changed political sentiments of his countrymen. On the 1st of May, 1853, the Constituent Congress adopted a constitution substantially copied from that of the United States of North America, and that constitution, with a few amendments, had continued to be the fundamental law of the Argentine Republic. 
The navigation of the Parana and the Uruguay was declared free to all the world, largely as a reward to Brazil for her assistance against Rosas, although she protested against the extension of that liberty to any nations except those who had territory on the banks. The city of Parana, in the province of Entre Rios, and on the eastern shore of the Parana River, was made temporary capital of the Republic. The various provincial capitals had been unable to agree that any of them should have the honour and profit of being the political metropolis, and the city of Buenos Aires was selected as a permanent capital, to become such as soon as the province of that name should enter the confederation. The delegates had a double purpose in making this selection. Buenos Aires was the natural commercial and political centre, and, all things considered, the most convenient location in the provinces. In the second place, they desired to weaken the great province of Buenos Aires by cutting it in two, and to curb the city's political influence by placing it directly under the control of the federal government. Urquiza was naturally selected as the first president, and was recognized by foreign nations. Buenos Aires protested, claiming still to be, for the international purposes, the Argentine nation. She did not, however, formally declare her independence, and seek for recognition as a new power. Buenos Aires, as well as the Confederation, looked forward to the time when she would join the latter. Throughout Urquiza's six-year term, the provinces prospered amazingly. His administration of his province had guaranteed the security of property, and now, as president, he extended the blessings of peace to much of the rest of the confederation. The new bonds sat lightly on the outlying provinces of the Andean regions, but Urquiza did not stretch his constitutional authority to interfere with them satisfied to let them learn by degrees that the right of local self-government guaranteed by the paper constitution would be respected in practice the freedom of navigation caused unprecedented prosperity in the river provinces the towns on the parana and uruguay doubled in population during his six years service corrientes had been continually ravaged by the civil wars as lately as last few years of rosas's reign but the assurance of peace was all that was needed to start the rebuilding of the houses and the restocking of the ranches the impulse in population wealth and commerce then given to the river provinces has never since lost its force foreign capital and immigration were invited and the rivers and harbours carefully surveyed rosario in santa fe was made a port of entry and began a growth that has made it second only to buenos aires itself in buenos aires events were gradually shaping themselves toward reuniting that province with the confederation a liberal provincial constitution was adopted and though the ruling bureaucracy preferred the status quo fearing that their own fall from power would follow any triumph of the provincials they were unable to hold the city in check it was too evident that the real interests of the city and even her future commercial supremacy were menaced by a continuance of the separation in eighteen fifty nine the situation became so strained that buenos aires marched an army to attack the national government urquiza met it near the borders of santa fe and buenos aires and administered a defeat he advanced to the city and required his vanquished opponents to agree to accept the constitution of eighteen fifty three and to consent that buenos aires should become a member of the confederation he yielded however to the wishes of many buenos aireans and consented in the interest of harmony that the question of the dismembering of the city from the province and capitalizing the former should remain open for future determination the essential justice in all other aspects of the constitution of eighteen fifty three had long been admitted even in buenos aires and there remained no reason why the latter should not enter the confederation once and for all on the twenty first of october eighteen sixty general bartolome mitre governor of buenos aires swore to the constitution saying quote, this is the permanent organic law the real expression of the perpetual union of the members of the argentine family so long separated by civil war and bloodshed End of quote. meanwhile urquiza's term had expired dr derqui his successor was suspected of designs against the autonomy of the provincial governments the assassination of the governor of san juan 
and the succession of a member of an opposite faction, was made the occasion for federal intervention in the affairs of that province. The government of Buenos Aires protested, and it became evident that this untoward event was soon to disturb the peace of the newly formed confederation. The Federal Congress, under their key influence, refused to admit the members from Buenos Aires. Mitre marched out at the head of her forces, and at the Battle of Pavon, September 17, 1861, he overthrew the provincial forces. Buenos Aires remained mistress of the situation. The governments of certain provinces had been imposed on their people by the Derqui administration, or they were obnoxious to the triumphant Buenos Aires party. They were overthrown, and their key was deposed. Happily for the Argentine, Mitre was a sincere patriot, and, though young, was moderate and conciliatory. Made president of the Republic as the representative of the victorious Buenos Aires, he set about the final reorganization of constitutional government in a spirit of unselfishness and with a foresight and skill that greatly aided to save his country from the sterilizing anarchy of civil war. The accession of Mitre in 1862 marked the end of the period of uncertainty. The government of the Argentine Republic was now finally and definitely established and fixed, after 42 years of conflict. The constitution of 1853 was left unamended, except that Buenos Aires became the seat of federal government without being separated from its province or ceasing to be the provincial capital. The free international navigation of the rivers was not interfered with, and Buenos Aires abandoned her pretensions to special commercial privileges. She was thenceforward more and more the centre of gravitation and power for the whole republic, but her influence came from legitimate natural causes, and was exercised within constitutional limits. The autonomy of the provinces was not interfered with, and it was no longer possible, even in the remotest districts, for a caudillo to rally at his call the gauchos, always ready for a raid, a campaign, or an invasion. Though the form of the federal government was fixed, and its theoretical supremacy has never since been questioned, its real power at first was feeble. Urquiza was master in the Mesopotamian provinces, and in case of need, Mitre could count on little military help except from his own province. The only result of the Battle of Pavon, which was immediately apparent, was the shifting of the center of power from Urquiza's capital to Buenos Aires. Nevertheless, henceforth the tendency was constantly towards strengthening the bonds of union. Urquiza and the other provincial governors showed no disposition to attack the central authority, and in turn the latter was careful to avoid useless aggressions against them. The problem of reconciling provincial rights with the existence of an adequate federal government had at last been solved. The nation passed on to a still more difficult question. The smooth and satisfactory working of democratic representative institutions in the absence of an effective participation in public affairs on the part of the bulk of the population. Elections have not carried the prestige of being the expression of the majority will. The ruling classes have been anxious enough to obey the popular voice and to govern wisely, but the people can only gradually be trained into the habit of expressing their will clearly and indisputably at regular elections. The insignificant disturbances to public order which have occurred since 1862 have been indications of dissatisfaction with the imperfect detail working of the complicated system of ascertaining the public wishes, or hasty protests against mistakes on the part of those in power. Never have they endangered the federal constitution, nor diverted the steady course of the nation's progress in the art of self-government. End of section 10 Section 11 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1. Argentina. Chapter 9. The Modern Argentine. General Mitre's administration is memorable for the beginning of that tremendous industrial development which in 30 years made Argentina, in proportion to population, the greatest exporting country in the world. 
foreign capital and immigration were chief factors in the transformation that within a few decades changed an isolated and industrially backwards community into a nation possessing all the appliances and luxuries of the most advanced material civilization in eighteen sixty five circumstances forced mitre into the paraguayan war lopez the paraguayan dictator hated the buenos aires quite as much as he did the brazilians with whom he was constantly quarrelling and he was only awaiting a favourable opportunity to vent his dislike on either or both he counted on the coolness that naturally existed between urquiza and mitre to ensure him the former's aid in eighteen sixty four brazil intervened in the affairs of uruguay by assisting one of the parties in the civil war then raging lopez regarded the action of brazil as endangering the balance of power in the plate regions in retaliation he seized the brazilian province of mato grosso which lay along the paraguay north of his own territory mitre wished to remain neutral although he had no sympathy with the brutal despot and had an understanding about brazil's action in uruguay which safeguarded the interests of argentina lopez however insolently demanded free passage across argentine territory for the troops which he wished to send against brazil and uruguay mitre's refusal was followed by a paraguayan invasion and national honor required that this violation of territory be resented brazil and the flores faction in uruguay welcomed the alliance of argentina the paraguayan invasion was repulsed by their combined forces and the allies advanced up the parana against lopez in his own dominions it was natural that mitre should be commander-in-chief of the allied armies although brazil furnished the bulk of the troops and bore the brunt of the expense urquiza disappointed lopez in refusing to revolt against buenos aires and although he took no great personal interest in the war he cooperated in many ways with mitre the enormous expenditures of the brazilian government furnished a splendid cash market for argentine stock and produce and the resulting profits compensated for the pecuniary sacrifices involved in two years fighting both the argentine and the brazilian armies suffered tremendous losses on the field and in the cholera hospitals after the great repulse at curupaite in eighteen sixty seven the number of argentine troops was largely reduced when the brazilian fleet finally forced the passage of the river opening the way to asuncion mitre resigned the command into the hands of the brazilian general caixias and the last two years of the war were carried on principally by brazilian troops in the peace of eighteen seventy argentine's title to certain valuable territory was quieted and she gained an important commercial advantage by the opening of paraguay to her trade her commercial and industrial leadership in the plate valley has never since been endangered politically also the indirect results were gratifying the tremendous sacrifices in men and money had sickened the brazilian government and people of foreign complications thereafter the emperor pursued a policy of non-interference which has left to his spanish neighbors a free hand among themselves with the withdrawal of the brazilian troops from paraguay the balance of political power began slowly to pass from rio to buenos aires Saramiento, the quote, schoolmaster president, end quote, succeeded Mitre in 1868. His election is said to have been the freest and most peaceful ever held in the Republic, and to have represented as nearly as any the will of the electors. The development of population, wealth, and industry continued in increasing geometrical proportions during forty-five years before eighteen fifty seven the population had only a little more than doubled during the forty-five years since that date the increase has been four hundred and fifty per cent the yearly increment holds fairly steady at four per cent which is as large as that of any country in the world in eighteen sixty nine the city of buenos aires had one hundred and eighty thousand people and in nineteen o two it contained eight hundred and fifty thousand immigration had begun to pour in at the rate of twenty thousand per annum and had rapidly increased to over a hundred thousand when the great crisis of eighteen ninety temporarily interrupted the flow the years from eighteen sixty nine to eighteen seventy two were prosperous over much of the civilized world but nowhere more so than in argentina 
Saramiento's administration was, however, characterized by the beginning of that policy of governmental and commercial extravagance which has so deeply mortgaged the future of Argentina, and has repeatedly hampered the legitimate development of this marvellously fertile region. In the ten years prior to 1872, foreign commerce doubled, but the foreign debt increased fivefold. The last of the caudillos, López Jordán of Entre Ríos, revolted in 1870 against Urquiza, who was still governor of that province. The redoubtable old patriot was captured by the rebels and assassinated. In 1901, a monument was erected to his memory in the city of Paraná, his old capital, and the day of the unveiling was a national festival in all the republic. The federal government avenged his death and suppressed the insurrection after an obstinate, expensive and bloody little war. Sarmiento's administration was, however, not popular, and the news that he had virtually determined to name his successor created much dissatisfaction. Mitre headed the opposition in the city, while in the provinces some of the discontented went so far as to take up arms. Julio Roca, then a young colonel, defeated them at Santa Rosa, and Sarmiento was able to hand over the reins of government to Dr. Avellaneda without any further serious opposition. A commercial crisis was beginning when the new president took office in 1874. He initiated a policy of retrenchment under which the government managed to pay its obligations and weather the storm. General Roca was made minister of war and came into further prominence as the conqueror of the Indians who had hitherto prevented white men from settling on the vast and valuable southern pampas. In 1854, after the fall of Rosas, the Indians recovered most of the territory from which he had driven them twenty years before. Later, the frontier was advanced very slowly, but in 1877 Alcina, one of the most successful governors Buenos Aires ever had, undertook a vigorous campaign. In the following year, General Roca threw the power of the federal government into this vastly important enterprise. He carried the frontier south to the Rio Negro and west to the Andes, attacking the Indians in their fortresses, a policy which ensured permanent white domination. The ultimate consequences of opening up to civilized settlement the immense territories comprised in Roca's conquest cannot yet properly be estimated. The vast region of Patagonia, that was marked up on the maps in our boyhood as an unclaimed and uninhabitable Arctic waste, has since been added to Argentina as an indirect result of Roca's campaign of 1878. Buenos Aires put in a claim for the whole of the region conquered from the Indians, but the federal statesmen refused to allow one province to become well nigh as large as all the rest together. By a compromise, her area was increased to 63,000 square miles, while most of the new acquisition was divided into territories under the direct administration of the federal government. As the time for the presidential election of 1880 approached, political matters began to look ugly. It was evident that Avellaneda intended to choose his successor. Through the provincial governors, the police, the army, the employees on the public works, and the officials of all kinds, he had easy control of the election machinery. Even the most scrupulous president often cannot prevent the exercise of coercion in his name and without his knowledge. The opposition in South America usually refrain from voting. Indeed, it is considered almost indelicate for outsiders to interfere in a matter so strictly official as an election. The privilege of voting is not so highly prized and so jealously guarded as in the United States and the northern countries of Europe. Avellaneda and his adherents had fixed upon General Roca as the next president. The principal opposing candidate was Dr. Tejedor, governor of Buenos Aires, who was supported by Mitre's party and also by many of the other Buenos Aires party, the autonomists. The contest was really between Buenos Aires and the provinces. General Roca was strong with the army and with the country, but so tremendously had Buenos Aires grown that the result appeared doubtful. Her population, city and province had in 1880 reached 650,000, more than a quarter of the total in the whole confederation. 
The next three provinces put together did not equal her numbers, and lagged still farther behind in wealth and ability to concentrate their forces. Radical counsels prevailed in Buenos Aires. Roca's opponents, seeing that they were at a hopeless disadvantage with the election machinery in Avellaneda's hands, determined to use violence. In June 1880, the partisans of Tejedor rose against the federal government. The police and militia of the city joined them and paraded the streets, while the alarm flew to the country and the troops of the line began to concentrate outside the city. Presently, the president and his cabinet fled for safety to the federal camp. For a few weeks there was some skirmishing and much negotiating, and in one encounter near the south end of the city a thousand Buenos Aires were killed. Finally, the two sides came to an agreement by which the Roca party retained substantially all that they had been contending for. The general succeeded to the presidency without further opposition, and the city of Buenos Aires was detached from the province. The federalization of the great city was the last step in the process of adaptation that had been going on ever since the expulsion of the Spaniards. Political equilibrium between the provinces and Buenos Aires had been reached. Thenceforth, the latter's direct predominance was to be purely intellectual, commercial, and social. For the privilege of being capital of the republic, the city exchanged her provincial autonomy. Buenos Aires province, as formerly constituted, was the greatest menace to a peaceful federal union. In an assembly where the rights and influence of all the provinces were supposed to be equal, the magnitude of Buenos Aires was a constant occasion for the jealousy of her smaller sisters and for aggressions on her own part. Deprived of the city, the remainder of the province was not powerful enough to be dangerous. Now that it is federalized, the city itself proves to be the strongest tie binding together the different parts of the confederation. The greatest of all the waves of material prosperity reached its culmination during Roca's first administration. Business fairly boomed. Foreign commerce increased 75% from 1875 to 1885. The exports of hides, cattle, wool, and wheat swelled from year to year. The railroad mileage tripled in ten years. The revenues mounted 60% in five years. The use of the post office, that excellent measure of education, wealth, and higher national energies, tripled. All danger of disturbances serious enough to affect property rights had long since passed. The provincial governors worked harmoniously with the federal authorities. A part of Roca's system was to rest his power as chief executive on the cooperation of the governors, the members of congress also bore somewhat the same relation to the president as a rule a majority in congress supported his measures in spite of present prosperity dangers had been inherited from past administrations there were weak spots in the political and financial structure that had grown too rapidly to be altogether well built the people still lacked the heart and continued training in business that older nations have had and the national temperament tended towards a reckless optimism european money-lenders stood ready to stimulate this tendency by offering easy credit facilities in return for careless promises of exaggerated interest rates the medium of exchange was a vastly inflated and fluctuating paper currency from the beginning argentine rulers had resorted to note issues to tide over their pecuniary difficulties when rosas assumed power in eighteen twenty nine the paper dollar was worth fifteen cents and by eighteen forty six he had driven it down to four cents in eighteen sixty six mitra's administration had established a new arbitrary par at twenty five paper dollars per one gold dollar Sarmiento's extravagance made suspension necessary and sent gold to a premium. In 1883, President Roca remodeled the currency, issuing new notes convertible into gold and exchanging them for the old paper at the rate of 25 for 1. But his effort to contract and steady the circulating medium excited protests from a community that was growing rich in the rapid inflation of values foreign money was being loaned to all sorts of argentine enterprises on a scale that considering the small population of the country has never been precedented anywhere railroads ranches commercial houses banks land schemes building enterprises were capitalized for the asking 
the provincial governments borrowed money recklessly while interest was guaranteed on new railroads and charters granted to all sorts of speculative enterprises the nation undertook to supply itself in a single decade with the drainage works the docks the public buildings the parks the railroads that older countries have needed a generation to provide so much capital was being fixed that the attempt at specie resumption cramped the speculative world within two years it was given up and issues of paper money resumed general roca retired from office in eighteen eighty six and was succeeded by his brother-in-law juarez Thelman. the four years during which the latter remained in office are memorable for reckless private and public borrowing the healthy activity of general roca's administration gave place to a mad fever of speculation congress passed a national banking act and under its provisions banks of issue were established in nearly every province the paper circulation almost quadrupled and the premium on gold doubled the federal government followed the example set by the provinces and municipalities and burdened the country with an indebtedness which has mortgaged the future of the country for years to come between eighteen eighty five and eighteen ninety one the foreign debt was increased nearly threefold during eighteen eighty seven and eighteen eighty eight few apprehensions of the inevitable result of the inflation seem to have been entertained up to the very day of the crash of eighteen eighty nine the government cheerfully continued to borrow to plan magnificent public improvements and to build expensive railways the public speculated confidently in the mortgage scrip issued through the provincial mortgage banks early in eighteen eighty nine the government began to have difficulty in meeting some of the enormous obligations which it had undertaken conservative people became apprehensive the independent press raised a warning voice a ministerial crisis was followed by a panic in the exchange the new secretary of the treasury in an effort to prevent further depreciation of the currency diverted the redemption fund held by the government for bank issues the currency dropped with sickening rapidity the bubble companies collapsed the public realized that many of the banks were unable to meet their obligations at this crisis public alarm and indignation found a vent in the formation of a revolutionary society called the civic union which was pledged to overthrow president thelman on the twenty sixth of july eighteen ninety disturbances began and there was a little fighting in the streets police and troops however put no spirit into their efforts to suppress the rioters the president's best friends urged him to resign and congress passed a formal memorial to that effect there was nothing for him to do but to obey the manifest wish of the people he handed in his resignation and the vice-president dr carlos pellegrini peacefully succeeded him the situation went from bad to worse in eighteen ninety one the currency dropped to twenty-three cent on the dollar the banks failed and the laws for collection of debts were suspended for two months the most which dr pellegrini could hope to do was to hold things together until the general election should be held fifteen months later no human wisdom could devise measures that would give immediate prosperity and the public would be satisfied with nothing less dr pellegrini had to wait until later years for a proper appreciation of his labors the other two great national figures were general roca and general mitre the first had the prestige of his strong and successful administration he enjoyed the confidence of the army and was the head of the great nationalist party which was especially powerful in the provinces general mitre the most eminent citizen of buenos aires and in a way the living embodiment of the previous forty years of national history had inevitably been selected as chief of the civic union he had therefore led the movement through which the public opinion of the capital had overthrown selman mitre and roca had cooperated in securing a peaceful transfer of the government from selman to pellegrini roca was inclined to favour mitre for the presidency but it soon became evident that the latter could not control the more radical members of the civic union and that his candidacy would not reconcile all parties on the nineteenth of february eighteen ninety one an attempt to assassinate roca was perpetrated in the streets of buenos aires the spirit of mutiny grew alarmingly and a state of siege was proclaimed the civic union split into warring camps trouble broke out in cordoba and successful revolutions overthrew the legal state governments in catamarca and santiago del estero 
Mitre and Roca formally withdrew from active political life in the hope that this might placate the dissident politicians. The candidate fixed upon by the wing of nationalists who adhered to Roca and the moderates of the civic union led by Mitre was Dr. Luis Sáenz Peña, ex-justice of the Supreme Court. The Pellegrini government gave him its earnest support, and the charges were made by the radicals that their votes would be forcibly suppressed in the election of October 1891. They determined to anticipate violence with violence, but on the eve of the election in October 1891, their leaders were imprisoned and a state of siege declared. Saenz Peña was elected, but the radicals began to intrigue to obtain control of the provincial governments, which would enable them to force his resignation or his compliance with their wishes. Serious trouble broke out early in 1892 in the province of Corrientes, with which the Buenos Aires radicals openly sympathized. The new president quickly cut loose from the Roca wing of the Nationalist Party and allied himself closely with the moderate civic unionists, now usually called Mitristas. The president's own son, who had been a candidate against him, headed the faction of the Nationalist Party that had renounced Roca's leadership. Revolutionary movements against the governors who belonged to the Roca faction began in several provinces. In February, there were armed protests in Santa Fe against a new wheat tax. A revolt broke out in Catamarca in April. By July, the Science Peña administration was in the gravest difficulties. San Luis and Santa Fe rebelled, and in August, Salta and Tucuman followed. It was manifest that the president was not strong enough to hold down the selfish factions who saw in the general dissatisfaction and financial distress only an opportunity to get into office by force of arms. Congress remained neutral until it became evident that no accommodation could be reached between the president and his opponents, and that the latter would press on to overthrowing the government and probably precipitate a serious civil war. In this crisis, however, the majority agreed to laws which authorized armed federal intervention in the troubles in San Luis and Santa Fe. But in September, the national troops themselves showed symptoms of mutiny, and by this time most of the provinces were convulsed by revolutionary movements, which the central government was manifestly not strong enough to suppress or control. On the 25th of September, General Roca took command of the army. The most dangerous radical leaders in Buenos Aires were thrown into prison, and on the 1st of October he captured Rosario, the second city of the Republic, and the chief place in Santa Fe, which for months had been in the hands of revolutionists. This was a beginning of the end of the troubles that menaced public order. Six million dollars had been expended by the government in fruitless marchings to and fro of troops, but no serious harms had been done. The scene of the contest between the ambitious factions was transferred to Congress, the Cabinet, and the press. Throughout 1893 and 1894, the President struggled with his factional and financial difficulties, and gradually lost control of Congress and prestige in the country. Meanwhile, commercial liquidation was proceeding normally, and as always, painfully. The great provincial mortgage bank, through the agency of which a vast amount of the land scrip had been issued in the Selman days was granted a moratorium for five years. Other actual bankruptcies were legally admitted and enforced. The mortgage scrip, payable in gold, was replaced by currency obligations. The government had proved unequal to the task of balancing its own receipts and expenses. Taxes were increased until rebellion seemed imminent, but expenditures still outran them. The deficits mounted in spite of the efforts toward economy and returning prosperity of the business world. The boundary dispute with Chile had assumed a threatening aspect. War seemed imminent, and the military and naval estimates were largely increased. In January 1895, President Saenz Peña called an extra session of Congress to vote supplies for the expected war with Chile and to consider the financial proposals of the government. Congress demanded that political grievances should be redressed. The president had been persecuting the army officers who had been implicated in the revolutionary disturbances, and a vast majority of Congress insisted that a complete amnesty be granted to all political offenders. 
When the President refused, the Cabinet resigned in a body, and Congress and the opposition brought every pressure to bear. It was soon evident that Congress must win, and on the 22nd of January, 1895, the President resigned. The Vice President, Dr. Uriburu, succeeded for the unexpired period of three years, during which little progress was made toward a settlement of the nation's financial difficulties. Symptoms of renewed extravagance appeared. In 1897, the issuance of $10 million of mortgage scrip was authorized, and the city of Buenos Aires received permission to borrow $5 million. Work on the great docks of Buenos Aires, costing $35 million, was pushed to completion, and in February the paper dollars dropped back to 33 cents, while the deficit for the year was over $20 million. In January 1897, General Roca was nominated for the presidency by the Convention of the National Party, with Dr. Pellegrini in the chair. There was no real opposition to his election. Again and again, during a quarter of a century, he had proved himself able to cope with the most difficult situations which had arisen in Argentine affairs. In 1890, his firmness and adroitness had saved the country from the agony of a useless political upheaval after the failure of the Thelman administration. During the anxious months that followed the panic, his generosity had secured the cooperation of the moderates of Buenos Aires with his own immediate followers in holding back the radicals and revolutionists in check. During the critical year of 1892, the outbreaks against the Science Peña administration increased in violence until it seemed as if the country would be convulsed with a serious civil war. But when Roca stepped in, the tide of disorganization turned, and his firm hand re-established the authority of the federal government. His prestige and his personality enabled him to count upon an obedience from the chiefs of the provincial factions which was of inestimable value. He possessed those rare and indispensable qualities which make a man a centre around which other men can rally. He had built up the one really national party in the country and was faithful to his friends and his adherents, but sufficiently broad-minded to combine with other parties when the interests of the whole country demanded it. General Roca entered upon his second presidential term in the beginning of 1898. One of his first acts was to intervene in Buenos Aires province and put an end to a deadlock between the governor and the provincial assembly. The boundary dispute with Chile, a question which, in spite of the earnest desire of both governments for peace, might at any time precipitate a ruinous war, was submitted for settlement by arbitration. W. J. Buchanan, the United States Minister at Buenos Aires, named as arbitrator for the northern frontier, quickly announced a decision which was promptly accepted by both parties. The more complicated southern frontier could not so easily be prepared for submission. A serious misunderstanding arose, and both countries felt compelled to spend large sums for armaments which they knew they could ill afford. Happily, a decision was at last rendered in 1902. No question now remains open which is likely to involve the external peace of Argentina. Internal peace has not been menaced during General Roca's term. The commercial situation of the country has vastly improved. Immigration, which had largely ceased after 1890, has again risen to over a 100,000 a year. Wheat exports rose from 4 million bushels in 1897 to 61 million in 1900. The local exports in 1899 went 185 million dollars, twice as great per capita as the record exports of the United States. There have been no issue of paper money, and the value of the currency has risen to 40 cents. The government has established a new artificial par at a little more than this sum, and has begun accumulating a gold reserve. A resumption of specie payment is soon expected. Nevertheless, the chief difficulties and preoccupations of the Roca administration have been with financial questions. A deficit of $70 million had accumulated in the few years before 1898, and the interest on the immense public debt makes an equilibrium in the budget almost impossible. Many of the provincial governments have defaulted, and the national government has had to carry their burdens in addition to its own to satisfy clamorous foreign creditors. 
In 1901 it was proposed to unify the debt, refunding the whole at a lower rate of interest, and specifically pledging certain sources of public income. This plan had the approval of the government, but the national pride was touched by the latter feature. The populace could not bear the idea of giving a sort of mortgage to a country. The passage of the bill by Congress was met with so many demonstrations of popular disapproval that it was abandoned. This change of front was accompanied by the formation of an alliance between the followers of General Mitre and those of General Roca. The industrial impetus already acquired by the Argentine Republic is sufficient to carry it over all obstacles, and it seems assured that there will be a rapid settlement of the whole of this immense and fertile plain. Here nature has done everything to make communication easy, and a temperate climate ensures crops suited to modern European civilization. Two grave perils have so far been encountered, namely a tendency towards political disintegration and an abuse of the taxing power. The former is now remote, for since the railways began to concentrate wealth and influence at Buenos Aires, and to destroy the prestige and political power of the provincial capitals, the national structure built by the patriots of 1853 has stood firmer each year. The Argentine has had a bitter lesson of the evils of governmental extravagance, and still groans under the burden of a debt which seems disproportionately heavy, but the growth of population and wealth will soon overtake it, and the very difficulties of meeting interest are the cause of an economy in administration of which the good effects will be felt long after the debt itself has been reduced to a reasonable per capita a nation is in the process of formation in the plate valley whose material greatness is certain and whose moral and intellectual characteristics will have the widest influence on the rest of south america End of section eleven Section 12 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Nater. Part 2, Paraguay. Chapter 1, Paraguay until 1632. The beginnings of the settlement in Paraguay have been sketched in the introductory chapter on the discoveries and conquest. In 1526, Cabot, searching to find a route to the gold and silver mines of the center of the continent, penetrated as far as the site of the present city of Asuncion. He had already, in the exploration of the Upper Paraná, skirted the southern and eastern boundary of what has since become the country of Paraguay. Ten years later, the exhausted and discouraged remnants of Mendoza's great expedition sought rest and refuge among the peaceful agricultural tribes of this region. Under Domingos Irala, these six hundred surviving Spaniard adventurers founded Asuncion in 1536, the first settlement of the Valley of the Plate. They reduced the Indians to a mild slavery, compelling them to build houses, perform menial services, and cultivate the soil. The country was divided into great tracts called encomiendas, which, with the Indians that inhabited them, were distributed among the settlers. Few women have been able to follow Mendoza's expedition, so the Spaniards of Asuncion took wives from among the Indians. Subsequent immigration was small, and the proportion of Spanish blood has always been inconsiderable, compared with the number of aborigines. The children of the marriages between the Spanish conquerors and Indian women were proud of their white descent. The superior strain of blood easily dominated, and the mixed Paraguayan Creoles became Spaniards to all intents and purposes. Spaniards and Creoles, however, learned the Indian language. Guarani, rather than Spanish, became, and has remained, the most usual method of communication. The Spaniards of Asuncion were turbulent and disinclined to submit to authority. They paid scant respect to the Adelantados, whom the Castilian king sent out one after another as feudal proprietors. Until his death, Irala was the most influential man in the colony, but his power rested on his own energy and capacity, and on the fear and respect in which he was held by his companions, more than on the royal commission that finally could not be withheld from him. Across the river from Asuncion stretched away to the west the vast and swampy plains of the great Chaco, 
it was inhabited by wandering tribes of Indians whom the Spaniards could not subdue. They fled before the expeditions like scared wild beasts, only to turn and mercilessly massacre every man when a chance was offered for ambush or surprise. To the east of the Paraguay River, the country was dry, rolling, and extremely fertile. Though covered with magnificent forests, it was easily penetrable all the way across to the Paraná. Its inhabitants were the docile Guaranis, who knew something of agriculture, and in whose villages considerable stores of food were to be found. The population was dense for savages, but they had no political or military organization. Divided into small tribes, which did not cooperate, they rendered little respect or obedience to their chiefs. Under these conditions, Spanish authority rapidly spread over central and southern Paraguay. Before Irala died in 1557, the settlers had reached the Paraná on the western boundary and founded settlements nearly as far north as the Grand Cataract. Shortly afterwards, the Creoles of Asuncion began their expeditions to the south. By 1580, they controlled the Paraná River from its confluence with the Paraguay to the ocean, had established Santa Fe and Buenos Aires on its right bank, and opened up the southern Pampa. The pastoral provinces on the lower Paraná were slowly peopled. A large proportion of the energetic Paraguayan Creoles preferred the semi-nomadic life of the plains to indolence among their Indian slaves in the tropical forests of Paraguay. The two regions were distinct in climate, habits of life, social and industrial organization. They became separated in interests and soon were to be divided politically though until 1619 the whole province continued to bear the name of Paraguay, the usual residence of the governor was Buenos Aires. Asuncion was often forced to be content with a lieutenant governor, and was fast relegated to the position of a neglected and isolated district. In the days of the Spanish conquest, Franciscan monks were the priests who most often accompanied the expeditions, and they took the most prominent part in the earliest establishment of religion. The members of this order, however, with a few notable exceptions, took no special interest in the evangelization of the aborigines. On the contrary, they were as fierce as the soldiers themselves in their cruelties to the poor Indians. The shouts of a Franciscan monk set on Pizarro's ruffians to the slaughter of the Incas that surrounded Atahualpa. Those that came to Paraguay preferred to live in the towns, and their conduct towards the Indians differed little from that of the lay Spaniards. It was the genius of Ignatius Loyola that conceived and perfected a machine able to carry Christianity and civilization to these remote and inaccessible peoples and regions. Within a few years after its foundation, the Society of Jesus turned its attention to the evangelization of South America. In 1550, the Jesuit fathers began their work in Brazil. Their successes and failures in that country had little relation with their work in Spanish South America. It is curious, however, that their most successful early work in Brazil should have been done in Sao Paulo, on the extreme eastern border of the wide plateau which drains to the west into the Paraná. For a decade or two after 1550, they labored hard to gather the Indians of that region into villages, to teach them Christianity, and protect them against the tyrannies and exactions of the Portuguese settlers. The contest was unequal. The Jesuits were not long able to prevent the enslavement of their proselytes. The Paulistas destroyed the Jesuit missions in their neighborhood, and became the most expert in Indian warfare and the most terrible foes of the Jesuit system of all the colonists of South America. Their determined opposition was the most potent cause in preventing the subjection of South America to a theocratic system of government. About 1586, the Jesuit fathers entered Paraguay for the purpose of beginning the evangelization of the Indians of the Plate Valley. They established a school in Asuncion and pushed out on foot into the remoter districts. Their success was phenomenal. They spared no pains to learn the language of the savages so that they might teach them in their own tongue. They approached them with kindness and benevolence, showing in every gesture. They availed themselves of the Indians' love of bright colors and showy processions. They went unarmed and alone, offering useful and attractive presents, conforming to savage customs and prejudices, and imposing on the vivid savage imagination with the pomp of Catholic worship. 
They taught their savage pupils how to cultivate the ground to gain greater results, how to save themselves unnecessary labour, and how to live comfortably. They persuaded them to gather into towns, where they built comfortable houses and tight warehouses, while the men cultivated the soil and the women spun and wove cotton. The Jesuits came almost immediately into conflict with the interests of the Spanish colonists. They were welcomed at first because they were expected to lend themselves to the enslavement of the Indians. When their real purpose was discovered, feeling against them rose high. The Creoles clearly saw that it was going to be far more difficult to extend their power over the Indians gathered together in villages under Jesuit protection than over unorganized and friendless bands of unconverted savages. Before 1610, the number of Jesuits that had come to Paraguay was very small. Among the first was the father named Thomas Fields, a Scotchman. As a matter of fact, the Jesuits were recruited from all the nations of Europe, and under their military system had to go wherever they might be sent. English, Irish, and German names, as well as Spanish, are to be found in the lists of Jesuits who labored in Paraguay. In 1608, Philip III of Spain attended to the complaints that came to him through the powerful chiefs of the order of the indifference and opposition shown by the settlers and colonial authorities, and gave his royal and official sanction to the Jesuit conversion of the Indians along the upper Paraná. By this time the fathers had penetrated across to the Paraná and had followed up that stream far north of the Grand Cataract in latitude 24 degrees, which marks the southern boundary of Paraguay proper. It is hard to understand how they overcame the difficulties of travelling. To this day it is well-nigh impossible to reach the Grand Cataract, and years pass without that wonder of nature's being seen by the eyes of civilized men. No part of the world, outside the Arctic regions, is less accessible than the Paraná above the Grand Cataract. Yet these heroic priests made that region the principal theatre of their operations in the early years of the 17th century. The territory is now all Brazilian. The boundaries of that republic extended on to the next bank of the Paraná, south nearly to the 26th degree, and on the west bank to the 24th. The rivers Paranapanema and Ivahi are great tributaries coming down from the east between the 22nd and 23rd degrees, and draining a vast extent of the plateau that extends to the Brazilian coast mountains between Curitiba and Sao Paulo and on their banks the Jesuits established their principal missions. In those days there were no clearly defined boundaries between the Portuguese and Spanish dominions. From 1580 to 1640 the King of Spain was also the monarch of Portugal. The Jesuits held his royal letters patent for the conversion of the Indians of the province of Guayra, the name which this remote region bore they had no reason to anticipate that they would be accused of being invaders of portuguese territory or that they would be interfered with by any portuguese subjects of the spanish crown the nearest portuguese settlement was at sao paulo from which guayra could be reached only by the long and tedious descent of the tieta river to its confluence with the paraná and thence down that river to the ivahi months would be necessary to make such a journey great difficulties encountered with waterfalls and rapids and great privations from want of food in the vast uninhabited regions on the route the first jesuits to arrive after the granting of formal authorization by the spanish king were two italians they left asuncion october the tenth sixteen ten and it took them five months of incessant travelling to reach the paranapanema the work already done there by earlier fathers had borne some fruit the indians were prepared for the coming of the new missionaries and readily gathered into the towns which they founded in rapid succession for the first few years all went well and within a very short time they claimed to have at least forty thousand souls under their guidance in sixteen fourteen there were one hundred and nineteen jesuits in paraguay and guayra and the work of evangelizing and reducing to obedience the whole guarani population of the parana valley went on apace for twenty years these guayra missions spread and prospered while to the east and south the jesuits acquired more and more influence with the indians in paraguay proper and more and more hemmed in the creoles of asuncion in sixteen twenty nine a thunderbolt burst upon guayra out of a clear sky 
the Portuguese from Sao Paulo appeared before the mission of San Antonio and destroyed it utterly, burning the church and houses and driving off the Indians as slaves. Other missions shortly suffered the same fate, and within the short space of three years the towns had been sacked, most of the inhabitants of the region carried off or killed, and the remnants had fled down the river under the leadership of the fathers. The Paulistas were animated by motives, some good, some bad. Primarily they wished to capture slaves. They hated the Jesuits and had themselves suffered from the latter's system of segregating the aborigines. Only a few decades before, their fathers had destroyed the Jesuit missions near Sao Paulo, and they were determined not to permit themselves to be hemmed in and crowded out by Indians ruled and protected by Jesuits. They believed in the doctrine of, quote, Brazil for the white Brazilians, end quote, and they regarded the Jesuits and their neophytes as natural enemies and fair prey. The sentiment of nationality also animated them. As descendants of Portuguese, they hated the Spaniards and their rule. Their allegiance to the Spanish dynasty that had usurped the crown of Portugal sat lightly. The Jesuits came by way of Asuncion, their communications were with the Spanish authorities, and most of them were Spaniards. The Paulistas, as Portuguese, viewed with alarm a rapid spread of Spanish ecclesiastics up the Parana Valley, which threatened soon to reach their own neighborhood. Avarice, love of adventure, race pride, patriotism, hatred of priestly domination, all cooperated to push them on to undertaking these memorable expeditions. The great extension of the Jesuits over the northern and eastern regions of the Parana Valley occurred during the period when Hernandarias was the dominant figure of the plate. Creole though he was, this remarkable man was a friend to the Indian and to the missionary work of the Jesuits. His aid and encouragement in 1609 were essential to the latter's success, for he might easily have nullified the effect of the royal permission to evangelize Guayra a formal document that would have been of little value against the delays and excuses of an unwilling governor aided by the jealous people. After his first term as governor of Buenos Aires, the Spanish government determined to put a stop to the more flagrant of the abuses practiced against the savages and created the office of protector of the Indians. Hernandarias was named to fill it, and carried out his instructions in a moderate spirit. He understood the country and the situation of the colony well, and did not undertake to abolish Indian slavery. In that tropical climate, the whites will not labor in the fields so long as there are Indians who can be forced to work, and the Spaniards still regarded the Indian as little better than an animal. On the other hand, Hernandarias was too intelligent not to see that there must be restraints on the cruelties and exactions of the creoles if the indians of paraguay were to be saved from the extermination that had been the fate of the haitians a century before the outcome was that though a new code of laws was promulgated by the impracticable spanish king which forbade any further enslavement of the aborigines its provisions were largely disregarded at the same time, however, the Indians acquired a legal status, and their condition was gradually improved, until it became not much worse than that of the contemporaneous European peasantry. The Jesuits were guaranteed against interference and allowed to go out into the remoter wilderness and give to the yet unslaved inhabitants the invaluable protection of membership in their missions. In 1619, the natural and commercial division between Paraguay proper and the rest of the province was officially recognized. The region between the Paraguay and the Paraná rivers was made a separate province, directly dependent upon the Viceroy at Lima and the Audiencia at Charcas in Bolivia. It included officially the Jesuit missions, southeast of the Paraná, as well as the present territory of Paraguay. When the Paulistas began their terrible attacks on the Guayra missions in 1629, the governor of Paraguay refused to send any assistance to the Jesuits. The latter charged him with a corrupt understanding with the invaders, by which he was to share in the profits of the slaves sold. The order had agreed with the Spanish government not to put any arms into the hands of the Indians, so the latter were defenseless against the Paulistas, who attacked musket in hand. 
the Creoles and Spaniards in Asuncion resented more and more the presence and power of the Jesuits, and viewed with ill-concealed satisfaction the misfortunes that now overwhelmed the priests. The governor, in declining to send help, was only carrying out the wishes of the people around him. Had the number of whites in Paraguay not been so very small, the Jesuits might have been expelled as they were in Sao Paulo. End of section 12section thirteen of the south american republics volume one by thomas cleland dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by piotr natter part two paraguay chapter two the jesuit republic and colonial paraguay we have no accounts of the jesuit missions in guayra or of the tragedy of their destruction except those that were written by the fathers themselves these are filled with manifest exaggerations and marred by omissions which we have few means of correcting. Nevertheless, the bold outlines of a story that, for bravery, pathos, and devotion, rivals any ever told, are clear and indisputable. Within such a short period as twenty years, the Jesuits had not succeeded in training the Guayra Indians to any very high degree of civilization. They complained that the Indians were still prone to return to their worship of their devils, Nevertheless, the massive walls of churches, which have survived the devastation wrought by three centuries of tropical rains, bear witness that the Jesuits had gathered together a multitude of people and had taught them a measure of skilled labor. Of the completeness of the victory of the Paulistas there is no doubt. Within three years, tens of thousands of Indians were carried off to Sao Paulo, and hardly a town was left standing in the province of Guayra. Father Montoya, chief Jesuit, has left an account of the hegira which he led down the river though he is silent as to the part he took himself it is hard to read his pages and not give him a place among the world's great heroes twelve thousand indians of every sex and age assembled on the paranapanema with the few belongings which they had been able to bring from the homes that they were forced to abandon the paulistas were daily expected to return and the only hope of escape was to float down the river and get beyond the grand cataract of the Paraná. The journey to the beginning of the falls was made without any great losses. There the difficulties began. Ninety miles of falls and rapids intervene between navigable waters above and below the grand cataract. Across the river valley extends a mountain chain with slopes rugged and covered with dense vegetation. The river divides into various channels, and the sides of the gorges are clothed in cane breaks and tangled forests through which a path had to be cut with machetes. These poor Jesuits and their thousands of scared, patient Indians had no boats awaiting them at the foot of the hills, so they had to continue their dreary passage through the gorges and cane breaks, where wild Indians lay in ambush with poisoned arrows, until at last a place was reached where canoes could be built. Still they struggled on, the indomitable Jesuits taking every precaution though out of immediate danger from the paulistas when they had passed the cataract the spaniards on the right bank below were hardly less to be feared they were waiting on the shore of the paraná for news of the fugitives in order to pounce on them and make a rich haul of slaves the provisions were exhausted but the jesuits dared not apply for help to the creoles fever broke out and sick and starving the devoted jesuits and their uncomplaining followers worked away on their boats and rafts at last they got them ready, and, slipping past the Spanish settlements in the night, they finally reached some small Jesuit missions near the mouth of the Iguazu, five hundred miles from their starting point. The Jesuits resolved to evacuate Guayra completely, and to build up their power anew in the country between the Paraná and the Uruguay. Within the next few years they had occupied the country that is now the Argentine territory of the missions. This tract lay directly across the Paraná, from that part of Paraguay proper, in which the Jesuits were most powerful, to the other side of the Uruguay, where was a fertile territory, which proved an excellent field for the extension of the settlement. Before many years, these missions stretched in a broad band from the center of Paraguay, 300 miles to the southeast. They dominated southern Paraguay and half the present Brazilian state of Rio Grande do Sul, with the country that lies between while their towns lined both banks of the upper Uruguay and the middle Paraná, cutting off the Creoles from extending their settlements up either of these great rivers. 
Now that the priests had concentrated their forces so near, the alarm of the Creoles became acute. The Jesuits managed to obtain the dismissal of the governor who had refused to send them aid when they were attacked by the Paulistas and were driven from the Guayra. But his successor also became a partisan of the Creoles as soon as he reached Asuncion. He visited the missions near the river Paraná and ordered that they be secularized on the ground that these regions had already been subjected by Spanish arms before its occupation by the priests. But the Jesuits were good lawyers and had powerful friends at every court, so the governor was forced to reverse his action. The next governor helped to make the Jesuits secure from Paulista's interference below the Grand Cataract by defeating an important expedition which had reached the new missions. The Paulistas did not confine their aggressions to the missions, but alarmed the Spanish Creoles themselves by penetrating west of the Paraná into Paraguay proper. Even Asuncion did not feel safe for a time. The Jesuits had now begun to arm and drill the Indians. Though the Paulistas made expeditions from time to time, and the Spanish and Jesuit frontier settlements were frequently aroused by the news of a bloody raid and of the rapid depredations of a band of these dreaded marauders, there was never again such a wholesale destruction as had taken place in Guayra. The frontiers of the Spanish and Portuguese peoples on the Paraná remain to this day substantially as they were fixed by the Paulista expedition of 1630 to 1640. In their conflict with the Jesuits, the Creoles shortly received a valuable reinforcement in Bishop Cardenas, a very able and energetic prelate, and a man gifted as a ruler and statesman. Born in the city of Charcas, on the Bolivian plateau, he was a Creole of the Creoles. He became a great missionary and evangelist throughout Upper Peru of Tucuman, acquiring wonderful fame and popularity by his eloquence. In spite of the fact that he was a Creole, he was immensely popular among the Indians, and seems to have been a natural leader of both branches of the native population. He bitterly hated the Jesuits. As a member of the rival Franciscan order, his professional jealousy was aroused by their success, and his Creole prejudices were outraged by their efforts to prevent the extension of white power amongst the aborigines. By sheer force of ability and eloquence, he rose into great prominence in southern Spanish America, and was rewarded for his successful labors in Tucuman by being appointed Bishop of Paraguay. There the Creoles accepted him as their leader, and he soon became the dominant figure in the community. He quarrelled repeatedly with the governor, but such was his force of character, and the skill with which he took advantage of the superstitious reverence for his apostolic office, that he invariably achieved his ends. Once the governor, at the head of a file of soldiers, presented himself at the bishop's door to arrest a fugitive whom the bishop had undertaken to protect. When the door was opened, there stood the dauntless priest in full canonicals, defying the governor to cross his threshold. He excommunicated the governor and every soldier who had dared take part in this affront to his dignity, and, like Hildebrand, he was only appeased when the governor had begged for pardon on his knees. When the governor died, Bishop Cardenas succeeded at interim. His popularity and prestige were unbounded, and his audacity and courage unprecedented. Uniting in himself the religious, civil, and popular power, he controlled the forces of the community more completely than anyone who had preceded him. His great work was the humiliation and destruction of the Jesuits. He hampered their insidious spread on the hither side of the Paraná, and attempted the secularization of many of their missions. In 1649, he took the audacious step of issuing a decree expelling all the members of the Society of Jesus, and he actually drove the fathers from their churches and schools in Asuncion itself. The Jesuits appealed to the viceroy, and the governor was sent out to depose him. Twenty years had now elapsed since the Jesuits had armed the mission Indians and organized them into an efficient militia. An army was, therefore, ready to the new governor's hand. The Creoles of western Paraguay were riotous and tumultuous, but in that tropical climate they had lost much of the military capacity of their Spanish ancestors. The number of people of Spanish descent was small, and while the secular Indians made admirable soldiers when disciplined and well led, they had never been organized by the Creoles for serious warfare. The military system of the Jesuits immediately proved its superiority. Aided by the prestige of his viceregal commission, 
The new governor, at the head of the Jesuit army, quickly overcame the hastily gathered levies of the bishop. For the next 120 years the Jesuits maintained their system in southeastern Paraguay and the regions on both banks of the Paraná and the upper Uruguay. Until 1728 their territory was nominally under the jurisdiction of the governor of Asunción. Really, however, it was an independent republic ruled by a superior whose capital was at Candelaria and who was actually responsible to no one except his general at Rome and the authorities at Madrid. In the secular part of Paraguay, the formerly turbulent and secular creoles sank more and more into the indifference characteristic of the Indians who surrounded them. Early in the 18th century, a governor named Antequera, whom the viceregal authorities attempted to depose, was forcibly maintained for a time by the Paraguayan creoles, probably the earliest instance of an important movement towards independence which occurred in South America. The Paraguayans only yielded when a compromise was offered. The old ferocity which the original conquerors had felt against the Indians gave place gradually to kindlier sentiments. From slaves the Indians rose into serfs, and then into peasants, living on good terms with the proprietors of their lands, and not more oppressed by Spanish officials than the whites themselves. Secular Paraguay, shut in on the west by the impenetrable Chaco with its hordes of dreaded wild Indians, and on the east by the Jesuit territory, could not expand. Indeed, the impulse towards conquest and exploration which so distinguished the Paraguayan Creoles in the latter part of the 16th century had completely died out as early as the middle of the 17th century. In 1728, the Jesuit Republic was formally detached from the jurisdiction of Paraguay and placed under that of the government of Buenos Aires. The missions were all situated on or near the banks of the Upper Paraná and Uruguay, and their line of communication with the outside world ran directly to Buenos Aires. They had few commercial relations with Asuncion, and it was inconvenient to maintain even a shadow of political relation with that capital. The Jesuit missions prospered, although, curiously enough, their population remained stationary. South and east of the Paraná, which they occupied, was mostly an open, rolling plain, admirably suited for pasturage. Herding cattle was the chief employment of the Indians and the chief source of the exports. However, in the forests northwest of the Paraná, agriculture was more practiced, and the principal exports thence were the mate tea and timber. In the pastoral country, the Jesuits did not expand further. They had already gathered most of the Indians who inhabited that region into their missions, and the natural increase of population did not justify any new settlements. But in the wooded country across the Paraná, a few tribes of Guaranis had hitherto escaped subjection to either Creoles or Jesuits, and farther to the west, in the great Chaco, there were many tribes of savage and intractable Indians. In both these directions, the Jesuits kept up their missionary efforts. In Paraguay, they were successful and converted many tribes of the northern part of that country, but in the Chaco, they could make little progress. In 1769, the King of Spain issued his famous decree banishing the Jesuits from all his dominions. It was feared that in the center of their power on the Upper Paraná they might offer resistance. They commanded a population of more than 200,000 Indians, fairly well armed and disciplined, and absolutely devoted to them. Nevertheless, they submitted quietly. Spanish officials replaced the Jesuits in control of the civil and commercial interests of the mission towns, and priests of other orders were sent up to continue spiritual instruction. The Spanish officials were, however, not successful in holding the Indians together. Their exactions and cruelties drove the Indians to despair, and within a very few years emigration began. The seven missions to the east of the Uruguay had been traded by Spain to Portugal in 1750, and most of their inhabitants had been killed or driven across the Uruguay. The most populous missions lay between the Uruguay and the Paraná, in the territory that today forms the upper part of Corrientes and the missions territory. A large proportion of their inhabitants fled down the Uruguay into Entre Rios and Uruguay proper. Those on the west side of the Paraná largely remained or removed only far enough to coalesce with the secular Indians of Paraguay. 
Some of the outlying and more remote missions were abandoned altogether, and Paraguay then assumed its present extent. The population was fairly homogeneous, and its vast majority was composed of descendants of the aborigines, with comparatively few Spaniards and Creoles of mixed blood forming the upper strata of society. The country felt few of the quickening and disturbing influences which were already animating the regions at the mouth of the river towards the end of the 18th century. Little effort was necessary to get a subsistence from the teeming soil, and content with their luscious oranges, their mate, and their unlimited tobacco, the Paraguayans led an idyllic existence. They had little sympathy with the turbulent, active-minded population which was crowding into Buenos Aires and making it a commercial, political, and intellectual focus. Agricultural in their habits, they disliked the hard-riding gauchos of the southern plains hardly less than the turbulent Indians of the Chaco. In the movements that preceded the revolution of 1810, they took no part. End of section 13 Section 14 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Natter. Part 2, Paraguay, Chapter 3, Francia's Reign. On the 25th of May, 1810, a revolutionary movement in Buenos Aires overthrew the Spanish Viceroy. Its leaders were young Creole liberals, natives of Buenos Aires, and a junta was formed from their number which undertook the supreme direction of affairs. Prompt measures were taken to overthrow the Spanish provincial authorities and to secure the cooperation and obedience of all the subdivisions of the Viceroyalty. Manuel Belgrano, one of the enthusiastic leaders of the movement, was sent up the river to take possession of Entre Rios and Corrientes for the junta and to attack the Spanish governor of Paraguay. He was accompanied by only a few hundred troops, but he counted on the sympathy and help of the people among whom he was going. In Entre Rios and Corrientes, which were mere administrative divisions of the province of Buenos Aires, he encountered no difficulty. The gauchos, who formed almost the whole population, hated outside control and cared little who claimed to be supreme at Buenos Aires. Belgrano marched through the center of these districts and reached the Paraná at the old Jesuit capital of Candelaria. Once across the river he found a different atmosphere. The home-loving Indian population regarded Belgrano's band as invaders and responded promptly to the call of the Spanish governor, old Velasco, to take up arms and repel the aggression. The Paraguayans hated the Buenos Aires with an intensity born of ignorance and isolation, and a considerable force of militia assembled for the defense of Asuncion. Among its most popular leaders was a native Paraguayan named Yegros. Belgrano was not opposed until he approached within sixty miles of Asuncion, but on the 19th of January 1811 the Paraguayans turned and crushed his little army. He retreated to the south, and on the 9th of March was captured with his whole force. This repulse ended, once and for all, the hope cherished by the Buenos Aires liberals of persuading or compelling the submission of Paraguay. The battle of the 19th of January and the hostile attitude of the whole Paraguayan people definitely assures Paraguay's independence from Buenos Aires. It soon became evident that independence from Spain had been secured as well. In contact with their Argentine prisoners, the more intelligent Paraguayan leaders were quickly convinced of the advantages which home rule would bring to Paraguay, and that they themselves ought to control the government until affairs in Spain should be settled. The governor had no Spanish troops, nor any hope of receiving help, either from the distracted mother country or from the governors of other parts of South America. Each of them had enough to do in taking care of themselves. Velasco's secretary was an educated Buenos Airean, a liberal and an autonomist. He plotted the overthrow of his chief in connection with a Paraguayan officer who was popular with the troops in Asuncion. Two months after Belgrano's surrender, a bloodless revolution occurred. The governor offered no resistance. He simply stepped to one side and became a private citizen, while the patriots took possession of the barracks and began casting about blindly for a solid basis for a new government. After a good deal of confusion, the prominent citizens of the province were called in a sort of rude constituent congress, and a junta was formed. 
General Yegros and Dr. Francia were the two most prominent and popular men in the country, and they were naturally and inevitably selected as chief members. Yegros had been the principal leader of the militia, and Francia was considered the most learned and able man in the community. He was a lawyer who has become a sort of demigod to the lower classes by his fearless advocacy of their rights, and inspired almost superstitious reverence by his reputation for learning and disinterestedness. He was selected as secretary, while Yegros, an ignorant soldier, became president of the junta. Francia's abilities and courage immediately made him the dominant figure. Jealousies arose, and he stepped out for a while, but the weaker men who succeeded him could not control the situation. Two years later, a popular assembly met, which was ready to submit to his advice in everything. The junta was dismissed, and he and Yegros were invested with supreme power under the title of consuls. A year later, he forced Yegros out, and with general consent, assumed the position of sole executive, and in 1816 he was formally declared supreme and perpetual dictator. For the next twenty-five years he was the government of Paraguay. History does not record another instance in which a single man so dominated and controlled a people. A solitary, mysterious figure, of whose thoughts, purposes, and real character little is known, the worst acts of his life were the most picturesque, and alone have been recorded. Although the great Carlyle includes him among the heroes whose memory mankind should worship, the opinion of his detractors is likely to triumph. Francia will go down to history as a bloody-minded, implacable despot, whose influence and purposes were wholly evil. After reading all that has been written about this singular character, my mind inclines more to the judgment of Carlyle. I feel that the vivid imagination of the great Scotchman has pierced the clouds which enshrouded the spirit of a great and lonely man, and has seen the soul of Francia as he was. Cruel, suspicious, ruthless, and heartless as he undeniably became, his acts will not bear the interpretation that his purposes were selfish, or that he was animated by mere vulgar ambition. The population over which he ruled had for centuries been trained to obedience by the Jesuits and the Creole landowners. The Creoles were few, and the Spaniards still fewer. Francia based his power upon the Indian population, and not on the little aristocracy whose members boasted of white blood. Convinced that the Indians were not fit for self-government, he also believed that it would be disastrous to permit the white oligarchy to rule. He proposed to save Paraguay from the civil disturbances that distracted the rest of South America. He therefore absorbed all power in his own hands and ruthlessly repressed any indications of insubordination among those of Spanish blood. The Indians blindly obeyed him, and he relentlessly pursued the Creoles and the priests, seeming to regard them only as dangerous firebrands who might at any time start up a conflagration in the peaceful body politic and not as citizens entitled to the protection of the state. He absorbed in his own person all the functions of government, he had no confidence and no assistance, he allowed no Paraguayan to approach him on terms of equality, when he died a careful search failed to reveal any records of the immense amount of government business which he had transacted during thirty years. The orders for executions were simple messages, signed by him and returned, to be destroyed as soon as they had been carried out. The longer he lived, the more completely did he apply his system of absolutism, and the more confident he became that he alone could govern his people for his people's good. He adopted a policy of commercial isolation, and intercourse with the outside world was absolutely forbidden. Foreigners were not permitted to enter the country without a special permit, and once there were rarely allowed to leave. He neither sent nor received consuls nor ministers to foreign nations. Foreign vessels were excluded from the Paraguay River and allowed to visit only one port in the southeastern corner of the country. He was the sole foreign merchant. The communistic system inherited from the Jesuits was developed and extended to the secular parts of the country. The government owned two-thirds of the land and conducted great farms and ranches in various parts of the territory. If labor was needed in gathering crops, Francia had recourse to forced enlistment. Those Indian missions which remained free he brought gradually under his own control, 
and followed the old Jesuit policy of compelling the wild Indians to work like other citizens. Dreading interference by Spain, Brazil, or Buenos Aires, he improved the military forces and began the organization of the whole population into a militia. His policy, however, was peaceful, and the difficulty of getting arms up the river past the forces of the Argentine warring factions prevented his organizing an army fit for offensive operations, even if he had desired to head one. As he grew older, he became more solitary and ferocious. Always a gloomy and peculiar man, absorbed in his studies and making no account of the ordinary pleasures and interests of mankind, he had reached the age of fifty-five and assumed supreme power, without marrying. His public labors still further cut him off from thoughts of family and friends, and although it has become asserted that he married a young Frenchwoman when he was past seventy, nothing is known about her. It is certain that he left no children, and died attended only by servants. His severities against the educated classes increased. He suffered from frequent fits of hypochondria, he ordered wholesale executions, and seven hundred political prisoners filled the jails when he died. His moroseness increased year by year. He feared assassination, and occupied several houses, letting no one know where he was going to sleep from one night to another, and when walking the streets kept his guards at a distance before and behind him. Woe to the enemy or suspect who attracted his attention. Such was the terror inspired by this dreadful old man that the news that he was out would clear the streets. A white Paraguayan literally dared not utter his name. During his lifetime he was, quote, El Supremo, end quote, and after he was dead for generations he was referred to simply as, quote, El Defunto, end quote, for years, when men spoke of him, they looked behind them and crossed themselves, as if dreading that the mighty old man could send devils to spy upon them. At least this is the story of Francia's enemies, who have made it their business to hand his name down to execration. The real reason may have been that Francia's successors regarded defamation of El Defunto as an indication of unfriendliness to themselves. Devil or saint, hypochondriac or hero, actuated by morbid vanity or by the purest altruism, there is no difficulty in estimating the results of Francia's work and the extent of his abilities. That he had a will of iron and a capacity beyond the ordinary is proven by his life before he became dictator, as well as his successes afterwards. All authorities agree that he had acquired as a lawyer a remarkable ascendancy over the common people by his fearlessness in maintaining their causes before the courts and corrupt officials. He did not rise by any sycophant arts. Indeed, he never veiled the contempt he felt for the party schemers and officials around him. When he had supreme power in his hands, he used it for no selfish indulgences. His life was austere and abstemious parsimonious for himself he was lavish for the public he would accept no present and either returned those sent him or sent back their value in money though he had been educated for the priesthood and had never been out of south america he had absorbed liberal religious principles from his reading nothing could have been more likely to offend the catholic indians upon whose good will his power rested than his refusal to attend mass but he was honest enough with himself and with them not to simulate a sentiment which he did not feel in his manners and life he was absolutely modest he received any who chose to see him if he was terrible it was to the wealthy and the powerful the humblest indian received a hearing and justice during his reign paraguay remained undisturbed wrapped in a profound peace the population rapidly increased and though commerce and manufactures did not flourish, nor the new ideas which were transforming the face of the civilized world penetrate within his barriers, food and clothing were plenty and cheap, and the Paraguayans prospered in their own humble fashion. Though they might not sell their delicious maté, there was no limitation on its domestic use, and although money was not plentiful, and foreign goods were a rarity, a fat steer could be bought for a dollar, and want was unknown. The old man lived until 1840, in the full possession of unquestioned supreme power, dying at the age of 83 years. His final illness lasted only a few days, and he went on attending to business to the very end. 
When asked to appoint a successor he refused, bitterly saying that there would be no lack of heirs. His legitimate and natural successor could only be that man who could raise himself through the mass by his force of character, and prove himself capable of dominating the disorganizing elements of Creole society. End of section 14「Section 15 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Nater. Part 2. Paraguay. Chapter 4. The Reign of the Elder Lopez. Once the breath was out of the old man's body, his secretary attempted to seize the government. He concealed Francia's death for several hours, and issued orders in the dead man's name. But as soon as the news came out, the army officers, whose assistance was essential, refused to obey him. The poor secretary escaped a worse fate by hanging himself in prison, and the troops amused themselves setting up and pulling down would-be dictators. After several months of anarchy, it was determined to assemble a congress in imitation of the first congress which had named Francia consul. A real representative government was, of course, impossible in paraguay but the creoles who naturally formed the bulk of the congress were desirous of insuring themselves against another dictatorship they wanted a government where the offices would be passed round however an executive was necessary and the only executive they knew was an irresponsible one the title borne by yegros and francia in the early days seemed a good one and so it was agreed that two consuls should be elected for a limited period, during which, however, they were to exercise very limited power. Among the ambitious and turbulent deputies, a directing spirit arose in the person of Carlos Antonio López, a well-to-do rancher who had received a lawyer's education and had been careful to keep out of public view during Francia's reign. At this juncture he inevitably came to the front, because he was the most learned and far-sighted among his fellow creoles he was a man of great natural ability and shrewdness highly intelligent well-read agreeable and affable in his manners selected as one of the two consuls by the congress of eighteen forty one he soon pushed his colleague to one side and became dominant in eighteen forty four an obsequious congress which had been summoned by him and whose members he virtually named conferred upon him the title of president for the nominal term of ten years which really was intended to be for life it is however significant of the milder character of lopez and the increased power of the office-holding class that he preferred the more republican title of the president held for a nominally limited period to the semi-monarchical one of el supremo borne by his terrible predecessor as a matter of fact lopez succeeded to all the absolute power and prerogatives of Francia. The new ruler was no such determined doctrinaire as Francia. He was rather a clever opportunist than a gloomy idealist. He adopted many liberal measures, such as the law providing that all Negroes thereafter born should be free, and he even attempted to frame a regular constitution. He abandoned the policy of isolation, so dear to Francia, and opened the country in 1845. He loved appreciation and especially wished the approbation of foreigners. Though cautious and reluctant to engage in outside complications, he was by nature and taste a diplomat, and he welcomed the opportunity to try his wits in wider competition than Paraguay afforded. In 1844, Rosas, the tyrant of Buenos Aires, was engaged in a contest with revolutionists in Corrientes. His ultimate purpose was manifestly to unite the whole played valley under his authority. Lopez shared the uneasiness of other neighboring rulers at the growth of Rosas's power. The latter promulgated a decree forbidding the navigation of the Paraná to any but Argentine vessels. This decree was an attack on Paraguay's very plain and natural right to reach the ocean, and absolutely shut her off from the outside world. Lopez resented the aggression, and after many protests declared war against Buenos Aires in 1849. Nothing came of it, however, except to give his oldest son a chance to see actual service, and to emphasize Lopez's enmity to Rosas and his policy. The way was prepared for his friendship with Urquiza, the great leader of the Argentine provincials, 
and for the opening of Paraguay to foreign commerce. Permission was granted in 1845 for foreign ships to ascend the Paraguay as far as Asuncion, and foreigners were no longer forbidden to enter the country. On the contrary, Lopez evinced a marked desire for their society, and encouraged them to come and engage in trade. His manners were engaging, and his courtesies untiring, unless his will was crossed or his suspicion aroused, when he could be very unreasonable and arbitrary. The spirit of the Paraguayan Creoles had been so broken by the terrible proscriptions of Francia's reign that Lopez did not experience much difficulty in ruling them. His milder methods and the terror of a renewal of the cruelties of Francia's time succeeded in holding all demonstrations of lawlessness or rebellion in check. He was averse to shedding blood, and his subjects enjoyed substantial liberty in their goings and comings. Justice was well and regularly administered, and life and property were almost absolutely safe. Over every kind of affairs, however, he exercised a patriarchal supervision. One trustworthy traveller tells of being waited on at table in a remote part of Paraguay by a fine-appearing man whose face was very sad and who seemed very awkward in handling the dishes. On inquiry, it turned out that the waiter was the richest man in eastern Paraguay and had been condemned by the president to serve in a menial capacity as a punishment for insulting a woman. Lopez's ideal of freedom did not contemplate that his people might engage in politics or the discussion of any public affairs. During the civil war in Corrientes, Paraguayans were forbidden to speak of what was going on across the river. Sometimes farmers were required to cultivate a certain area in a certain crop. He maintained the government monopoly of Yerba and completed Francia's work of incorporating the free Indians. An instance of his ready interest in foreigners was his connection with a young American named Hopkins, who had been sent out in 1845 by the United States government to investigate the advisability of recognizing Paraguay then accessible for the first time. This enterprising young man fired Lopez's imagination with his accounts of the material progress of the United States, and Lopez even lent him money to return and form a company for the purpose of introducing American goods and cigar manufacture into Paraguay. Hopkins, after several years, succeeded in interesting some American capitalists and came back and established his factory. At first, Lopez was delighted, but he soon quarrelled with the Americans. The etiquette in Paraguay was that the president should remain seated with his hat on when he granted an audience, and the manners of the visitor were expected to be correspondingly humble. The Americans mortally offended him by forgetting themselves in his presence. The situation soon became intolerable, and the company retired. After the overthrow of Rosas in 1851, the Paraná was declared free for navigation to vessels of all nations by Argentine law and by treaties, to which Brazil and Uruguay were parties, although Paraguay was not. Nevertheless, Lopez permitted ships to ascend freely to Asuncion. Lopez wished to concentrate all trade at Asuncion and opened no ports north of his capital. The upper course of the river belonged to Brazil, but the boundary between Brazil and Paraguay had remained unsettled from colonial times. In his control of the lower Paraguay, Lopez had a lever to force Brazil to terms. He steadfastly refused to permit ships to ascend into Brazil, in spite of the latter's persistent efforts to procure the natural and necessary right of egress to the ocean by an international river. While this matter still remained unsettled, Lieutenant Page of the United States Navy appeared in the water witch at Asuncion on his survey of the Paraguay. Lopez was delighted and extended every facility to the officer as far as the northern boundary of Paraguay. Page went on up to Brazil. Lopez was offended, for he feared that he would be at a disadvantage in his further negotiations with Brazil by having apparently granted to an American ship the permission which he had steadily refused to Brazilians. Unfortunately, just at this time occurred the quarrel with the American promoter Hopkins. The American officer took his countryman's side, giving him refuge on board the Water Witch. This so enraged Lopez that he issued a decree prohibiting foreign war vessel from entering Paraguayan waters, 
and one of his forts fired at the lieutenant's vessel, killing a man. This outrage brought about Lopez's ears a naval expedition which compelled him to apologize and to agree to reimburse the Hopkins Company. Brazil also sent a fleet up the Paraná to coerce Lopez into granting free transit along the Paraguay, but he cleverly held the Brazilians in parley until he had an opportunity to fortify the river. England's gunboats at Buenos Aires virtually held the Paraguayan flagship, with Lopez's eldest son on board as hostage for a young British subject named Canstat, who had been imprisoned and condemned to death for complicity in a conspiracy at Asuncion. Lopez was forced to release him and pay damages. These humiliations changed his love for foreigners into a bitter hatred, and he began to prepare his country to resist their aggressions more effectively. From his youth he had trained his sons to succeed him. Francisco, the eldest, early evinced a taste for military affairs. When only eighteen years of age, he commanded the expedition of 1849 into the Argentine, and thenceforward continued to be his father's general-in-chief and minister of war, and the active agent in improving Paraguay's military resources. The second son, Venancio, was commander of the garrison at Asuncion, and the third, Benigno, was admiral. Though so rigid with his other subjects, he gave both his sons and daughters unlimited license, and they grew up to regard themselves as members of a royal family. They enriched themselves at the public expense. The sons took as many mistresses as they pleased, and gave free rein to all their cruel and bad instincts. The selfishness, obstinacy, unspeakable cruelty, and hard-heartedness of Francisco were soon to bring the guiltless Paraguayan people to the verge of extinction. In 1854, Lopez had sent Francisco to Europe as ambassador. The young man spent 18 months in the different courts of Europe, and returned an expert in devices of great capitals, and enamoured of military glory. After seeing the reviews of European armies, he became convinced that Paraguay could be made an efficient military power, and that he himself might play a Napoleonic role in South America. His father, exasperated by the repeated humiliations put upon him by other countries, gave hearty support to his plans for the improvements of the Paraguayan army. In 1862, after a long and painful illness, the elder Lopez died. Francisco took possession of his effects and papers, and produced a will naming himself vice-president. Words sent to the military chiefs of the different towns ensured the assembling of an obedient congress at Asuncion, by which he was formally elected and proclaimed president, and invested with all the absolute power wielded by his father and Francia. End of section 15「The new president was thirty-five years old, good-looking, careful of his appearance, fond of military finery, and strutted as he walked. He spoke French and Spanish fluently, but with his officers and men used only Guarani. He was an eloquent speaker, and had the gift of inspiring his troops with confidence in himself and contempt for the enemy. He had a will of iron, his pride was intense, he was absolutely unscrupulous, and had no regard for the truth. He never showed any feeling of kindness to his most devoted subjects. He ordered his best friends to execution, he tortured his mother and sisters, and murdered his brothers. The only natural affection he ever evinced was a fondness for Madame Lynch, a woman whom he had picked up in Paris, and for her children. He seems to have treated her well to the last, but his numerous other mistresses and their children he heartlessly abandoned. Though physically an arrant coward, no defeats could discourage him. He fought to the last against overwhelming odds, and was able to retain his personal ascendancy over his followers, even after he had been driven into the woods and all reasonable hope was lost. He began his reign like a Mahometan sultan, by ridding himself of his father's most trusted counsellors, imprisoning and executing the most intelligent and powerful citizens, and banishing his brothers. The military preparations which he had begun as his father's minister of war were continued with increased vigour. 
the warlike Argentines and Uruguayans, and the powerful Empire of Brazil laughed at his pretensions to become a real factor in South American international affairs, but their laughter soon cost them dear. He was a monarch of a compact little state, whose position behind rivers, in the centre of the continent, made it admirably defensible. Its 800,000 inhabitants were obedient, brave, and physically vigorous. Accustomed for generations to regard their dictator as the greatest ruler in the world, knowing no duty except absolute compliance with his will, they never doubted that under his leadership they would be invincible. He knew that he could raise an army out of all proportion to the size of his country. The problem was how to arm it. With Buenos Aires commanding the only route of ingress from abroad, it had been difficult for his father and himself to obtain war material from Europe. For years, however, they had been buying all that they could, and had accumulated several hundred cannon, most of them antiquated cast-iron smoothbores. They had fortified the point of Umaita, which admirably protected the Paraguay River from naval attacks, and had established an arsenal at Asuncion. Against Brazil, Lopez had serious cause of complaint. The boundary question was still unsettled, and his possession of the lower Paraguay placed the greater province of Mato Grosso at his mercy, while the existence of that province, geographically a mere northern extension of Paraguay, was a menace to his own safety. Against the Argentines, his hatred was not so well founded, but none the less bitter. The usual civil war was going on in Uruguay in 1863. The party which held the capital was out of favor at Rio and at Buenos Aires, and Brazil and Argentine were both inclined to support the pretensions of Flores, who led the revolutionists. Lopez thought that his own interests were concerned, and asserted his right to be consulted as to the Uruguayan affairs. A mighty shout of laughter went up from the Buenos Aires press at the pretensions of the cacique of an Indian tribe to the position of guardian of the equilibrium of South America. Brazil ignored his protests and calmly went on with her preparations to establish her protégé in Montevideo. In the beginning of 1864, Lopez began active preparations for war. His army already numbered 28,000 men, and by the end of August, 64,000 more had been enrolled and drilled. Although ill provided with artillery and horses, and although the infantry were mostly armed with old-fashioned flintlocks, no such formidable force had ever assembled in South America. The news of Lopez's preparations exasperated and somewhat alarmed the people of Buenos Aires, though no one knew his exact intentions. Lopez had, in fact, determined to compel the Brazilian and Argentine governments to accept his wishes as to Uruguay, or to risk all in the hazard of war. Perhaps hazy dreams of himself as emperor of a domain extending from the southern source of the Amazon, far down the Plate Valley, and over to the Atlantic coast, passed through his brain. Possibly he foresaw clearly that Paraguay had come to the parting of the ways, and that she must either fight her way to the sea, or reconcile herself to slow suffocation between the immense masses of Brazil and Argentina. In such a contest, the only allies he could hope for would be revolutionary factions in Uruguay and Corrientes, and possibly the virtually independent ruler of Entre Rios. In case of a war with Brazil alone, the neutrality of Argentina might have been secured by careful management, but in the freer countries the feeling against him as a despot was strong, and the extension of his system would have been regarded as a menace to civilization. Late in 1864, the Brazilian forces marched into Uruguay and joined Flores. Lopez promptly retaliated by seizing a Brazilian steamer which was passing Asuncion on its way to Mato Grosso, and followed up this aggression by an invasion of the latter province. His forces quickly reduced the towns on the banks of the Paraguay as far as steamers could penetrate. It was impossible to send reinforcements over land from Rio. Brazil's counter-attack must be delivered from the south. The empire was unprepared, but its troops poured into Uruguay and Rio Grande as fast as they could be mobilized. The anti-Flores party was crushed by the siege and capture of Paysandú late in 1864. The Argentine government under Mitre proclaimed its neutrality. López was flushed with his easy success in Mato Grosso. The forces he had on foot overwhelmingly outnumbered those of the Brazilians in Uruguay and Rio Grande. 
he wished to strike the latter before they could be reinforced, overrun Rio Grande, and, as master of one of Brazil's most valuable provinces, dictate terms. To reach the Brazilians, it was necessary to cross the Argentine province of Corrientes. He asked for permission to do so, and Mitre refused. Notwithstanding the risk involved, he promptly decided to finish up both Argentine and Brazil at the same time. Sending his troops across the Paraná, he virtually annexed Corrientes and declared war on Buenos Aires. López destined 25,000 men for the invasion of Corrientes and the conquest of the lower Uruguay Valley, but the difficulties of getting so large an army across the river and ready for an advance into a hostile territory were unexpectedly great. The gauchos of Corrientes, trained for generations in civil wars, quickly assembled to oppose the Paraguayans. Meanwhile, a Brazilian fleet came up, and on the 2nd of June, 1865, at Riachuelo, decisively defeated the Paraguayan naval forces. López thereby lost all hope of commanding the river. The communications of his army in Corrientes might be cut off at any time, and an advance became impossible. The Battle of Riachuelo threw Paraguay on the defensive, and made López's great plan of carrying the war to the Uruguay impracticable. Nevertheless, López did not recall the 12,000 men he had sent across the missions to invade the valley of the upper Uruguay and the state of Rio Grande. The Brazilians were taken unprepared, and early in August the Paraguayans had captured the chief Brazilian town in that region, Uruguayana. The failure of the Corrientes army to reach the lower Uruguay left the route up that river free. The Brazilian and Uruguayan army, which had been victorious at Paysandu, marched up the west bank and defeated and destroyed the rear guard, which the Paraguayans had left on the Argentine side opposite Uruguayana. López's army was therefore cut off from the retreat. It was promptly surrounded, and on the 17th of September 1865 had to surrender. This put an end to López's plan of an offensive campaign. Indignant at the invasion of her soil, Argentina had allied herself with Brazil against him. A secret treaty was signed between Brazil, Argentina, and Flores, now recognized as ruler of Uruguay, to prosecute the war to a finish, to depose López from his throne, and to disarm the Paraguayan fortifications. López withdrew his army from Corrientes, and concentrated all his forces in the southwest angle of his own territory. The position was admirable for defense. North of the Paraná and east of the Paraguay stretched a low, wooded country subject to overflow and intersected by shallow, mud-bottomed lagoons, which were old abandoned beds of the rivers. The Paraguay protected his right flank and afforded him a direct and easy communication with Asuncion. Batteries on the point of Umaita, which the Brazilian fleet did not dare to try to pass, ensured this line of communication. West of the Paraguay, the great Chaco, there impenetrable, prevented a movement to get north of Umaita on that side. To the east, the swamps along the Paraná extended indefinitely, and an advance of the enemy in that direction would have had its communications cut by an army encamped near Umaita. Umaita was therefore the key to the situation, and the Allies could not advance until they captured it, or, by running the batteries with their fleet, destroyed López's control of the Paraguay. By March 1866, the Allies had concentrated a force of 40,000 men just south of the fork of the rivers. About 25,000 were Brazilians, 12,000 Argentines, and 3,000 Uruguayans. The Brazilian fleet, numbering 18 stream gunboats carrying 125 guns, lay near at hand, ready to cooperate. Protected by the fire of the gunboats, the whole Allied army had little difficulty in crossing the Paraná and establishing itself on Paraguayan soil. López lost heavily in vain attempts to prevent this landing. On the 2nd of May, a force of Paraguayans surprised the Allies a few miles north of the river and badly cut up the vanguard. The Allies, however, continued advancing and took a strong position just south of a great lagoon. Here, on the 24th of May, they were attacked by the whole Paraguayan army of 25,000 men, who fought with desperate valor, but at a hopeless disadvantage. A quarter of the Paraguayan soldiers were left dead on the field, and another quarter were badly wounded, while the loss of the Allies was half as great. The Paraguayan army was apparently destroyed, but the Allies had suffered so severely 
and the difficulties of transportation through the swamps were so great that they did not make the sudden dash upon the trenches at Umaita, which might have ended the war. Lopez did his utmost to reorganize his army. Practically the whole male population was impressed into service. The river line of communication to Asuncion and the strategic railroad thence up into the most fertile and populous interior of the country enabled him comfortably to command all the resources of the country, both in men and provisions. Umaita had already been well fortified on the land side, and Lopez now threw up the trenches at the top of the bluff at Curupaiti the first high land on the Paraguay River north of the Allied army and south of Umaita, and connected it with the latter fortress. Lopez had the advantage of the services of a clever English civil engineer, and the fortifications, though rude, were soon made practically impregnable to assault. In spite of their defeats, the Paraguayans were as ready as ever to attack when Lopez commanded, or to stand up and be shot down to the last man. They were the most obedient soldiers imaginable, they never complained of an injustice and never questioned an order when given. Even if a soldier were flogged, he consoled himself by saying, quote, If my father did not flog me, who would? End quote. Everyone called his superior officer his father, and Lopez was the great father. Each officer was responsible with his life for the faithfulness and conduct of his men, and had orders to shoot any that wavered. Each soldier knew that the men who touched shoulders with him right and left were instructed to shoot him if he tried to desert or fly, and those two knew that the men beyond them would shoot them if they failed to kill the poor fellow in the center of the five. This cruel system answered perfectly with the Paraguayans, and to the very end of the war they never refused to fight steadily against the most hopeless odds. Meanwhile, the Allies awaited reinforcements and supplies in the noisome swamps, dying meantime by thousands of fever. By the end of June, when the Allies finally determined to assault the fortifications around Umaita, Lopez had 20,000 men on the ground. After some bloody and indecisive fighting in the swamps, General Mitre, the commander-in-chief, ordered a grand attack upon the entrenchments at Kurupaiti. On the 22nd of September, 1866, it began with the bombardment by the Brazilian ironclads. 18,000 men in four columns advanced from the south and threw themselves blindly against the fortifications. When they came to close quarters, they were thrown into disorder by the terrible artillery fire from the Paraguayan trenches, which cross-enfiladed them in different directions. The enormous canisters discharged from the eight-inch guns point blank, at a distance of two or three hundred yards, wrought fearful execution. The rifle fire of the Allies was useless, and the Paraguayans simply waited behind their trenches until the Brazilians and Argentines were close at hand, and then fired. The Allies retired in good order, after suffering a loss of one-third their number. The soldiers obediently kept rushing on to certain death, until their officers, seeing that success was hopeless, told them that they might retreat. The courage of the Paraguayans had been proved in their unsuccessful assaults on the Allies the year before, and now the Argentines and Brazilians showed even in this awful defeat what a stomach they, too, had for hand-to-hand -hand fighting. After the Battle of Curupaiti, nothing was attempted on either side for fourteen months. Both sides had had enough of attacking fortified positions. The Paraguayans lay in Umaita, and the Allies occupied themselves with fortifying their camps. The imperial government made tremendous exertions to reinforce the army. The Argentines also did their best, but the efforts of both were hardly sufficient to make good the terrible ravages of the cholera, which, by the beginning of May 1867, had put 13,000 Brazilians in hospitals. It was not until July that the Allies felt themselves again ready to take the offensive. A division marched up the Paraná with the purpose of outflanking Umaita on the east, while cavalry raids were sent out to the north and rendered the outlying positions of the Paraguayans unsafe. Finally, in November 1867, the Brazilian troops succeeded in getting over to the Paraguay River, north and in the rear of López, and General Barreto captured and fortified a strong position on the bank 15 miles north of Umaita. 
This was fatal to the security and communications of Lopez. He made one more desperate and unsuccessful assault on the main position of the Allies, and then began to plan to retire toward Asuncion. At the same time, the Brazilian ironclads passed the batteries at Curupaite, compelling Lopez to withdraw his troops up the river to Umaita. The war became virtually a siege of the latter place, which was constantly bombarded by the fleet from the front and by the army from the rear. The Brazilian position on the river to the north cut Lopez off from direct river communication with Asuncion, and he had to transport his supplies on a new road built in the Chaco swamps. He began preparations to evacuate Umaita and retreat to the north. In January 1868, Mitre definitely retired from the command of the Allies and was succeeded by the Brazilian Marshal Cassias. A month later, February the 18th, the Brazilian fleet of ironclads finally succeeded in running the batteries at Umaita, and after throwing a few bombs at Asuncion, devoted themselves to the more useful task of cutting off the transports to Lopez's army. Lopez's line of river communication was now completely at the enemy's mercy, and a large force could not be maintained at Umaita. He transported his army to the right bank of the Paraguay, recrossing when he got beyond the Brazilian positions. The garrison of 3,000 men, which he left at Umaita, defended itself for six months. In the meantime, he had fortified a new position less than 50 miles from Asuncion and accessible across the country from his base of supplies in central Paraguay. On his right flank, a river battery was erected, which again prevented the Brazilians from reaching the upper river. Opposite this point, however, the Chaco is penetrable, and Cassias landed a force on the west bank, and, marching up, crossed the river in the rear of Lopez's position. The Brazilians closed in from the north and south on the few thousand Paraguayans, who were all that survived, and after several days of desperate fighting, December 27, 1868, the Brazilians carried Lopez's position, and he fled for his life to the interior, followed by a thousand men. Even after such a defeat, he was indomitable, and succeeded in gathering another small army, which was pursued and destroyed in August 1869. Lopez again escaped and took refuge in the wild and mountainous regions in the north of Paraguay. The Brazilian cavalry pursued him relentlessly, but it was not until the 1st of March 1870 that he was caught. In an attempt to escape, he was speared by a common soldier. End of section 16「Section 17 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2. Paraguay. Chapter 6. Paraguay since 1870. No modern nation has ever come so near to complete annihilation as Paraguay during her five years' war against the Triple Alliance. Out of 250,000 able-bodied men who were living in 1864, less than 25,000 survived in 1870. No less than 225,000 Paraguayan men, the fathers and breadwinners, the farmers and laborers, had perished in battle, by disease, or exposure, or starvation. 100,000 adult women had died of hardships and hunger, and there were less than 90,000 children under 15 in the country. The surviving women outnumbered the men five to one. The practice of polygamy naturally increased, and women were forced to become the laborers and breadwinners for the community. The slaughter was greatest in proportion among the people of white blood. When Lopez was waiting in 1868 for the final attack of Brazilians, he made use of the last months of his power to arrest, torture, and murder nearly every white man left in Paraguay, including his own brother, his brother-in-law, and the generals who had served him best, and the friends who had enjoyed his most intimate confidence. Even women and foreigners did not escape the cold, deliberate bloodthirstiness of this demon. He had his own sister beaten with clubs and exposed her naked in the forest, had the wife of the brave general, who was forced to surrender at Umaita, speared and subjected to members of the American legation to the most sickening tortures. The minister himself barely escaped with his life. When the Brazilians captured Asuncion in 1868, they installed a provisional triumvirate of Paraguayans, but the country was really under their military government until after the death of Lopez. 
A new constitution was proclaimed on the 25th of November, 1870, but it was not until a year later that the provisional government was superseded by Salvatore Jovellanos, the first president. The new president had no elements with which to establish a government, neither money nor men. The country Paraguayans refused to recognize his authority, and he was shut up in Asuncion. There were three so-called revolutions in 1872, which were suppressed by the Brazilian troops. The country really remained under a Brazilian protectorate for the first few years after the war, and the government was largely a convenience to make treaties and to try to place loans abroad. Toward the end of 1874, Jovellanos was succeeded by Hill, and by 1876 the country was finally enjoying peace and freedom from foreign control. The integrity of Paraguay and her continuance as an independent power had been mutually guaranteed by Brazil and Argentina when they began the war against Lopez, and neither of them could afford to let the other take possession of her territory. So Paraguay was left substantially intact, although she was compelled to give up the territorial claims the Lopezes had so long made against Brazil and the Argentine. The latter even submitted to arbitration her right to a portion of the Chacon north of the Pilocomayo. President Hayes was the arbitrator, and he decided in favor of Paraguay in 1878. In the Treaty of Peace, Paraguay had agreed to bear the war expenses of all allies, and these immense sums are still nominally due from her. As a matter of fact, she has not been able to pay anything thereon, and the matter of forgiving the debt is one frequently discussed in Brazil. Population rapidly increased after peace was thoroughly established, and has more than doubled in the last thirty years. In the late eighties, the influence of the Buenos Aires boom extended to Paraguay, and the government offered great inducements to attract immigration. The movement was not very successful, but it had the indirect effect of transferring great tracts of land from government to private ownership. Previously, two-thirds of the land belonged to the state. One of the colonies was composed of socialists from Australia, who promptly split on their arrival over the question of total abstinence. Those who insisted on being allowed to drink were obliged to leave. Subsequently, disagreements about doctrine and the application of the principles of socialism drove out others. The soil of Paraguay is marvelously fertile, but its isolation and the want of markets for the national products make it unattractive to European immigration. Happily, Paraguay has not suffered from civil disorders during the slow process of national regeneration which has been going on since 1870. Most of the presidents have served out their full four years term, and the one or two changes which have occurred have not been accompanied by any bloodshed or interruption in administration. The chief difficulties of the government have been financial. Revenue is small, and paper currency has been issued until it is at a discount of several hundred percent compared with its nominal value in gold. But since foreign commerce is inconsiderable, and the population lives off the products of its own farms, the results of inflation have not been so disastrous as they might have been in a commercial country. The wave of twentieth-century progress and immigration may strike this Arcadian region at any moment, but up to the present time the body of the Paraguayans live much as their ancestors. Existence can be maintained with hardly any effort. The people can always get oranges in default of more nourishing food. The climate is lovely, the forest surrounding the peasant's cabin beautiful. Why should a Paraguayan work when he can live happily and comfortably without labor? merely to procure things which to him are superfluities. It must be remembered that the bulk of the Paraguayan people are descended from the Indians, which were found crowded into these garden spots three centuries ago by the Spaniards and the Jesuits. They have never lost their simple, submissive, stoical character, and the rule of the three dictators did not tend to change them. The modern improvements, of which they saw most during the reign of Lopez, were muskets and cannon, and they can hardly be blamed for preferring old-fashioned ways after their experience during the war. Though the nation was almost destroyed, the surviving remnants show the same characteristics which distinguished their ancestors. The new Paraguay, however, is not ruled by any bloody-minded despot, and the military possibilities of the people will never again be a menace to the liberties of the surrounding nations. 
rather is the present ruling class disposed to welcome foreign influences and immigration, and this beautiful, fertile, and easily accessible country stands open to the world. End of section 17section eighteen of the south american republics volume one by thomas cleland dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by piotr natter part three uruguay chapter one introduction the most fertile parts of the globe have always been fought for the most uruguay has been the flanders of south america her admirable commercial position at the mouth of the river plate has made her capital one of the greatest emporiums of the continent on the track of the world's commerce open to the currents of intellectual and industrial life which sweep from europe into the luxuriant country of the southern half of south america or around to the pacific her people have always been in the vanguard of spanish american civilization her productive well watered and gently rolling plains are well adapted for agriculture and unsurpassed for pasturage here the indians struggled hardest to maintain themselves and longest resisted the spanish conquest from colonial times argentines have crowded in from the west brazilians from the north and buenos aires and europeans from the coast until this favored spot has become the most thickly populated country of south america the very strategic and industrial desirability of this region and the ease with which it can be invaded have made it the scene of constant armed conflicts Uruguay has been the cockpit of the southern half of the continent, and its people have been fighting continually through the 150 years during which the country has been inhabited. They fought for their independence against the Spaniards, then against Buenos Aires, then against the Brazilians, then against the Buenos Aires again, and in the intervals they have fought pretty constantly among themselves. In colonial times, Montevideo was Spain's chief fortress on this coast, and that city has always been the favorite refuge for the unsuccessful revolutionists and exiles from the neighboring states. The blood of the bravest and most turbulent Argentines and Rio Grandenses has constantly mixed with its population. By habit, tradition, and inheritance, the older generation of Uruguayans in both city and country are warlike though the military spirit had been vastly stimulated by peculiar political and racial circumstances in later times commercialism has been nourished by geographical situation and the fertility of the soil and by european immigration the interplay of these contending forces has been producing a marked people a vigorous turbulent race whose energies have apparently been chiefly employed in war but who have found times in the intervals of foreign and civil conflict to make their country one of the wealthiest and most industrially progressive countries in south america they are like the dutch in their turbulence and in their eagerness to make money and they are also like the dutch in their determination to maintain at all hazards their separate national existence nevertheless the origin of uruguay was artificial the reason for the country's separation from buenos aires was that brazil regarded it as unsafe to permit Argentina to spread north of the plate. The territory of Uruguay is that irregular polygon which is bounded on the south by the plate estuary, on the west by the Uruguay River, on the southeast by the Atlantic, and on the northeast by the artificial line which separates it from Brazil. Though the most favored in soil, climate, and geographical position, it is the smallest country in South America, the area being only 73,000 square miles in prehistoric days when a vast inland sea occupied what is now the argentine pampa uruguay was the northern shore of the great strait which opened into the pampian sea it is the southern extremity of the eastern continental uplift of south america the last outlying ramparts of the brazilian mountain system greatly eroded and planed down into low swelling masses little elevated above the sea ran southwest from rio grande into uruguay dipping into the plate at the southern border the north shore of the plate estuary is bold and not flat as is the opposite shore of buenos aires there are however no mountains properly so called in uruguay and nearly the whole surface is a succession of gently undulating plains and broad ridges intersected by countless streams and covered for the most part with luxuriant pasturage 
the abundance of wood and water is an immense advantage to settlers whether pastoral or agricultural the extreme southwestern corner near the mouth of the uruguay river is alluvial on the atlantic coast there are level marshy plains due to the slow secular rising of the land and consequent barring of the ocean's bed the country is easily penetrable in every part there are no mountain ridges or dense forests to interrupt travel and most of the rivers are easily fordable on the west the broad flood of the uruguay river gives easy communication to the ocean while it affords protection against sudden invasion from the argentine province of entre rios the low and sandy foreshore of the atlantic has no harbours but after rounding cape santa maria and entering the estuary of the plate there are several bays which afford some shelter for shipping maldonado montevideo and colonia are the principal ports but the extreme shallowness of the plate prevents them from being classed as first-rate harbours for modern vessels at montevideo itself large modern steamers must anchor several miles out possibly the present territory of uruguay was reached by the portuguese navigators who reconnoitred the coast of brazil in the first few years of the sixteenth century but they certainly made no settlements and left no clear record of their voyagings in fifteen fifteen juan diaz de soris grand pilot of brazil was sent out by charles v to reconnoitre the brazilian coast in spanish interests he did not land on the shore of brazil proper but kept on to the south until he reached cape santa maria which marks the northern side of the entrance to the river plate to his left hand stretched beyond the horizon a flood of yellow fresh water flowing gently over a shifting sandy bottom nowhere more than a few fathoms below the surface it was evident that he was out of the ocean and sailing up a river of such magnitude as has never been dreamed of before he followed along the coast skirting the whole southern boundary of what is now the republic of uruguay and finally reached the head of the estuary directly from the north the uruguay a river five miles wide clear and deep seemed a continuation of the plate but from the west the numerous channels of the parana delta poured in an immense muddy discharge double the volume of the wider river at the junction was an island which solis named martin garcia after his pilot he resolved to take possession of the country in the name of the crown of castile and to explore the coast he disembarked with nine companions on the uruguayan shore here the little party was unexpectedly attacked by indians solis and all his men but one were killed and the ships sailed back to spain without their commander three years later ferdinand magellan on his epoch-making voyage around the world visited the coast of uruguay on the fifteenth of january fifteen twenty he came in sight of a high hill overlooking a commodious bay this he called montevideo a name which has been extended to the city which long after grew up on the other side of the harbour magellan ascended the estuary hoping that he might find a passage through to the pacific ocean but after he had entered the uruguay its clear water rapid current and want of tides convinced him that it was only an ordinary river and not a strait spain determined to take possession of the plate and in fifteen twenty six sent out an expedition for that purpose under diego garcia at the same time sebastian cabot was preparing another expedition which was ordered to follow in magellan's track and to make observations of longitude on the atlantic coast of south america and in the east indies spain and portugal had already begun to dispute about the correct location of the line which they had agreed should divide the world into a spanish and a portuguese hemisphere and which was believed to pass near the plate garcia was delayed on the coast of brazil so cabot reached the mouth of the estuary first the latter had encountered bad weather and lost his best ship and when he sighted the coast of uruguay his men were discouraged they remained in the mouth of the river for some time and to their surprise a solitary spaniard was encountered on the shore who proved to be the only survivor of the party that had gone ashore with solis ten years before soon cabot and his men heard tales of silver mines far up the river and of the existence of a great civilized empire on its remote headwaters silver ornaments were shown which had come down hand to hand from peru to bolivia 
Cabot determined to abandon his commission to the Moluccas and to find the country whence the silver came. Naturally, his first effort was directed up the broad channel of the Uruguay, but on ascending this river it was soon evident that the mines and civilized country he was seeking did not lie on its banks. Fifty miles up the river at San Salvador, the Spaniards attempted to establish a little post, which is sometimes referred to as their earliest settlement in Uruguay or Argentina. It was probably intended as a mere supply depot and point of refuge, conveniently near the sea, to aid the upriver expedition. However, the warlike Indians of Uruguay soon left no trace of it. Cabot entered the Paraná, where he spent three years in an unsuccessful effort to reach Bolivia. He and Garcia sailed back to Spain without leaving even a settlement behind them, but they were thoroughly convinced that an adequate expedition could find the silver country. The tribes who inhabited Uruguay were the fiercest Indians encountered by the conquerors of South America. For two centuries they succeeded in preventing the establishment of settlements in their territory, and kept out Spanish intruders at the point of the sword. The Spaniards greatly coveted the north plank of the plate, and made effort after effort to get a foothold there, but these savages managed to maintain themselves for a hundred and fifty years in the very face of Buenos Aires. The river shore itself was the last accessible and fertile region to be subjected to the whites. A century elapsed after the foundation of Buenos Aires, before Colonia was occupied by the Portuguese, and another fifty years went by before Montevideo had been settled and fortified. Uruguay, in pre-Spanish times, as well as since, was a meeting ground for different peoples. One after another, the Guarani tribes crowded into this favored region from the north and west, and the old inhabitants had to fight and conquer, or be thrust into the sea. The bravest, best armed, and best organized tribes survived in the harsh struggle. Of the Indians inhabiting Uruguay, when the Spaniards discovered the plate, the principal ones were the Charruas. They occupied a zone extending around from the Atlantic along the plate, and a short distance up the Uruguay. This strong and valiant race never submitted to the Spaniards, and when at last they were defeated and crowded back from the coast well on in the 18th century, they retired to the north and maintained their freedom for many years. They belonged to the great family of Tupiguaranis, who occupied most of eastern South America at the white man's advent, but they were more nomadic in their habits and had developed the art of war to greater perfection than the mother tribes of the more tropical parts of South America. In their fights against the Spaniards, they sometimes gathered armies of several hundreds, which fought with a rude sort of discipline, forming in column and attacking in mass with clubs, after discharging their arrows and stones. Possibly they learned some of their tactics from the white men, but it is certain that before the invasion they had developed a tribal organization which enabled them to bring far larger bodies into the field than the tribes to the north, and that soon after the arrival of the whites they learned the military uses of the horse. Personal bravery and fortitude were the virtues most admired among the Chagruas, and they chose their chiefs from those who had most distinguished themselves in battle. They did not practice cannibalism like their brothers Guaranis on the Brazilian coast. They killed defective children at birth. They were moderate in their eating, lived in huts, and in winter covered themselves with the skins of animals. Altogether, they seemed to have much resembled the more warlike tribes among the North American Indians, and to have made the same effective resistance to the whites as did the Iroquois or Creeks. Such a fierce and indomitable people terrorized the Creoles, and settlement proceeded on lines of less resistance. The coast of Uruguay was long known as the abode of red demons, who showed little mercy to the adventurous white who dared build a cabin on the shore, or ride the plains in chase of cattle. The forts established from time to time by the Spanish authorities in the early days were invariably starved out and abandoned and the white men obtained a foothold only after the Portuguese and Spanish governments had fortified towns with walls, ditches, and artillery, which could be supplied with provisions from the water side, and after Entre Rios had been overrun by the gauchos. Warned by the experiences of Solis and Cabot on the north shore, 
Mendoza, the first Adelantado of the Plate, on his arrival in 1535, selected the south bank of the river as the site of the fortified port, which he proposed to establish at the mouth of the Paraná as a base for his projected expedition up the river. His effort failed completely, he abandoned Buenos Aires, and the remnants of his expedition fled to Paraguay and founded Asuncion. In 1573, Zarate, the third Adelantado, made a serious effort to establish a post in Uruguay. He had 350 well-armed Spanish soldiers, more than the number with which Pizarro had conquered the Empire of Peru, but they were not enough to make any impression on the Charruas. A company of 40 men hunting wood was set upon and massacred and when the main body tried to avenge this defeat, it too was driven back and only escaped to the island of Martin Garcia after losing a hundred men. The survivors were rescued by Garay, the most expert and successful Indian fighter of the time. The experienced and far-sighted officer wisely left the Charruas alone and devoted his efforts to the other side of the river, where, in 1580, he founded the city of Buenos Aires. Hernán Darias, the Creole governor of Buenos Aires, who shares with Garay the honor of establishing the Spanish power in Argentina, and who had already defeated the Pampa Indians from the Grand Chaco in the north to the Tandil Range in Buenos Aires province, attempted, in the early years of the 17th century, to subdue the Charruas. He disembarked at the head of 500 men in the western part of Uruguay. Few details of the campaign which followed have been preserved, but it is certain that the Spanish force was destroyed, and that Hernán Darias himself barely escaped with his life. Thenceforth, for more than a century, the Spaniards made no serious attempts to interfere with the Charruas. The coast of Uruguay was shunned by European ships, and the interior remained absolutely unknown. It is probable, although not certain, that the Jesuits on the upper Uruguay established some villages of peaceable Indians in the northwestern corner of Uruguay proper, in the middle of the 17th century. A few Indians, it is certain, gathered under Jesuit control on an island in the lower Uruguay, some 50 miles above Martin Garcia, about 1650. This was known as the Pueblo of Soriano, and is often referred to by Uruguayan historians as the first permanent settlement in their country. However, no real progress was made towards getting possession of Uruguay. The Charruas proved refractory to Jesuit influence, and only the milder Yaros and the tribes on the Brazilian border could be converted. The horses and cattle which the Spaniards had introduced multiplied into hundreds of thousands and roamed undisturbed over the rolling, grassy plains of Uruguay, and occasionally parties of Creoles would land on the shore of the plate and, at the risk of their lives, kill some steers and strip them of their hides. As time went on, the Indians became used to the white men and some trading sprang up, but for a full century after Buenos Aires had been in existence, Uruguay remained unsettled by civilized men. End of section 18. Section 19 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Natter. Part 3, Uruguay. Chapter 2, Portuguese Aggressions and the Settlement of the Country. In 1680, the governor of Rio de Janeiro sent some ships and a force of soldiers to the plate with orders to occupy a point on the north bank in the name of the king of Portugal. Spain claimed that her dominions extended as far up the coast as the southern border of the present state of Sao Paulo, and Portugal was equally stubborn in insisting that her rightful territory extended west and south as far as the mouth of the Uruguay neither country had made any settlements in the disputed region and portugal had determined to take advantage of the negligence of the spanish government and be the first in the field to establish a post only twenty miles from the capital of the spanish possessions and more than a thousand miles south of the last portuguese town seemed an audacious step but its success would secure for portugal the whole intermediate territory as well as give her a port which would ensure her merchants the command of the trade of the Plate Valley. The Portuguese commander landed unopposed on the shore of the estuary directly opposite Buenos Aires, 
and immediately began to throw up walls, dig a ditch, and lay out a town called Colonia. When the news reached Buenos Aires, the indignant governor raised a force of 260 Spaniards and 3,000 Indians, crossed the river, and fell upon the little body of Portuguese in the midst of their delving and shoveling. The attack was at first repulsed, but superior numbers were soon effective. The enemy surrendered, and the Spaniards threw down the walls and destroyed the beginnings of the town. The Portuguese government protested, claiming that the governor's action was a willful and inexcusable aggression against the forces of a friendly power operating in territory which had never been occupied by Spain. The Madrid government disavowed the act, and the Portuguese resumed possession of Colonia in 1683. They rebuilt its walls and made the place safe against the attacks of Indians. At once it became a centre for contraband traffic. The Spanish laws and colonial policy forbade vessels to land at Buenos Aires. In defiance of the prohibition, illegal trade had been carried on, but the landing of vessels lying in the Buenos Aires roads was conducted at great risk. Officials might order the seizure of the goods, and enormous bribes had to be paid to functionaries. Often the governor was the smuggler's partner, but he was a partner who demanded an exorbitant share of the profit. In Colonia, however, merchandise could be safely stored and embarked at leisure, so the latter place rapidly absorbed the export trade and became an entrepot for imported goods destined for sale in the Valley of the Plate and in Bolivia. Spain had restored Colonia under protest and without prejudice, explicitly reiterating her own claim to exclusive proprietorship of the north bank of the Plate. The diplomatists agreed that the question of right should remain open for determination at some future day, but all Spanish subjects considered the existence of Colonia as a violation of Spanish soil, and whenever a war broke out in Europe between the mother countries, the Buenos Aires were in the habit of promptly sending an expedition across the river to capture the Portuguese town. Three times was it wrenched from the Portuguese, and three times was it restored on the conclusion of peace. In 1705, Spain and Portugal being engaged in war, the governor of Buenos Aires dislodged the Portuguese garrison from Colonia, and the place remained in Spanish possession until after the conclusion of the Peace of Utrecht. Their eleven years' possession at last convinced the Spaniards that the settlement of the north bank was feasible. By 1708, the Charrua raids had so far lost their terrors that the Jesuit mission at Soriano was safely removed from the island in the Uruguay River to the mainland opposite. The trade in Uruguayan hides and horsehair increased, and private expeditions henceforth frequently crossed the estuary. It had long been known that the best harbours on the Uruguayan coast were at Montevideo and Maldonado, where partially sheltered bays, with water deep enough for the vessels of the 18th century, were overlooked by beautiful and defensible town sites. Montevideo is a hundred miles east of Colonia, and Maldonado another hundred miles farther on towards the Atlantic. The advisability of seizing and fortifying one or both of these places was frequently mooted in Buenos Aires, after the restoration of Colonia in 1716. Nothing, however, was done until 1723, when word came that the Portuguese had again anticipated the Spanish authorities and had occupied and begun to fortify Montevideo for themselves. The governor of Buenos Aires immediately sent an overwhelming force which compelled the Portuguese to retire. This time neither dilatory diplomacy nor official ineptitude prevented his doing the right thing to save Uruguay to the Spanish crown, and the following year he finished the Portuguese walls at Montevideo, and in 1726 the ground plan of a town was laid out, and a few families were brought from Buenos Aires and the Canary Islands. Within a few years there were a thousand people in the place, and it had been surrounded with walls and defended by artillery. Four years later, Maldonado was established. No serious trouble was experienced with the Indians at either place, and the Spaniards began to spread their ranches over the neighboring southeastern part of Uruguay. Almost simultaneously with this important event, 
The Creoles from Santa Fé province crossed over into the wide plains which lie between the Paraná and the Uruguay, and defeated the Charrua tribes who had kept the Spanish out of that region for 150 years. Soon the Gauchos were in possession of Entre Rios as far as the Uruguay. The Charruas east of the Uruguay could not prevent the Gauchos from making their way across the river to build their cabins and ride the plains after cattle. The settlement of western Uruguay began, but except Colonia and Soriano, no towns were founded. The half-Indian gauchos lived a semi-nomadic life, and needed and received little help from the authorities in their constant fights against the Indians. Shortly after the foundation of Montevideo, a Portuguese expedition tried to recover the place, but it was found to be too strong to attack, and the party resolved to establish town further up the coast. 300 miles to the northwest is found the only opening into the great system of lagoons which stretches along the seaward side of Rio Grande do Sul, and at that strategic point the Portuguese in 1735 built a fort and town. By the middle of the 18th century the situation between Spain and Portugal in the whole region between the plate, the Uruguay, and the sea had become very strained. Colonia was completely isolated and the Spaniards controlled all the rest of Uruguay's western and southern waterfront. The Portuguese settlements in the seaward half of Rio Grande were prospering and multiplying, soon to furnish thousands of gauchos, as ready as any who rode the Argentine Pampas to sally forth for war and plunder. The territories which the Jesuits had held for more than a century on the east bank of the upper Uruguay lay directly back of these Portuguese settlements, and was more easily accessible than from Montevideo. In 1750 Spain agreed to exchange the seven missions for Colonia. The Portuguese promptly took measures to secure the ceded territory, attacked the Indian villages, and massacred or drove off most of the inhabitants. The Jesuits vigorously protested, and outraged Spanish public opinion demanded the abrogation of the treaty. So a few years later, the desolated territory was restored to Spanish possession, and Colonia remained Portuguese. In 1762, Spain and Portugal were again engaged in war, and the governor of Buenos Aires attacked Colonia with a force of 2,700 men and 32 ships. The fortifications were strong and the Portuguese offered a tenacious resistance. After a well-contested siege, the place surrendered, only to be given back to Portugal the ensuing year. Meanwhile, troops had been sent up from Montevideo against Rio Grande, and the Portuguese settlers driven back to the northeast corner of the state, only to rise again when the Spanish troops were gone and to begin a guerrilla warfare which never ceased until they had regained their towns. The 18th century had entered on its last quarter before the Spanish home government took any real steps to drive the Portuguese out of Colonia and to reclaim the disputed territory as far north as Sao Paulo. The Atlantic slope of Spanish South America was erected into a viceroyalty, and in 1777 the greatest fleet and army ever sent by Spain to America reached Buenos Aires under command of the new viceroy. The Portuguese had no forces able to cope with his army and fleet, and he carried all before him. The island of Santa Catarina in the north of the disputed territory was captured, Colonia was taken, and an army of 4,000 men started on a triumphal march northwestward to sweep the Portuguese from the coast. The Spaniards were at the gates of Rio Grande when news came that peace had been declared. Orders from home compelled the viceroy to stop his northward progress, while the diplomats agreed on a division. The Treaty of San Ildefonso, in the main, gave each country the territory its citizens actually occupied. The seven missions remained Spanish, and the Portuguese were deprived of the southern half of the Great Lagoon and of Colonia. Santa Catarina was restored, and the right of Portugal to the vast interior and to the regions of the Upper Paraná and Paraguay were confirmed. Rio Grande remained Portuguese and Uruguay was assured of being thenceforth and forever Spanish in blood and speech. End of section 19
Section 20 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Nater. Part 3, Uruguay. Chapter 3, The Revolution. With the Treaty of San Ildefonso, Uruguay began her real existence. Montevideo was made the greatest fortress on the Atlantic coast, commanded by its own military governor, strongly garrisoned and provisioned, and with over one hundred cannon mounted on its walls. The Charruas had long been driven back from the coast, and as soon as the danger of Portuguese interference was over, settlements spread rapidly along the whole southern border. Prior to 1777 there were only five towns in Uruguay, but within the next five years the number tripled. By the year 1810 there were 7,500 people living in the city of Montevideo, 7,500 in its immediate district, and 16,000 in the outlying settlements. Outside of Montevideo, cattle herding was the sole business, and the people were a hard-riding, meat-eating, bellicose race. Immediately to the northeast lived 50,000 Rio Grandenses of Portuguese blood and speech, who, in like surroundings, had acquired the same pastoral and semi-nomadic habits as their Argentine and Uruguayan neighbors, and who constantly made incursions over the Spanish border. The Uruguayan gauchos retaliated, and for nearly a century continuous partisan warfare went on, for these half-savage cattle herders wrecked little of treaties or boundary lines. The Spanish guerillas bore the name of Blandenques, and in this school of arms the future generals of Uruguay's War of Independence were trained. Most of the forays were only for the purpose of stealing cattle or burning cabins built in coveted regions. Nevertheless, one of these expeditions changed the nationality of a territory larger than England. In 1801 the Rio Grandenses conquered the seven missions thus doubling at a single stroke the area of their own state, and reducing Uruguay to substantially its present dimensions. At the seat of the largest Spanish garrison, Montevideo naturally became the centre of pro-Spanish feeling and influence in the plate, and the home of families who boasted a distinguished Castilian descent and conservative principles. In the interior settlements, Creole influences predominated, and the population was substantially homogeneous with that of the Argentine provinces on the other side of the Uruguay River. Between the aristocratic Montevideans and the gauchos of the country districts, there was little sympathy. In 1806, the English captured Buenos Aires, and many Spanish officials and officers fled to Montevideo for refuge. The garrison of Montevideo furnished troops and arms for the expedition, which soon went across the plate and triumphantly recaptured Buenos Aires. Late that same year, British troops from the Cape of Good Hope seized Maldonado Harbor in eastern Uruguay. As soon as reinforcements arrived, a movement was made against Montevideo. On the 14th of January 1807, the city was besieged by land and sea. The attacking and defending forces were about equal in number, although the British regulars were far superior in discipline and effectiveness to their opponents, half of whom were militia. A sortie in force was completely defeated, with a loss of 1,000 men, and after eight days of bombardment, the British effected a breach in the wall and took the town by assault, the Spaniards losing half their force and the remainder scattering. A great fleet of merchant vessels had accompanied the British expedition, and as soon as the town surrendered, their goods were landed, and the English traders took possession of the shops almost as completely as the British soldiers did of the fortifications. Uruguay was opened up to free trade. The gauchos were soon selling their hides and horsehair for higher prices than they had ever received, and buying clothes, tools, and the comforts and luxuries of civilized life at rates they had never dreamed possible. A few months later the English attacked Buenos Aires, but were overwhelmingly defeated, and the British general found himself in such an awkward situation that, in order to obtain permission to withdraw his army, he had to agree to evacuate Montevideo. The convention was carried out, and the British soldiers left the plate forever, but the British merchants remained behind. Although the English occupation of the city had lasted so short a time, it created an unwanted animation in Montevideo by the establishment of a great number of mercantile and industrial houses. 
From this time Monte Video's commerce assumed greater proportions, and it became a place of real commercial importance as well as a military post. Both city and country had tasted the delights of commercial freedom, and material civilization had received its first great impulse. Elio, the Spanish military governor of Montevideo, suspected the loyalty of Ligniers, the Frenchman, who, because he had led in the fighting against the English, had been created viceroy at Buenos Aires. Spanish affairs at home were in confusion, and fast becoming worse confounded. The old king had abdicated in favour of his son, civil war had broken out on the peninsula, the new king had been compelled by Napoleon to resign, and Joseph Bonaparte was proclaimed monarch of Spain. The Spanish nation refused to accept Joseph, and a revolutionary government was set up in Seville. Elio, as a patriotic Spaniard, promptly swore allegiance to this junta, but the viceroy and the Buenos Aires Creoles hesitated as to their course of action. The Montevidian governor and the Buenos Aires viceroy quarrelled. The former accused the latter of unfaithfulness to Spain and disavowed his authority, and the latter retaliated by issuing a decree deposing Elio. On receiving news of this act, which was strictly legal under Spanish law, the Montevideo Cabildo met in extraordinary session and appointed a junta, which was to be dependent solely and directly upon the authority of the banished legitimate king, and in no way upon Buenos Aires, so long as Linier remained viceroy. Thus early did Montevideo act independently of Buenos Aires. Although the sentiment of loyalty was much stronger in Montevideo than in Buenos Aires, the English invasion was no sooner over than there became manifest something of the same profound division between Creoles and Spaniards. Three years, however, passed without disturbances, and even when the news of the overthrow of the new Spanish viceroy by the populace of Buenos Aires on the 25th of May, 1810, reached Montevideo, the governor was able to prevent any revolutionary manifestations of sympathy. On the 12th of July, a small part of the garrison rose in a mutiny, which was easily suppressed. In January 1811, Elio returned to Montevideo with a commission as viceroy, and bringing considerable reinforcements. He declared war on Creole revolutionists at Buenos Aires, and imprisoned the Montevideans suspected of Creole sympathies and revolutionary ideas. Among those who escaped to Buenos Aires was one destined to be the founder of Uruguayan nationality. This was José Artigas, then captain of guerilla cavalry. Although born in Montevideo, he had lived the life of a gaucho from boyhood, and since 1797 had been a leader of the gaucho bands, who were continually fighting the Rio Grandenses. He happened to be in Colonia on the occasion of Elia's declaration of war against the Creoles, and at once fled to Buenos Aires. The junta there gave him a lieutenant colonel's commission and some substantial help. The gauchos of the southeastern part of Uruguay had meanwhile risen against the Spanish governor, and within a few weeks Artigas was back on Uruguayan soil, at the head of a considerable force, while all around him bands of gauchos and their other chiefs were preparing to resist the Spaniards. His bravery, energy, and good luck in the field, and his ruthless maintenance of discipline, gave him an ascendancy over all the others. In April 1811, Belgrano, the chief general of Buenos Aires, arrived with reinforcements. Shortly after, a Spanish detachment, which had reached the western part of Uruguay, was captured, and the gaucho leaders advanced almost to the walls of Montevideo. A force of 1,000 Spaniards started out to meet them, and on the 18th of May met with complete defeat at the Battle of Las Piedras. For this victory Artigas was promoted by the Buenos Aires Junta, and became the greatest military figure on the Patriot side. With a considerable army of gauchos from both banks of the Uruguay, and of Patriots from Buenos Aires, he began a siege of Montevideo. The siege, however, did not last long. The great expedition sent by the Patriots to Bolivia was overwhelmingly defeated in the Battle of Huaqui, and the Buenos Aires Junta, horribly alarmed for their own safety, ordered all the troops under their control to return and help defend that city. At the same time, a Portuguese army advanced from Brazil with their avowed purpose of saving Montevideo from being lost to Spain, but really to take possession of Uruguay for King John's own benefit. 
Artigas was compelled to retire to the Argentine, and Uruguayan historians say that on his long retreat to the Uruguay River he was accompanied by practically the whole rural population of the country. The semi-nomadic habits of the gauchos made such a migration easy, and they quickly found new homes on the opposite shore in Entre Rios, whence it would be easy to return as soon as the Portuguese troops retired. Considerations of international politics and English pressure compelled King John to withdraw his troops from Uruguay in the middle of the year 1812, and the Buenos Aires government immediately began to assemble an army on the right bank of the Uruguay. Artigas was still encamped with his Uruguayan forces in the same neighborhood, and although he held an Argentine commission, he was virtually independent. The Argentine army, under the command of José Rondó, who in colonial days had been captain of guerrillas alongside Artigas, advanced against Montevideo, and on the last day of 1812 won the bloody battle of Cerrito, in sight of the city, and shut the Spaniards up within its walls. Artigas followed and assisted in the siege, but he refused to unite his forces with those of Rondó until his own claims should be recognized and his demands complied with. He assumed a dictatorship and sent delegates to Buenos Aires to advocate the formation of a federal republic, of which Buenos Aires was to be simply one member. Buenos Aires refused to receive his delegates and civil war broke out. Rondeau adhered to the Buenos Aires interest, and after a year of disputes, in the beginning of January 1814, Artigas withdrew his own followers from Montevideo, leaving the partisans of Buenos Aires to continue the siege alone. In May, the celebrated Irish admiral, William Brown, destroyed the Spanish fleet, which had hitherto dominated the plate. Montevideo's communications with both land and sea were shut off, and the fortress shortly afterwards surrendered to General Carlos Alvear, the Argentine general who was then commanding the besieging forces. Meanwhile, Artigas has retired to the west, and the gauchos, not only of western Uruguay, but also of Entre Rios, Corrientes, the Missions, and Santa Fe, rallied around his standard. Independent chiefs in these various provinces had been resisting the efforts of Buenos Aires to reduce them to obedience. Artigas was, in a way, recognized as their leader, but only as the greatest among equals. The conflict with the Buenos Aires party went on throughout the year 1814, and the Federalists continually gained ground. In January 1815, Fructuoso Rivera, one of the lieutenants of Artigas, defeated an Argentine force at the Battle of Guayabos, and the Buenos Aires Junta was compelled to withdraw its troops from Montevideo. This, however, did not amount to a separation of Uruguay from the Confederation. It only marked the triumph of the provinces in their efforts to prevent Buenos Aires from establishing a centralized government. Artigas had his friends in Entre Rios, Corrientes, the Missions, and Santa Fe, and even as far as Cordoba and Francia, dictator of Paraguay, was another of his allies in this struggle against Buenos Aires. However, he was nothing more than a military chief, without the capacity or even the desire of uniting these vast territories under a rational and stable government. At the very height of his power he made the fatal mistake of embroiling himself with Brazil. In 1815 he invaded the territory of the Seven Missions, which the Rio Grandenses had conquered fourteen years before. The Portuguese king retaliated by sending a well-equipped army of several thousand men, and in October 1816 the forces of Artigas were overwhelmed and driven with great slaughter from the disputed territory. Artigas made stupendous efforts to retrieve this loss, but the 4,000 men which he assembled to resist the Portuguese army, which was now advancing upon Montevideo itself, were defeated and scattered in January 1817. The Portuguese occupied Montevideo, and Artigas and his lieutenants, Rivera, La Valleja and Oribe, each of whom later became a great figure in the civil wars, retreated to the interior, where they maintained themselves for two years. After many defeats, Artigas himself lost the support of the chiefs of Entre Rios and Santa Fe. He was finally driven out of Uruguay and attempted to establish himself in the Argentine provinces, only to be completely overwhelmed by his rivals. On the 23rd of September, 1820, he presented himself with 40 men, all who remained faithful to him, 
at the Paraguayan town of Candelaria on the Paraná, begging hospitality of Francia. Francia granted him asylum, and this indomitable guerrilla chief, who for twenty-five years had kept the soil of Uruguay and of the Argentine Mesopotamia soaked in blood, spent the rest of his life peacefully cultivating his garden in the depths of the Paraguayan forests. He died in 1850 at the age of 86 years. Six years later, his remains were brought from Paraguay to Montevideo and interred in the National Pantheon. On the sarcophagus are engraved these words, quote, Artigas, founder of the Uruguayan nation, end quote. Rivera was the last Uruguayan chief to lay down his arms before the Portuguese. When he surrendered early in 1820, most of the other leaders had already given up and accepted service in the Portuguese army of occupation. In 1821, a Uruguayan Congress, selected for this purpose, declared the country incorporated with the Portuguese dominions under the name of the Cisplatin province. For five years, Montevideo and the country remained quiet under the Portuguese dominion, and Uruguay peacefully became a province of Brazil when that country declared her independence. The most celebrated chiefs of the Civil War were officers in the Brazilian army, and few external signs of dissatisfaction were apparent. Underneath the surface, however, fermented a hatred of the foreign rule, and the proud Creoles only awaited an opportunity to revolt. End of section 20《セクション21 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Nater. Part 3, Uruguay. Chapter 4, Independence and Civil War. In the beginning of 1825, a group of patriots met in Buenos Aires and planned an invasion of Uruguayan territory. Word was sent to different chiefs in the country districts, and on the night of the 19th of April, Thirty-three adventurers, with La Valleja at their head, landed on the shore of the river in the extreme southwestern corner of the country. No sooner had they landed than the country rose. The troops sent from Montevideo to meet the band of revolutionists refused to fight, and, deserting the Brazilian banner, joined their compatriots. The revolutionists advanced east along the Negro and the Yi to Durazno, 130 miles north of Montevideo, where they found Rivera, then general in the Brazilian service. He promptly deserted and was at once associated with La Valleja in the command. La Valleja advanced to the south, calling the population to arms, while the northern detachments rose in response to Rivera. Only fifteen days after the thirty-three had crossed to Uruguay, the flag of the revolution was floating over the Cerrito Hill, in front of Montevideo, and Brazilian power was virtually confined to the walls of that city and colonia. The military chiefs formally declared Uruguay separated from Brazil, and proclaimed its reincorporation with the Argentine. The number of Brazilians then in Uruguay was small, and infantry could not be expected to do much fighting on the plains against gaucho cavalry led by such experienced guerrilla fighters as Rivera and La Valleja. A division of Rio Grandense cavalry, under their own chiefs, Bento Manuel and Bento Gonsalves, met the Uruguayans at Sarandí. The two armies used substantially the same methods, charging into each other, sword in hand and carbine at shoulder. The Brazilians were caught in a disadvantageous position and suffered a complete and bloody overthrow. The result of this battle was to ensure to the revolutionists the continuation of their complete dominance in the country. Their cavalry bands roamed at will up to the very walls of Montevideo. Buenos Aires received the news with extravagant demonstrations of joy, and formal notice was given to Brazil that Uruguay would henceforth be recognized as an integral part of the Argentine Confederation. The emperor promptly responded with a declaration of war. His fleet blockaded Buenos Aires, while he poured reinforcements into Montevideo and sent an army to invade northern Uruguay. Argentine troops likewise swarmed across the Uruguay River into the country, and the Brazilians could make little progress. On sea they were not more successful, and by the beginning of 1826, Admiral Brown was blockading Colonia and menacing the communications of Montevideo. In August 1826, the famous Argentine general, Carlos Alvear, took command of the Patriot forces. 
Jealousies and quarrels had meantime broken out between La Valleja and Rivera. Alvear took the former's side, and Rivera's partisans revolted. But the arrival of more reinforcements for the Brazilians hushed up for the moment the intestine quarrels of the Spanish Americans. Alvear determined to carry the war into Brazil, and early in January 1827 succeeded in passing between the northern and southern Brazilian armies, and penetrated across the frontier to the northeast. He had sacked Bagé, the principal town of that region, before the Brazilian general, the Marquis of Barbacena, was able to concentrate his forces and start in pursuit. Alvear turned north, towards the missions, but he was in a hostile country, where defeat meant total destruction though his army numbered eight thousand men he had cut himself off from his base and an enemy in equal force was close at his heels he resolved to turn and give battle and on the twentieth of february eighteen twenty seven his army met that of barbacena in the decisive battle of ituizaingo which ended in the defeat of the brazilians although barbacena was able to withdraw his army without material loss and alvear retired at once to uruguayan soil the brazilians were never afterwards able to undertake a vigorous offensive the result of that battle ensured that the north bank of the plate should remain spanish in blood language and government a few days before ituzaingo admiral brown had won the great naval fight of juncal at the mouth of the river uruguay and thenceforth the brazilian blockade of buenos aires was entirely ineffective if it had not been for the civil disturbances in argentina that paralyzed the buenos aires government the brazilians might have been swept out of montevideo at the point of the sword and the argentines might have undertaken the conquest of rio grande itself though considerable argentine forces remained in uruguay during eighteen twenty seven and eighteen twenty eight they put no vigor into their operations and on their part the brazilians were able to do little more than hold montevideo so hampered was rivadavia the president of buenos aires by revolts uprisings and disorders throughout argentina that he thought himself obliged to agree to abandon uruguay public opinion in argentina would not accept the treaty which he made he was deposed and a leader of the opposite party installed in power rivera operating on his own account had undertaken a campaign against the western rio grande but so bitter was factional feeling that his rival la valleja sent a force to pursue and fight him while the new buenos aires government was induced to sign a treaty of peace largely because rivera's success against the brazilians might make him strong enough to be dangerous both brazil and argentina were tired of this tedious expensive war and both governments had preoccupations within their own territories through the intervention of the british minister the terms were agreed upon brazil and argentina both gave up their claims to uruguay the region was erected into an independent republic and brazil and argentina pledged themselves to guarantee its independence during five years at that time argentina was convulsed by the struggle between the federalists and the unitarians and the uruguayans were also divided into two camps the followers of la valleja and those of rivera neither in argentina nor in uruguay were these divisions parties in any proper sense of that term they were military factions whose ambitious leaders seem to have always been willing to sacrifice the interests of the country at large to secure a partisan advantage the argentine troops who returned home from the war against brazil promptly plunged their country into the bloodiest civil war known in her history and uruguay did not delay in following the example the first chief magistrate of independent uruguay was jose rondo an uruguayan who had become one of the greatest argentine generals however la valleja and rivera were the real factors in the situation and rondo's efforts to conciliate both at the same time failed constituent assembly which soon met and framed a paper constitution was controlled by la valleja's partisans rondo was deposed and la valleja assumed the reins of power rivera prepared to march on montevideo and dispute the matter by arms but the representatives of argentina and brazil intervened and a compromise was effected rivera got the best of the bargain being given command of the army and after the constitution had been declared on the eighteenth of july eighteen thirty he became as a matter of course the first president of uruguay End of section twenty one
Section 22 of the South American Republics, Volume 1, by Thomas Cleland Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Piotr Nater. Part 3. Uruguay. Chapter 5. Civil War and Argentine Intervention. Except for an expedition against the remnants of the once formidable Charrua Indians, the first two years of independence passed in peace. Since the expulsion of Artigas, the country had prospered, and its population had risen nearly threefold within twenty-five years, in spite of the bloody fighting which occurred from 1811 to 1817, and from 1825 to 1828. The settlements had spread far back from the coast, and many of the principal interior towns date from this period. In 1832 the civil wars began again. La Valleja's partisans organized a conspiracy, and a certain Colonel Garzón took advantage of Rivera's absence from Montevideo to raise a mutiny in the garrison and to issue a pronunciamiento, deposing the president. The latter soon recovered the city, and after two years of intermittent fighting, the La Valleja party was overthrown for the moment, and Rivera finished his term in peace. Manuel Oribe, a chief of the anti-Rivera faction, succeeded to the presidency by a compromise agreement, but the breach between the two factions had really grown wider, and their mutual hatred became irrepressibly bitter. Oribe soon began to persecute his opponents. Meanwhile, the five years had expired during which Uruguayan independence had been guaranteed by the treaty between Argentina and Brazil. Argentina was free to solicit the reincorporation of Uruguay into the Confederation. Rosas, the head of the Federalist Party, had made himself master of Buenos Aires, and his authority was recognized in most of the Argentine provinces, although the Unitarians continued their ineffectual revolts. The new Uruguayan president sympathized with the Federalists, while his rival, Rivera, could count on the Unitarians. The plan of Rosas was to establish Oribe firmly in Uruguay, and through his aid to incorporate that country with Argentina, while the Unitarians were desperately anxious that Rivera should triumph, knowing that Montevideo would be a base for the organization of their own forces for invasion of Buenos Aires and central Argentina. Thenceforward, for many years, Uruguay's history is inexplicably entwined with the story of the struggle between the two great Argentine factions. The little country became the storm center of South American politics, and the chief battlefield of the contending forces. Now, for the first time, we encounter references to Blancos and Colorados, which remain to this day the names of Uruguayan political parties. All the forces of the community lined up on either side, and never have political parties fought more determinedly and relentlessly. The divisions between them entered into all social and business relations, and even friendly intercourse between the members of the two factions was almost impossible. Men have often been more Blanco or Colorado than Uruguayan. The old conservative resident Spanish families were the basis of the Blanco or Oribe party, while the Colorados, or partisans of Rivera, were the progressive faction. The latter attracted the Argentine refugees fleeing from the tyranny of Rosas, and could count upon the support of resident Europeans and upon the sympathy of foreign governments. Rosas in Argentina and the Blancos in Uruguay represented the spirit of exclusivism and opposition to foreign influences. After Oribe's accession to power, Rivera hastened to raise a revolt in the western districts. He obtained help from the Unitarians, and his invasion was accompanied by many Argentine generals who had distinguished themselves in the wars against Rosas. The Argentine dictator sent help to Oribe, but for two years the tide of battle set in favor of the Colorados and Unitarians. Rivera had obtained so decided an advantage by 1838 that Oribe abandoned Montevideo and embarked for Buenos Aires, followed by the chiefs of his party. The Colorado chief, now in control of Uruguay, celebrated a formal alliance with the province of Corrientes, then in revolt against Rosas, and war was declared against latter. A large Argentine army, accompanied by many Blancos, invaded Uruguay, but was decisively defeated at the Battle of Cajancha, December 10, 1839. The interval of unquestioned Colorado supremacy which followed was one of the most flourishing periods in the history of Uruguay. 
Large numbers of the intellectual elite of Buenos Ayres swarmed across the river. Montevideo became the centre of arts and letters of Spanish America. The civil wars of the last few years had not been severe, and even during their continuance property had suffered little. Immigration from England, France, and Italy began on a large scale, and the population increased at the rate of 4% per annum. In the year 1840, 900 ocean-going ships entered the port of Montevideo, more than 3,000 houses were erected, and 27 great meat-curing establishments were in active operations. However, Rosas and the Blancos were only awaiting a good opportunity to attack. In 1841, Oribe, in command of one of the Rosas's armies, defeated the Argentine Unitarians under General Lavalle and marched into Entre Rios to suppress the insurrection in that province. In January 1842, Rivera took an army of 3,000 men to the rescue of his Unitarian allies. He crossed the river Uruguay and united his forces to those of General Paz, but after a year's desperate fighting on argentine soil he and the unitarian general were overthrown and their armies completely destroyed in the battle of arroya grande the way was open to montevideo the colorados and argentine exiles shut themselves up in that city and the so-called nine years siege began rosas's power seemed overwhelming and although Rivera and other Colorado chiefs at the head of scattered bands managed to make some headway in the outlying departments, they were finally driven into Brazil, while the unhappy country was given up to pillage and slaughter. This Guerra Grande was the bloodiest, longest, and most stubborn war ever fought on Uruguayan soil. Montevideo seemed doomed to an early surrender, when an opportune intervention by France and England upset the plans of Rosas. He had embroiled himself with the ministers of those powers by refusing to give satisfaction for certain alleged injuries to foreign merchants and naval officers, and the dispute became so acrimonious that the European powers finally resorted to the most drastic coercive measures. A French, and later a British, fleet blockaded Buenos Aires and drove Rosas's vessels from the plate. Under these circumstances, it was impossible for him to land reinforcements on the Uruguayan shore. In 1845, the European navies forced a passage at the head of the estuary into the Paraná and Uruguay, destroying the batteries which Rosas had erected there and opening up those rivers to foreign navigation. Thereafter, troops could be sent from Argentina into Uruguay only by a long detour to the north. In spite of this hampering of his military operations and the injury which the blockade caused to the commerce of Buenos Aires, the Argentine dictator stubbornly refused to yield an inch to foreign pressure. France and England were finally tired out. They raised the blockade. Rosas regained his control of the plate, and the early capture of Montevideo seemed certain. Just at this time, however, General Urquiza, governor of Entre Rios, and Rosas's best lieutenant and most successful general, broke with his chief. Entre Rios became a virtually independent state, and Rosas's efforts to reduce it were unavailing. Urquiza's defection again rendered it impossible properly to reinforce Oribe's army. The Colorados of the interior plucked up courage, and during four years no material progress was made on either side. A tedious and exhausting partisan warfare went on in the interior. Guerrilla bands scoured the country in every direction. Inhabitants of the same town were arrayed against each other, and surprises, treasons, and massacres were almost daily occurrences. One of the most successful leaders on the Colorado side was the famous Giuseppe Garibaldi. The future liberator of Italy had made his debut as a revolutionist in the insurrection which broke out in 1835 in the Brazilian province of Rio Grande. Later he crossed the Uruguayan border and fought against Rosas for several years. Early in 1851, a grand combination to overthrow Rosas was made between Entre Rios, Corrientes, the Unitarians, the Colorados, and Brazil. The constant policy of the latter power had been to secure and maintain the independence of Uruguay, and she welcomed the opportunity to open up the Paraná and Uruguay, on whose headwaters she had great territories, inaccessible except along those rivers. 
Urquiza naturally became the general in chief of the alliance. On the 18th of July he crossed the Uruguay, followed by a large army from his own province. A Brazilian army soon joined him, and the Colorados flocked to his standard. The Brazilian fleet came down the coast and controlled the estuary. An overwhelming force advanced on Montevideo, and the Blanco army found itself with a hostile city and fleet in front, a superior army behind, and deprived of the hope of receiving help from Buenos Aires. The officers hastened to make terms with Urquiza. Whole divisions deserted, and Oribe himself was obliged to surrender. Many of the soldiers who had been fighting in the Blanco ranks joined Urquiza, and the latter, after a vain attempt to reconcile the Uruguayan factions among themselves, marched his army back through Uruguay and Entre Rios, crossed the Paraná, and, descending to Buenos Aires, defeated Rosas in the great battle of Monte Caseros. End of section 22section twenty three of the south american republics volume one by thomas cleland dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by piotr natter part three uruguay chapter six colorados and blancos the overthrow of rosas and oribe marked the end of the effort to reincorporate uruguay with the argentine confederation uruguay was no longer in peril from foreign aggression but she was far from being united the Blancos had apparently been completely crushed, but their wealth, prestige, and numbers still made them formidable. The seeds of division lay thickly in the soil of the national society and character, sure to spring up and bear many crops of wars and pronunciamentos. For the moment, however, the fierce Uruguayan partisans had had enough of fighting. The Colorados were dominant, and the Blancos disorganized and discouraged it seemed likely that uruguay would enjoy a prolonged peace the wars which lasted almost continuously from eighteen forty three to eighteen fifty one had interrupted immigration from europe unitarians had however crossed in multitudes from buenos aires and many of their families remained after the proclamation of peace to this day montevideo is full of families descended from buenos aires refugees the same names constantly reoccur on both banks of the plate, and the social ties uniting the two cities are intimate. Uruguay's herds of cattle and sheep had suffered from the depredations of the armed marauding bands which had scoured the country districts for nine years, but men's cruel destructiveness could not injure the magnificent pasturage with which the nature have endowed the nation. And animals quickly multiplied again by hundreds of thousands. In 1860, the cattle in Uruguay numbered more than five millions, the sheep two millions, and the horses nearly one million. The population increased at the almost incredible rate of nine per cent per annum after the overthrow of Oribe in 1851, until civil war again broke out in 1863. During these years, Colorado chiefs occupied the presidency, sometimes succeeding one another, sometimes by pronunciamento, and sometimes by a form of election. General Venancio Flores, an able and ruthless officer, became the principal figure among the Colorados. In 1853, he was a member of a triumvirate which forced the legal president to withdraw, and in 1854 he was himself raised to the presidency, only to be obliged to resign the following year. As is usual in South America, the dominant party split into factions, led by ambitious chiefs, and lost popularity. The Blancos, as soon as they got into power, obtained control of the Senate, and their prestige and wealth soon balanced the military force of their opponents. In 1860 they finally prevailed, and their leader, Berro, became constitutional president of the Republic. The Colorados, however, did not propose to submit. Massed upon the Argentine frontier, they held themselves ready to fall upon their successful opponents at the first opportunity. Flores had been exiled and joined the Argentine army, but in 1863 he obtained aid in Buenos Aires and disembarked upon the Uruguayan coast with a considerable force. His partisans rose and he obtained possession of a large portion of the country and set up a government of his own. For a year the contest went on with varying fortunes, 
and then this fight between Blancos and Colorados involved all the neighbouring nations, and brought on the greatest war which has ever devastated South America, and which resulted in the nearly complete destruction of the Paraguayan people. The Unitarians, then in power at Buenos Aires, naturally sympathised with the leader of their own Colorado allies, and were inclined to aid Flores's attempt to regain control of Montevideo. Brazil favoured his pretensions even more actively. The Brazilians of Rio Grande owned most of the land and cattle just over the Uruguayan border, a third of all the rural properties in the Republic being taxed to them, and complaints of extortion often came to the Rio government. The Blanco president refused the satisfaction demanded, and Brazil determined to enforce the claims of her citizens. Flores was formally recognized as the legitimate ruler of the country, and a fleet and army were sent to his assistance. López, dictator of Paraguay, thought Brazil's intervention in Uruguay dangerous to the international equilibrium of South America. He protested, and when the Brazilian government persisted and sent its army over the border, he began war. The Brazilians advanced to Montevideo, and their fleet came down the coast. The city was blockaded by sea and besieged by land, while the main body of the Allies advanced against the town of Paysandú on the Uruguay River, where the Blancos had assembled in force. The place was taken by assault and given up to a horrible pillage, the recollection of which is still graven in the memory of the Uruguayans. The Blanco party never recovered from this slaughter. Those in Montevideo saved themselves by surrendering the town without resistance. Flores entered in triumph, and the Blanco leaders fled into exile. Flores was under obligation to lead a division in the war against Paraguay, and he absented himself for that purpose for nearly two years, during which the country districts were somewhat disturbed. In 1867 he returned and restored order with a strong hand. This short lease of undisturbed power was employed in making many important improvements. Great public edifices were completed. The telegraph cable was laid to Buenos Aires, the building of railroads was begun, and a new civil code adopted. Immigration was resumed on a large scale, and the country felt the economic impulse that was already transforming the whole Plate Valley. Although the country rapidly prospered under the military administration of Flores, the feelings of the Blancos remained intensely bitter, and on the 15th of February, 1868, the Colorado president was assassinated in the streets of Montevideo. Flores's death was the signal for wholesale executions and for the outbreak of another long Blanco insurrection. Although the growth of wealth and population never been more rapid than at this very time, the country was not free from civil disturbance until 1872, when an armistice was signed. A year later, troubles broke out again, and the troops refused to march against the insurgents. To the bitterness of party feeling and the official corruption which diminished the revenue and hampered commerce was added the embarrassment of the financial difficulties which followed the Great Panic of 1873. The public debt had doubled in the ten years between 1860 and 1870, and now reached the enormous figure of over $40 million, nearly $100 for each inhabitant in the country. One president after another was unable to maintain himself in the face of the financial and political difficulties of the situation. But in 1876, General Lorenzo La Torre, an intelligent and determined Colorado chief, became dictator. For economy's sake, he reduced the number of army officers, of whom there were over 1,200 for 2,000 privates. He rooted out the worst frauds in the customs service and refunded the public debt, compelling the foreign creditors to accept 6 instead of 12 percent interest. At the same time, he rigidly suppressed the disorders which had harassed the country since the murder of Flores. The bands of marauders, assassins, and bandits, who had exercised their nefarious occupations under cover of belonging to the insurrectionists, were relentlessly pursued and brought to justice. For the first time in years, a traveller could traverse the country from end to end without arms. Like Flores, La Torre often used brute force to secure peace and order, and the Uruguayans were too turbulent to submit long to such dictation. 
countless conspiracies were formed which were bloodily suppressed, but public fear and dislike of La Torre grew continually more menacing. In 1880, tired out with constant anxieties, and grieved over what he considered the ingratitude of his countrymen, La Torre resigned his office and went into exile. His successor, Dr. Vidal, held the presidency for only two years, when he too was forced to resign. The next president, Maximo Santos, served his complete term of four full years, ending in 1886. Then Vidal managed to get back into power for a few months, and was again replaced by Santos, who in turn was succeeded by Tajes, who governed the country until 1890. The ten years succeeding the resignation of La Torre was materially very prosperous. The sheep industry developed tremendously. The production of wheat was more than doubled. Immigration ran up to nearly 20,000 a year. The population of the country reached 700,000, having increased from 400,000 in 12 years. Immigration had been so great that the number of the foreign-born almost equaled the natives, even when including in the latter those of foreign parentage. In the mixture of nationalities, the foundations have been laid for a race of unusual vigor and of pure Caucasian descent. The bitterness of the old factional feeling largely died out during the disturbances which succeeded the murder of Flores. The Blancos had suffered terrible losses in 1864, and the Colorados had become far the more numerous party. During La Torre's dictatorship, the distinctions between the two were almost lost, and the Blanco party, by that name at least, ceased to be an active factor in politics. New factions, however, took their place, but the struggles for place and power lacked the conviction and ferocity of the old civil wars. The gaucho and creole element, although still politically dominant, was diluted by the infiltration of a more industrially minded population. The people were not so exclusively pastoral, and had ceased to be so military in their tastes. The foreign immigrants wanted peace, a chance to sow their wheat and tend their sheep undisturbed, and the gaucho, living on his horse, feeding on beef alone, and always ready to ride off to fight by the side of his favorite chief, ceased in many of the departments to be the dominant factor. Politics became largely a game played by the ruling Spanish-American caste, and did not directly interfere with the material interests of the country, and rarely affected the maintenance of law and order. The prosperity of the 80s had been accompanied by an enormous increase in governmental expenditures and debt. The economies, so painfully enforced by La Torre's administration, were abandoned. Nearly as much money was spent in ten years as had been in the previous fifty years of the Republic's existence. The debt more than doubled, and the deficit each year equaled fifty per cent of the receipts. The Buenos Aires Panic of 1890 brought on grave commercial difficulties. Real estate dropped one half, prices fell, and, as usual, the people blamed the government. Political disturbances began with an attempt at a Blanco uprising in Montevideo in 1891. The clergy were active in fomenting dissatisfaction, but the trouble was suppressed for the time. Herrera y Obes, elected in 1890, served his term out, but the government was getting deeper and deeper into the financial mire, in spite of having cut down the rate of interest on the public debt 50%. The murmurs of the public grew constantly more menacing against the taxation which had become so excessive that it almost threatened the destruction of industries. When the election came on in 1894, the outgoing president found that he had not control of Congress, the body which elects the president. A deadlock ensued, and the ballots were taken amid confusion and fears of intimidation. Ayaure, the president's candidate, dared not accept because of the threatening attitudes of the opposition. Finally, Juan Idiarte Borda was declared elected, amid outcries and protests against dictation and terrorism. The new president pledged himself to reform the finances and pursue a conciliatory policy towards the different factions, but he was soon accused of extravagance and favoritism. The Blancos had again become a formidable party, after twenty years of eclipse, and they believed that they were being deprived of their political rights by the Colorado president. 
In 1896 he procured the election of a Congress completely under his control, and early in 1897, seeing no hope of a constitutional change, a Blanco colonel named La Masse raised the standard of revolt, assembled a force in the western provinces, and gained a victory over the President's soldiers. He marched east and joined Aparicio Saraiva, a chief belonging to a family celebrated in the military annals of Brazil, who had brought a considerable force over the border. The rebels soon had possession of the eastern departments and menaced Montevideo, while Borda borrowed money right and left, and armed and drilled regiment after regiment to prosecute the war against them. Nevertheless, the rebels maintained themselves and roamed the country at will. They would listen to no terms that did not include Borda's resignation, and it seemed as if the country was doomed to pass through another long and bloody civil war. On the 25th of August, 1897, President Borda was assassinated in the streets of Montevideo by a respectable grocer's clerk. The vice-president, Juan L. Cuestas, succeeded peacefully to the control of the government in Montevideo and at once entered into negotiations with the leaders of the insurrectionists in the departments. Terms were quickly agreed upon. Cuestas conceded minority representation and electoral reform, and in a very short time the rebels had laid down their arms. The few months of war had cost Uruguay dear. Thirteen million dollars had been spent by the government, the collection of the revenue had been interrupted, and internal transportation had been demoralized. Now, however, industry and commerce resumed their usual course, and since President Cuestas's accession to power, the peace of the country had been undisturbed. Political manifestations have been confined to disputes in Congress and the press. They became so violent that in 1898 the president dissolved the chambers and declared himself dictator. He reorganized the army on a basis which ensured that there would be no mutinies, and at the same time pursued a policy of administrative reform which had done much to bring order out of the financial confusion. The obligations of the government have been religiously performed, and Uruguay's currency is on a gold basis. In 1899, Cuestas was elected president according to the forms of the Constitution. He carried out the pledge he had given the Blancos not to interfere with the elections, and in 1900 they made great gains and elected enough members to control the Senate. The political situation has, therefore, been somewhat strained, but there seems to be no danger that the congressional opposition will try to interfere with the executive functions of the president. The gallant and pugnacious little people will continue to play a role in South American affairs out of all proportion to the size of their country. Uruguay seems certain to continue to be the political storm center of the Atlantic coast. Climate, soil and geographical position ensure a rapid increase in population and wealth, while its political independence must continue to be an object of constant solicitude on the part of its gigantic neighbors. Argentina and Brazil. Montevideo is a formidable trade rival to Buenos Aires, and must always be, as it has so often been in the past, the base for any attack at the heart of the Argentine Republic. To the north, nothing but an artificial boundary separates Uruguay from Rio Grande do Sul, and the two regions are alike in everything except language. Should the Portuguese Americans again evince those tendencies towards expansion which distinguished them in the 17th and 18th centuries, Uruguay would be the natural point of attack, and if Brazil should ever divide into its component parts, as it came so near doing in 1822 and again in 1837, Rio Grande and Uruguay might find it necessary to coalesce, or possibly wars might ensue between them which would change the face of South America. A not improbable alternative would be the establishment of a power on the north bank of the plate strong enough to hold its own, and which might play the same role in the interaction of Spanish and Portuguese Americans as did Flanders between the Teutons and Latins in Europe. End of section 23《ポッドキャスト》、ボリューム1バイトマス・クレランド・ドーソン。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.Part 4 Brazil
Chapter 1. Portugal. The motherland of Brazil is Portugal. Profound as were the changes incident to transplanting a people to a virgin continent, notwithstanding Spanish dominion and Dutch conquests, large as were the admixtures of Negro, Indian, and alien blood, in spite of independence and republicanism, the language, customs, religion, and laws of Brazil are today substantially like those of Portugal. The parallel between the United States and Britain is not closer. Brazil has diverged even less than her model. Her population may have a larger admixture of non-Portuguese blood than the North Americans have of non-British, but politically there was less opportunity for divergence, for Brazil was kept under much closer subordination. The discovery of Brazil coincided with the destruction of popular liberties in the mother country. Thereafter, the Portuguese government was a centralized despotism, and its hand lay heavy on the Brazilian provinces. They were forbidden intercourse with the rest of the world. Functionaries of every kind were continually imported. The provinces never dreamed of asserting any right to self-government. From the beginning, the system was centralizing and stifling. The North American colonies of England were left to grow up by themselves. They were never under a colonial government properly so called. A revolt followed the first serious attempt to subject them to a real colonial regime. But the independence of Brazil came because liberties were finally granted, not because they were threatened to be taken away. The country remained under a tutelage, growing continually more rigorous, and which ceased only after the Portuguese monarch had fled from Lisbon and the colony had become greater than the mother country. It is, therefore, in the little peninsular kingdom, during the centuries before Cabral caught sight of the South American coast, that we must look for the beginnings of Brazil. Rome gave to Portugal laws, language, religion, and architecture. The forests of Germany modified her political institutions. The Saracens gave her the arts, navigation, and material civilization. Her happy geographical position near the Straits of Gibraltar made her the meeting place for the Mohammedan and Christian religions, of Levantine civilization with Teutonic barbarism and liberty. The position also enabled the qualities of daring and enterprise and the scientific knowledge acquired in centuries of long conflicts and intercourse with the Moors to be turned to immediate advantage when the Renaissance came. Portugal was the pioneer of Europe in discovery and colonization, though Spain followed close after. Together they led in making Western European civilization dominant beyond seas. The nations who followed in their track have long since passed them, but Portugal had once the opportunity of spreading her influence and institutions over half the planet. In Brazil she mixed success with the failure that was her fate elsewhere. Brazil is today the nation which has inherited Roman civilization in the least modified form, and is the country where the genuine Latin spirit has the best opportunity for growth and survival. The study of Portugal takes on a new dignity and importance when we reflect that she has given language, institutions, and laws to half of South America, and to a population that already outnumbers her own four to one. She is entitled to the interest of the world, if only because she has placed her indelible imprint on a region which is as large as Europe and as fertile as Java, and which is destined, within the next two centuries, to support the largest population of any of the great political divisions of the globe. In the twelfth century, the coalescence of a fragment of the kingdom of Lyon with the Moorish territory near the mouth of the Tagus originated Portugal as a separate country. The race was very mixed. Its principal elements were the Leonese and the Mozarabs the latter being the Christians of Moorish Portugal, left undisturbed from Visigothic times by the tolerant Mohammedan conquerors. Each of these elements was, in its turn, of mixed origin. To the original Iberian population, which has occupied the peninsula two thousand years before the Christian era, had been successively added Phoenicians, Greeks, Celts, Ligurians, Carthaginians, Latins, and in Roman times, officials, soldiers, and slaves from all over the empire, including many Jews. The long Roman dominion welded all these together into a homogeneous mass. Later, the Visigothic conquest added a large Teutonic contingent, which is especially evident in northern and Leonese Portugal. 
Still later the Saracens intermarried in considerable numbers with the Mozarabs of Southern Portugal. After the formation of the modern kingdom, another element was added in the French, Provençals, Flemings, and English, who came in large numbers to aid in the final expulsion of the Moors. By the end of the 14th century, the Portuguese had become a distinct nation. Racial and religious tolerance were more advanced than in the rest of Europe. Self-governing municipalities covered the greatest part of the country, each privileged within a definite territory. The nobles, prelates, and monastic and military orders were still privileged, and their property was not subject to tribute, but their power was not predominant. The king was chief of the army and the proprietor of a very considerable proportion of the land, but he was under constant pressure to grant it to the religious orders and to the nobles. The people were everywhere heavily taxed. In the municipalities and crown lands by the king, and on the estates of the privileged orders for the benefit of their great proprietors. The nobles were under no enforceable obligation to perform military service. A great general deliberative and representative assembly, the Cortes, had come into being when the monarchy was founded. It included representatives of the municipalities as well as nobles and clergy, and its importance and vitality are shown by the fact that from 1250 to 1376 it met 25 times. By the latter date, jurisprudence had become generalized, and its administration had fallen into the hands of the crown. The nation had developed, out of local and class privilege, a reasonably consistent and uniform administration. The municipalities were the basis of the governmental structure, and a rude but effective local self-government existed through their instrumentality. The norm for decentralization and organization had not been, as in nearly all the rest of Europe, the feudal system, but the surviving fragments of the Roman structure. To the municipalities was largely due the astonishing vigor shown by the Portuguese people in the 15th and 16th centuries. The norm even survived the destruction of liberty, and its influence can be seen in every step of the subsequent development of Portugal and also of Brazil. Portugal's heroic era began near the close of the 14th century. The great king John I, founder of the dynasty of Avish, secured Portugal for ever from absorption by Spain, when he won the Battle of Aljubarrota in 1385. This was the signal for a rapid transformation of the character and policies of the Portuguese people. The thirst for war and adventure grew. The old Portugal, laborious, agricultural, home-loving, conservative, was replaced by a new Portugal, adventurous, seafaring, eager, romantic, longing for conquest, glory, and wealth, its eyes straining over the sea, the embodiment of the spirit of the Renaissance on its material side. The meeting of the Levant and the Baltic, the East and the West, Mahomedans and Christianity, the arts and knowledge of the old races with the energy of the new, had at last produced its perfect work. In 1415 an army was sent into Africa and Ceuta was conquered, and there began that marvellous series of voyages which not only transformed Portugal into an empire but gave a new world to Europe and revolutionized the planet. Modern scientific navigation began with the sailors instructed in the school which was set up at Sagres by Prince Henry, King John's son. Until then European nautical knowledge had been very meagre. The compass served only to indicate direction, not distance or position, and did not suffice for the systematic navigation of the open Atlantic. The Portuguese first made that possible by using astronomical observations and inventing the quadrant and the astrolabe. This knowledge, once acquired, was promptly applied to the work of navigation. Madeira was discovered in 1418, the Canaries in 1427, the Azores in 1432. The first and last were colonized and rapidly became populous. To the west the explorers pushed no farther for the present, but to the south they reached Cape Blanco in 1441, Senegambia and Cape Verde in 1445, and the Cape Verde Islands in 1460. In 1469 they turned into the Gulf of Guinea, and in 1471 were the first Europeans to cross the equator. Their search, at first random, now became definite. They believed it was only necessary to keep on, and they would round the southern extremity of Africa and reach Abyssinia and India by sea. 
a hope which has become a certainty in 1487, when Bartholomé Diaz finally reached the Cape of Good Hope. Meanwhile, a political revolution had been going on. The strong kings of the line of Avis had won for the crown a moral preponderance over the nobility and clergy. The latter resisted the royal encroachments, but the municipalities joined the monarchs in the struggle against them. The king, who established centralized despotism, the Richelieu of Portugal, was John II, the third of the Avish dynasty, and who reigned from 1481 to 1495. Under his rule, the whole military power was concentrated in the crown. The nobility became a class living at court. The king was the fountain of all honor and advancement. Local officers were replaced by officials appointed by and responsible to the central government. Piece by piece, the independent functions of the municipalities were taken away. Concentration of powers in the hands of monarch and bureaucracy produced its inevitable effect. A short period of marvellous brilliancy in arms, statecraft, literature, and the arts was followed by sudden decay. The self-governing municipalities had nurtured a multitude of men whom small power and responsibility fitted for great things. The nation turned eagerly to the work of exploration and conquest and persecuted it efficiently. Such a people would undertake conquest for their king rather than colonization on their own account. They would emigrate under military leadership and forms. Their colonies would tolerate a closer control by the mother country. They would seek to convert the aborigines and reduce them to slavery. Private initiative would be stifled and overshadowed by that of the government. Large proprietorship would be the rule. The colonies would be burdened with functionaries sent in successive swarms from home. Taxation would be excessive. The best talent would go into the bureau and not concern itself with industrial matters. Invention and originality would be discouraged. Agriculture would not be diversified, nor manufactures thrive. To this day, a few staple crops predominate in Brazil. Small land ownership is the exception, and the people show little aptitude for change when unfavorable circumstances make their crops unprofitable. Brazilian Creoles have little taste for manual pursuits and not much more for commerce. Non-Portuguese immigration has supplied most of the labor. Foreigners have always conducted most of the trade. End of section 24